Hey everyone, and welcome to the best scary stories of January 2024. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated as I post videos just like this all of the time. Sit back, do whatever it is that you do to relax, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I collapsed onto our couch in the living room. It was a Friday night of a particularly strenuous week, and I was determined to celebrate. Unfortunately for me, my roommate had invited over about a dozen of his friends for a little party and pre-game before they went out. I can't remember what their plan was exactly. It had something to do with bar hopping. All I knew was that eventually, I was going to have some quiet time to myself in the apartment. That is, if I didn't decide to join them. The thought occurred to me that I should check my assignments. I wanted to be sure I was done for the week, and that I could finally just kick back and relax. Upon checking, it looked like I had everything submitted. But before closing my laptop, I heard the faint sound of the Discord notification over the blasting sound in the apartment. Someone pinged me in the group chat the chat that my friends and I use to stay in touch, as most of us live nowhere close to each other now. It's more accurate to say that its purpose is to send stupid memes to each other above everything else. What's up? I sent, hoping to spark a conversation. Not even a minute later, I received some friendly name calling in return. Their messages put a smirk on my face. Just staying in. I'll probably be in voice chat later if y'all want to join. Maybe we can play something. Unannounced. A few other replies that they would be there, including a couple of friends who rarely joined the voice chat. Another pinged me asking if I would join, as I hadn't said what I was doing yet. I sighed as I sat back, looking at my laptop screen. A part of me considered going out with my roommate and his friends. After all, I had just turned 21, and I wanted to get out of my shell a little, but I also knew I wouldn't have another opportunity to join this many of my own friends for games for a long time. I also knew that if I went out, I would get bored easily and quickly, and rediscover that bars are not my idea of fun. I sent my response in the group chat. Alright boys, I'll be there. Immediately, my friends added reactions to my message and sent overly dramatic messages to show their enthusiasm. Once everyone decided on what time they would be able to join, we narrowed down our list of games and decided that the first few of us who got on would start with a few rounds of Phasmophobia. After all, plans seemed to be established. Everyone returned using the chat to post memes. Realizing I had a couple of hours to spare, I joined my roommates and their friends at the kitchen table. I didn't know a few of the people there, so I made an effort to introduce myself and make conversation, but being the introvert I am, I found myself walking away and checking my phone more than talking to anyone face to face. Most of the time, I was checking the group chat and the various memes being posted. During one of these little breaks from being social, I saw a new link that hadn't been embedded as any image or video. The most annoying memes are the ones that don't embed, or can't be viewed unless you go through the link to whatever app or site it came from. This link, in particular, looked off. I couldn't make out the name of Amy, and it looked like nothing more than jumbled letters and numbers. Even weirder. The person who posted it didn't have a name, and the user avatar was just a default one. I was fairly certain no one with access to the chat had a blank profile. After a moment of hesitation, I tried to open the link, but it, whatever it was wouldn't load. I wrote it off as my phone acting up, but curiosity quickly got the best of me, and I felt an urge to know what it was. I retrieved my laptop, opening it again on the living room couch. To my confusion, the unorthodox looking link from the nameless, faceless user was still there. I again hesitated before clicking on the link again. 
A full screen window appeared, quickly loading a grainy black and white video of an empty room. I realized my error in not checking the volume beforehand because apparently I had it on max. The annoying sound of static disturbed the music coming from my roommate's speaker. A yell came from someone at the kitchen table in response. Turn that off! I frantically tried to turn down the volume on my laptop, but it didn't seem to work. The static remained just as loud. I tried to Alt plus F4 the window, but it refused to close. I tried to open other windows. I even tried to shut off my laptop entirely. Nothing was working. As the mysterious, blank video continued to play, one of my roommate's friends drunkenly walked over to the couch and stared at the screen for a minute before asking, What are you watching, dude? I don't know, man. One of my friends sent a link to whatever this is and I'm trying to... Just hold on for a second. I replied, uninterested in explaining the situation while trying to fix it. My roommate, Alex, walked over and sat next to me on the couch, along with another one of his friends. What's this? Some old movie or something? It looks creepy. Alex inquired. I have no clue. I'm trying to shut it off right now. The window won't close. I can't turn down the sound. I can't open anything else and my laptop won't even shut off. Well, just let it play, I guess. Alex suggested. So I let it be for the moment. Another minute or so of just the empty room passed by before a figure walked into view of the video. The few of us watching went silent as we observed and waited. The man who had walked in front of the camera was very well dressed. He wore a very old fashioned looking suit. It looked like something from the 1920s. Maybe earlier. I don't know all that much about suits. On his hands, he wore black gloves. This is all we could make out because his face was out of frame. The camera must have been angled poorly because we couldn't see anything above shoulder height. He walked into the center of the frame before standing square facing the camera. Though the audio was coarse, his deep, soothing voice was heard clear as day. Greetings, and welcome to the seventh installment of this series. I'm your host. Before the man could speak his name, a wave of static violently washed over the screen accompanied by even louder white noise. After a good 10 seconds, the video returned to normal and the man continued. I advise that all watching are sure to have seen our past works, particularly installments 1, 2, and 4, as they detail how to locate and acquire a proper subject. This is paramount information to have before proceeding with this installment. By now, the music in the apartment ceased and all of Alex's friends crowded around the couch to get a look. As many of you must know. The man in the video continued. The old markets are gone, and the farms have died out since such a time when this commodity was abundant. We have no choice but to seek out and harvest it ourselves. What's he talking about? Asked one of Alex's friends, before being hushed and told to shut up by everyone else. A few of them whispered comments to each other, most pointing out the weird camera angle excluding the man's head. Along with the acquisition and proper preparation of subjects, the processing is equally important and the last step necessary to enjoy your hard-earned goods. Future installments will explain the process in greater detail and complexity. This film seeks only to demonstrate the most basic processing techniques. The screen once again became flooded with static and blaring white noise before cutting back to the film. When it did, the suit and man was no longer alone. Front and center of the video was someone new. Another man dressed in a suit, though his was much more modern. His head was also above the view of the camera. Something about him felt off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. At least not until I heard a gasp from behind me. Then I saw it too. The man was hanging. 
from what we couldn't see, but his lifeless, dangling feet held over a wide metal bucket. On the floor beneath him made it clear. Everyone else must have noticed as well as some began whispering concerned comments back and forth. Others hushed them in response, eager to see what would happen next. I stayed silent, believing it was nothing more than an act. The man in the old suit walked into view again, dragging a cart with him. It immediately became clear that he was quite a bit taller than the man hanging up next to him. Their shoulders appeared to be about the same level, but the feet of the man who was hanging lightly swung back and forth in the air, at least a few feet from the ground. Some commented on this, but fell silent as the man began to speak again. I have here a subject for this demonstration. Those of you who have seen our past installments may recognize it. The harvesting process may be done when the subject is dead or alive. Of course, alive can be much more entertaining. Unfortunately, our subject here put up too much of a fight to do this demonstration alive. It is especially important not to damage any of the more valuable pieces while acquiring a subject. Before you start, have something to serve as a collection bucket for the blood. We don't want one of the best parts to go to waste. Most of us watching remained silent. Some felt suited to laugh at the absurdity of the dialogue, but the ones who did were silenced as the towering man raised a knife from the cart. First, we opened the chest. He plunged the tip of his knife into the hanging man just below the neck, though only a couple of inches. He pulled the knife down effortlessly, tearing through the man's clothes and the man himself like butter. Along with it came the grotesque sound of flesh being ripped and bones being snapped. He returned the knife to the cart before placing his hands back in the man's chest. In one rigid motion, he pried the man's chest open. Everyone around the couch, including myself, recoiled uncomfortably upon hearing the insufferable noise. Blood gushed from the newly made open cavity in the man, soaking his clothing and collecting in the bucket underneath. My roommate Alex quickly got up from his seat, expressing his disgust in the process. Some of the others turned away and covered their eyes. I, like all the others who were still watching with intent, thought it was all an act, reasoning that it must have been some sort of prop corpse, with prop blood, and now we were looking at prop organs. And now, we harvest the goods. Express the man who seemed to be acting as a butcher, letting the organs marinate in blood enriches their flavor. He announced, grabbing a smaller blade from his cart. For the next several minutes, he removed organ after organ. Heart, liver, intestines, everything. He carefully lowered and lightly dropped each organ into the pool of blood collecting in the bucket, somehow remaining to still keep his head out of view. Everyone remaining on the couch began to leave one by one as the video went on. Some even gave me disgusted glances, as if it was my fault that they saw what they had, and could have warned them. I think some even got the idea that I watched these kinds of disgusting things in my free time. I hadn't met most of them before, so it was certainly a bad first impression. I remained on the couch, though I lost attention to whatever you might call that video. After several more unsuccessful attempts to shut it off, I set my laptop back on the table and resumed messing around on my phone while it continued playing in the background. Well, I'd like to say I lost attention, but it would be more accurate to say I couldn't bear to look at the screen. Still, enough curiosity remained for me to not walk away entirely like the others. For the next several minutes, the man continued his disassembly of the corpse. Though I looked away for most of it, I could still hear everything. Clothes were cut, followed by flesh. Bones were snapped, joints disconnected, and blood continued to trickle into the bucket on the floor as the man's calm voice detailed exactly how to follow along. 
I loosely listened along to his reasoning behind keeping each limb intact while I checked back in on the group chat on my phone, curious to see if I could find out who the unnamed account that posted the link was. To my annoyance, the message was no longer there. When I texted my friends, questioning them on the matter, none of them knew what I was talking about. I was the only one who ever saw the message. By this time, most of my roommate's friends were putting on their shoes and using the bathroom as they waited for their Uber rides to show up. I figured now it was a good idea. I decided not to go with them. A few of them glanced over at me in disapproval as they headed out of the apartment one by one. Others just turned away. I can only assume, judging silently. Once everyone cleared out and it was just me left, I walked into the kitchen to clean up the mess, most of which they neglected to pick up themselves. All the while, the video of the ridiculously tall man cutting up a body and narrating his process continued on my laptop. Not even half a minute after they left, the apartment door opened and my roommate Alex walked back in. I forgot my phone, he explained in a panicked voice. Annoyed, I agreed to help him. I'll check here in the kitchen. Why don't you check your room and the living room? I suggested. Alex hurried to his room without a word. In the meantime, I looked between the half-drunken solo cups and bottles covering the kitchen table and surrounding countertops. If I'm being honest, I was mostly eager to find it so I could have some peace and quiet alone after what just transpired with me and his friends. Unfortunately, neither of us were having any luck. Alex moved to the living room and began checking the couch. After checking the first cushion, he looked up at my laptop screen again. The man in the video was now cutting strips of flesh from what remained of the corpse's torso, and carefully lowering them down into the bucket of blood, organs, and limbs. You still have this on? He muttered disappointed. I have no clue how to turn it off. I don't know what to tell you, man. I replied, a hint of irritation slipping through in my own tone. Alex turned back to the couch and continued to search through the cracks. I was about to look away from the laptop screen and continue searching, but something was off about the video now. The man in the suit was standing still, and his commentary ceased. Thought it might have been lagging due to a poor connection, but the continuous, annoying ambient noise made it known that the audio was still playing. I walked into the living room to get a closer look. When I got close, I spotted some blood still dripping from the corpse into the bucket and could hear their splashes. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up at the realization. The man in the suit was simply standing there too still to notice any movement, though his face was still out of frame. It was obvious he was looking in the direction of the camera. The screen cut to static once again, causing me to flinch and fall back, as I had been mere inches from the screen. The screen cut back to a video, but not the same one. The man in the suit was alone once again in the same room, though no hanging corpse accompanied him this time. He faced the camera, head still too high to be in the frame. My eyes may have been playing tricks on me, but I could have sworn colors started to seep into what was once a black and white video. The dark splotches on the wall behind the man turned red, though color wasn't the only thing that seemed to be changing. The details on the man's suit seemed to become sharper and clearer, and the grainy noise in the background faded. In a matter of seconds, the video quality transitioned from terrible to fantastic. It would seem one of our subjects has decided to join us. The man chimed in after the long silence. His deep, soothing voice now sounded crystal clear. The quality of the audio got better too, but something about it felt off about his voice. The best word I could use to describe it is synthetic. Like something trying to mimic the sound of a man, something that didn't get it quite right. Seconds later, the lights above the man turned off and the video went black. 
Alex stood up excitedly from the other side of the couch holding his phone. Finally, he expressed. I was about to remind him of the Uber and his friends waiting for him downstairs when all the lights in the apartment suddenly went out. We froze, giving a brief moment of silence as we both realized the power must have gone out. That silence was broken by the sound of approaching footsteps from the video before the lower half of the man's face came into view for the first time right in front of the lens. On his unblemished, ceramic-looking face, a grin formed. As his smile widened, his jagged, sharp, asymmetric teeth revealed themselves one by one. In contrast to the rest of the dimly lit and dull picture, his bleeding gums brought color. The sight of the inside of his mouth sent a shiver down my spine, and I tensed up in anticipation of whatever would appear next. To my relief, the video cut once again, this time to black, where it remained. I tried the power button on my laptop, but to no avail. It seemed that my laptop had simply died, but that didn't make any sense. I could have sworn it was at full charge when I first took it out. It should have lasted hours. Dang it, my phone died. Alex said, frustrated. I decided to check mine and sure enough, it was dead too. I knew for a fact that the last time I looked at my phone the battery was somewhere in the 80% range. I gotta get down there, man. They've been waiting too long. I don't think the elevator is working either. I responded, my voice shakier than I expected. Well, I gotta try it. The only other option is booking it down 19 flights of stairs. He retorted, annoyed as he walked towards the door. I'll come with. I assured and rushed to get my shoes on. A part of me wanted to get to the lobby to figure out what was going on with the power outage. But I think more than anything, being in a dark apartment alone with no electricity or communication, after watching that was the main reason I wanted to go along. When we emerged from our apartment, we were met with nothing but pitch black darkness of the hall. I suppose I should have expected as much. With no windows in the hallway and the power being out, there wasn't anything to light our way to the elevator. Alex and I walked slowly and stuck to the wall, feeling it along the way to the elevator. On the way, our hands passed over a couple of doors to other apartments, which sparked my curiosity as to why we were the only ones who had come out. I had to think everyone else realized the power was out. I imagined some of them had to wonder why that was. Finally, we passed over the door to the stairwell and into the elevator area. We felt around the walls for the buttons, until Alex finally found one and pushed it. Of course, it didn't light up, nor did we hear the elevators moving like we usually could. Alex made his frustration at the idea of missing his ride known. I responded, Looks like stairs are our only option. If you want to make it to your ride, we better get moving. The door to the stairs is right here. I felt around the wall, going back the same way we had come until I found the handle and opened the door. My eyes squinted at the sudden influx of light that flooded the hallway around us from the inside of the stairwell. Of course, the sight of working lights was a welcome one, but how? With the power seemingly out, they were on was a mystery. Alex seemed much more interested in catching up with his friends than pondering that mystery himself. Before I could open my mouth to question the oddity of the situation, Alex moved past me to enter the stairwell and I swiftly followed. I brushed off the lights being on as more than likely emergency power. I followed closely behind as we practically ran down the first few floors, but somewhere around the 14th floor, Alex suddenly halted his descent, as did I. He turned to me but didn't say a word, keeping as quiet as possible as if he were waiting for me to notice something. I was about to ask what it was before I felt it myself. The air was cold in there. Very cold. It felt like we were walking into a freezer. 
When we first entered the stairwell up on the 19th floor, it most certainly wasn't anywhere near as cold as this. I traded a confused look with Alex before either of us could say a word, and we both carried on with our previous pace. As we continued, the air only seemed to grow colder. By the 10th floor, we could see our breath, and although it was cold outside, I knew it wasn't anywhere near this cold. At the 6th floor, Alex once again halted, but this time I watched his eyes grow wide as he stared at something in front of him. He tried to mutter something under his shivering breath, but he failed to make words. I, being disturbed by his sudden state of shock, slowly inched my way down the last few steps of the flight I was on before peeking around him to get a look. I felt my heart sink to my stomach when I got a glimpse. On the handrail of the stairs hung a meat hook, the end of which was holding up one of Alex's friends through his gaping mouth and coming out through a bloody hole that was once his nose. His frozen eyes looked up desperately in perpetual terror, with blood running down from the end of the hook and his mangled face, soaking his clothes in red. Alex and I must have stood there a whole minute before he finally came to his senses. We... we have to get out of here. Now! He whispered to me. I simply nodded my head and followed him as we walked past his friend's corpse. But we didn't make it much further. When Alex saw down the next flight, he slowly collapsed to the floor and covered his face with his hands. A few more of his friends were presented in the same position, hanging from the handrail on their respective hooks. Seeing more of them on this level gave me the urge to look over the rail, down further. It looked like almost all of Alex's friends who had been in our apartment were now here, dead and hanging. Blood from their faces trickled down slowly though, with as many of them as there were. It collectively painted a dotted pattern on the concrete floor at the bottom of the stairwell. They all looked up at me with the same horrified expression on their faces. The sound of tearing flesh broke my trance and caused me to lean away from the handrail. Though still close enough to see down it, a gloved hand reached out, holding another meat hook, and a body with it. The arm attached to the hand reached out, and effortlessly placed the hook on the opposite handrail. I recognized the style of suit belonging to the impossibly long arm, but couldn't believe my eyes. After placing the hook, the arm froze in place. Then he began to chuckle softly. So, began the synthetic mockery of a man's voice. Our little watcher has come to see how we do it with his own eyes. My heart sank again. He meant me. I turned to Alex and uttered the only word I could find. Run. Alex scrambled to his feet and followed me as we ascended the steps even faster than we had come down. Behind us, I could hear him pursuing us, but at a relaxed pace. Though on the video, nothing about his appearance was rotund. His immense weight was made obvious through the pounding and creaking of the metal stairs. I don't think I've ever run so hard in my life, and I was surprised we made it as far up, as fast as we did. Luckily, I thought, we must have been more than a few levels above him when we returned to the 19th floor, though I had lost track of his steps. I was far more concerned with putting as much distance between him and us as possible. Alex quietly opened and closed the door of the stairwell, and we stuck to the wall, quickly making our way back to our apartment, which I knew was the third door to the left. After entering, we again closed the door quietly, before barricading it with the couch. We stood right by the door waiting. I think we were both thinking of what to do if he found us. But if he did, there was nowhere left to go. Nothing left we could do. Any minute, I expected to hear the stairwell door open and for his heavy footsteps to come down the hall before bursting open our door. But that never happened. 
Eventually we both lowered ourselves and sat on the floor. I think adrenaline was the only thing that saved us. And now it was gone. I felt drained and Alex was shaking. I couldn't imagine what he was feeling. Only thing I knew we shared was the mix of confusion and fear as to how what we just saw was possible. And what that thing that did it even was. A buzz came from my pocket. Alex raised his head and looked over at me. The buzz came again. I reached in and pulled out my phone. The bright light from its screen was a welcome sight, as was its nearly full battery. Though its content again left me puzzled. Who is it? Asked Alex in a barely audible whisper. It's 911. I responded, as confused as he was. They can do that? They can call you? I lightly shrugged my shoulders in response, unsure myself if it was possible. Alex pulled his phone out as well, but it still wouldn't turn on. I reluctantly answered and raised the phone to my ear. You both need to get out of that apartment now. A woman's voice commanded sternly from the other end. My lips quivered as I searched for a question to ask. Now. She came again, raising her voice. We can't leave. There's something out there looking for us out there. I whispered back. He's not out there anymore. You need to move. Was speculative and questioned the intentions of the person on the other line. For all I knew... She could be working with that thing from the stairwell to send us into a trap before I could contemplate my next move, she spoke again. This time in a calmer tone, as if a final appeal for me to listen to her. He's in your closet. Get out now. A shiver went down my spine. Alex must have heard her too, as he looked at me with a confused look. But both our attentions were quickly drawn away to a sliver of light that crawled along the ground and grew on the space of floor between us. We looked up and again exchanged brief looks of confusion before looking at the wall where it was coming from. The doors on the closet containing our washer and dryer were slowly opening, as if being pushed by an ever so slight gust of wind. The narrow gap between them is where the light seeped through. A wave of dread swept over me as Alex and I rose to our feet, like we were ready to run but had nowhere to go. This wouldn't have raised much of an alarm in my head if the woman on the phone hadn't just said what she said, and if I hadn't already known that there wasn't a light in that closet. The doors swung open violently, and our apartment was filled with light. A gloved hand gripped the top of the doorway before an old top hat ducked under it. The suited man entered, crouching to keep his hat from being pressed against the ceiling. He took only two casual steps towards us, but his long legs crossed the distance across the room before we could move. I tripped on my feet trying to keep away, dropping my phone in the process, but Alex was well within reaching distance. In one hand, the man had yet another meat hook, and with the other, he reached out and gripped the top of Alex's head, giving it a quick twist. His face now looked at me from the back of his body with the same terrified expression stuck to it that his friend's corpses had. He flung Alex's corpse over his shoulder and then leaned down towards me on the floor. The light from the inside of the closet cast a shadow on the man's face from the brim of his hat. But the glowing yellow light from his eyes shined through the darkness. His breath was foul, reeking of odor like that of rotten meat when he opened his mouth to speak. As for your little friends there, he said, briefly glancing at my phone on the ground. Wish them good luck for me. He said, followed by another sinister chuckle. He turned back towards the closet with Alex still on his shoulder. Inside was not our washer and dryer, but rather a big open room with concrete floors and more bodies hanging from the ceiling. 
strung up the same way as the others, a meat hook in through their mouths and out where their noses used to be. And as for you, the man turned back to me again. I think I'll wait for you to fatten up. With his final word, he smiled at me with his jagged, bleeding teeth before carrying Alex in and pulling the door shut behind him. The light in the closet faded, and the power in the apartment came back. They say if you practice law long enough, eventually you'll find the case that'll break you. Well, I've only been in practice for a few years, but I already found mine. The type of case that places not only your mind and body in peril, but your soul itself. If you believe in such a thing. It all started about a week ago, when I was assigned the representation of one Turner Dunn. An elementary school custodian accused of slaughtering three people here in rural Pennsylvania. I'm going to stick with people for purposes of this account. Though my subsequent investigation calls that designation into question. What I'll say for now is that the victims are no longer in their graves and I'll leave it at that. They were corrupted. Is how Turner himself plainly described it. I had to eliminate them. They were taking over the whole town. That's what he'd said the first time I visited him at the tiny county jail, where murderers get mixed in with drunken brawlers, spousal abusers, and small-time drug dealers before they are processed through the state and sent their separate ways. I was assigned the case in my role as local public defender. Said another way, Turner couldn't afford a private lawyer, so he was assigned to me. Knowing what I know now, I do believe he assaulted three individuals. Though I do not believe he had the necessary mens rea to commit the crime. Plus, murder requires, you know, actually killing someone. Turner told me that he'd served as a night janitor at let's call it G elementary school graduating from a high school in the mid 90s. He described himself as a loner, someone who preferred working in the shadows. He described the night of the massacre as follows. He was working the night shift when he decided to hoof it to a local 24 hour convenience store to buy a pack of smokes and a cup of coffee. This was a normal routine for Turner, or at least had been since he'd lost his car in his divorce. Not to my wife, he had explained. To my divorce lawyer, the only way I could afford her. Turner said he had planned to walk to a store outside town limits on this particular night. I already knew then that plenty of people weren't acting right, he explained. Something foul was in the air. Even the children were acting different when I worked the day shift. It's like they weren't even kids anymore. He said he locked up the school at around 3 a.m. and cut through the town's church graveyard to the way out of town. Something that he said he didn't find creepy because he'd done it so often and because he was used to being alone at night given his line of work. Like a vampire, he said he preferred the night. When he reached the entrance of the graveyard, he heard a loud, shrieking sound. At first, he thought it was a coyote, or some other type of nocturnal creature, but he could soon make out a woman's voice screaming. I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind. Let me go. Turner said he next heard another voice, a deep male one that sounded almost inhuman. You offered to spill the blood, the voice said. To walk forever with your daughter, there's no going back now. At least, that's what my case notes say. Not that I believe Turner's story when he first told me all this. Turner claimed he then rushed toward the voices where he heard three locals crouching over a 30-ish woman, a local teacher. The aggressors were the town's mail carrier, the middle school's bus driver, and a Catholic priest. 
I know it sounds like the build-up to a joke, right? Turner said it seemed the priest was in charge as he held a long, sharp caser blade in his hand. One of them had already slit her throat and were allowing the blood to drip into a chalice-like cup held up by the bus driver, a local named Pam Harper, to Eden, the mail carrier's son. The return to Eden, the priest countered. They apparently took turns drinking from the chalice, and the priest chided the bus driver. Make sure you save some for the master. You know we must tithe. Holding the whimpering woman down, they began to bite at her bare skin, drawing blood and sucking it up as though they were leeches. It was disturbing as hell, Turner's son. Fidgeting in his seat, something fierce. My god, it was evil. Evil in its purest form. And I don't need my notes to recall that much. I can still remember Turner's disgusted face as he said it. The way his fingers gently traced the jail library books that were set out before him on the rickety wooden table. So I did what any rational person would do. Turner's son. I pulled out the little handgun I kept with me. Should anyone sneak into the school at night, and I blasted them suckers. Literally suckers? I said, but Turner wasn't amused. Don't tell me you've never dealt with the occult before, he said grimly serious. Practicing out here in the sticks? Oh, the odd ritualistic murderer or two? I said, but literal vampires? No, that would be a first. These weren't vampires, Turner said. At least I don't think. Not yet. Anyway, more like vampires helpers. I asked Turner how, if this was all true, the woman who had been sliced open had communicated an entirely different story. You are aware that Stephanie Daniels told the police she was performing a prayer for her deceased daughter when you came out of nowhere, guns a-blazing. Yes. Turner had said. Of course I know what she said, and I know how it looks. But something must have changed in her by the time I flagged down the county sheriff. Whoever or whatever else was waiting out there must have speeded up her transformation. He claimed it wouldn't be the first time that his tiny town had been slowly converted into a town of monsters. Vampires, or something vampire-like to be precise. He described chronic absenteeism at school and work. Abrupt personality changes, strange disappearances and reappearances, missing bodies, desecrated graves, I asked him why he didn't inform law enforcement before the night of the so-called massacre, and he insisted that the local police were among the first to be converted, and at any rate, he didn't think any other law enforcement would believe the conspiracies of some middle-aged janitor. Said that half the time he had a hard time believing it himself. Unless you're trying to plead insanity, I had told him. Your story isn't going to go over very well with a jury of your peers. It was, unbelievably, the craziest story I had ever heard. In a long career of crazy stories. Totally and utterly unhinged. Go there, he insisted. Go to the town yourself and see if you really think I'm a nut. Then his eyes grew wide with fear. But if you do, counselor and by God, bring along a posse, some fresh garlic, and some mighty sharp wooden stakes. Your laws will mean nothing out there. The next day I went to G alone, sans posse, garlic, or stakes. Us public defenders don't exactly have the budget for posses. Besides, I had been practicing long enough to give little credit to paranoid delusions. Sometimes people just break. It isn't really their fault, but it's not necessarily my job to believe them. Just to help them as best I can with the limited tools at my disposal. That's how I saw it anyway back then. The first odd thing I noticed, 
as I drove up a gravel street toward the center of town was how quiet it was. Describing something as eerily quiet seems like a cliche, and I suppose it is, but that's the best way I can describe what I witnessed. A dead zone. A broken promise of a place. The first thing I did was stop at the local police station. It was an old building, apparently one that used to be the public library, based on the fading letters that adorned its white brick exterior. There was no receptionist, so I shouted, Hello? As I stood in the worn-out, 70s shag carpeted lobby. An officer appeared a minute later, wearing dark sunglasses indoors. His skin was an icky greenish shade. I assumed he was jaundiced from liver failure. The cops and the sticks know how to party with the best of them. You're not from around here, the officer said. Though it was more of a statement than a question. Are you, son? His voice was slimy sounding. Oozy. I explained the situation, and I soon had his full attention, though perhaps for the wrong reasons. Are you alone? He had asked, his eyes constantly darting around the room. I'm with some others, I lied. I can show you around the town, help you make the right connections, the officer said, but it will have to be tonight. He forced a brackish smile. Paperwork, he explained. I noticed that the notepad poking out of his uniform was stained the blackish red of dried blood. I'll come back later. I lied. Around sundown? The officer asked me to wait a moment before I left, but by then I was already backpedaling out of the station. Unnerved, bordering on utterly creeped out, as I exited, I swore I heard whispering from the hallway behind me. He knows. Was what the whispering sounded like. He knows. By then I felt more than a bit jittery, if not outright fearful, but I decided to carry on with my investigation. It's not that I'm particularly brave, just that I've seen a lot of strange things in my job. I don't have the energy to get into it now, but needless to say, public defenders deal with all kinds. I say this because I'm sure you now doubt the veracity of this tale, as I originally doubted Turner Dunn's. But maybe this world is a bit weirder than we've been given to believe. Despite my unease, I decided to visit Stephanie Daniels, the woman who apparently came back from the dead or at the very least recovered from a slit throat in record timing. She lived, or perhaps now it was unlived, in an old Victorian off Main Street. I parked outside the house, noticing how all its windows appeared to be sealed off, boarded up. Heavy black curtains, like the kind that, yes, a vampire might use to keep out the sun. I noticed a familiar effect in some of the other local houses, as though G were an Alaskan town besieged by 24-hour daylight, rather than just another rural community in good old Pennsylvania. I sat in front of the house for a while, stalling. I felt some strange malevolence in the town generally, but something felt more specifically off about this house. I tried to check my emails, hoping to by some time, but I had no reception. A not uncommon issue where we live, and having nothing to do with the supernatural or occult, or so I assume. I had the distinct feeling of being watched, though the streets were quiet. No children, jumping rope, no old men tending to their lawns with desperate precision. Not even any cars around, save the ones scattered about parked like lumpy glacier rocks. I got out of my old Ford F-150 and made my way outside. The sun was still bright and high in the sky and I felt embarrassed that I took comfort in that fact. I climbed up a few porch steps, which were as soft as butter, and inched my way to the front door. I knocked three times and then rang the doorbell for good measure. Then I waited and waited, but nobody answered. 
In the driveway was a freshly polished green Subaru. I walked around the back of the house to find a clothesline stuffed with bed sheets and clothes stained a blackish red. I tried the front door again with no answer, and with a morbid sensation of fear gripping me, made my way back to my truck. A few moments later, I was turning onto Main Street when another truck crashed into the passenger side of my vehicle at full impact. No airbag went off, because my truck was too old for such safety measures. A true classic, and if you've ever heard the saying, they don't make them like they used to, then that might very well be true. The newer truck that had crashed into me crinkled in on itself like a sardine can, whereas my Ford screeched a loud clang and was simply brought to rest in a slow motion puff of unleashed hood steam. Wiping some blood from my brow, my head had struck the steering wheel but I felt generally okay, aside from a bloody nose. It didn't feel broken, just slightly mangled. A dripper rather than a gusher. As I made my way to check the other driver, I noticed it was a priest, or at the very least, someone wearing the priest garb. I'm so sorry, the priest said, in what was indeed an inhuman sounding voice. I simply wasn't paying attention. I didn't even see you there. Are you okay? I asked. I noticed that his head looked positively bashed in, and yet he was not bleeding. His skin looked dry and drained. His right eye was all but detached, and yet he acted as though he had suffered a paper cut. I am perfectly fine, my son, the priest said, but we better call the police. More like an ambulance, I said. Stay still and don't move. I didn't want him to make anything worse. The priest kept playing with something in his seat. When I leaned over, I saw what it was. He was attempting to reattach his right arm, which had been severed in the accident. Only there was no blood at all. You're... not bleeding. I said, as much to myself as him. Why, of course I am, the priest said. Bleeding all over. Why, you must have suffered a concussion. Now hold on while I call the police. I think you need medical assistance. But by then, I already saw a police cruiser rushing toward us. I looked to the bloodless priest, then to the jaundiced-eyed face of the officer I had just spoken with, and then I gathered my briefcase tight to my body and bolted away. He knows, hissed the priest in that inhuman voice. Get after him, Bill. By Christ, he knows. And now, though I wish to continue my story, my head is throbbing and I can't possibly get any more words typed out. I am so sorry to leave you in media res, but I need to take a nap before I can go. I will check back soon to continue with what happened next. I promise, and assuming I'm still all here, I'm just so weak from all that transpired, and my body must rest for now. So there I was, stuck in G with no ride, no friends, and the sinking suspicion that my client Turner Dunn was right. This town really was being taken over by bloodthirsty vampires. How else to explain the priest's severed arm producing no blood? The uneasiness of the jaundiced police officer who insisted we meet again at night. The bloody clothes that hung like a battered piñatas from Stephanie Daniels' clothesline. It seemed that G had all at once become a dry town, and I don't mean they were no longer serving alcohol, but as I tripped and slid through the high reeds of an open sewer creek, taking in the reek of raw sewage through my busted nose, I couldn't help but consider things how a judge or jury might. After all, I had now fled the scene of an accident, Worse yet, had sprinted away from the police cruiser as though I had done something wrong. I've seen people get booked for much less, especially in our not-so-just justice system. I had to table such thoughts, piker that I was, because at that moment I heard a whispering shh from inside a nearby tunnel. 
one of those open face sewer tunnels where you can imagine uncanny alligators might reside until you remember you're in northeast Appalachia. Go on, I said to the faceless voice from inside that dark void. If you're going to kill me, just do it already. I'm not going to kill you, came a tiny voice. But if you don't hide in here, the others might. I trundled to the crevice and peered in. A child stood before me, his face partially subsumed by dwindling light. No more than ten or eleven from the look of it, a worn Yankee's cap slicked across his greasy hair, and his eyes seemed to glow with feline intensity. Are you a vampire? I asked. Because you're sure lurking in the shadows like one. Hard to hide in the light, mister, the voice murmured. And who said anything about vampires? This made me feel a bit better. Perhaps I had misjudged the town after all, had slid right off old Occam's razor, and straight into La La Land, bleeding all the way. I didn't exactly have gray in my beard yet, but I thought I'd been practicing long enough to no longer get wrapped up in my client's delusions. Yet, here I was. Of course there's no vampires. I said, pinching at my nose, almost believing it. I know, the child said. They're zombie witches. The thing about this new generation is they're apparently misinformed when it comes to monster tropes. My parents' generation had learned that vampires were to be feared, and my generation had learned that they were to be screwed. But apparently these pandemic babies didn't know anything from their elbow when it came to basic vampire lore. They like... eat people, the child's son. By then I had learned his name was Reggie, which means they're zombies. But they also chant strange, witchy things. So I think that makes them zombie witches. But vampires eat people too, I said. Or more specifically, suck their blood. Whatever, Reggie's son leaning against the sewer walls, becoming one with that true bacterial fantasia. All I know is they bit my parents, and then my parents wanted to bite me. He looked up at me as though I were the dumbest human on the planet, and maybe he wasn't far off. Zombies, he said definitively. From what I gathered, Reggie and his family resided in a local trailer park. His mother worked at the diner waiting tables, and his father was an angry, bitter man even before he made his little pact with the Dark Lord. Reggie had a half-sister who had recently been taken away by Child Protective Services, and one can assume it was all for the better. A world where vampires were real and Child Protective Services were competent. I really had gone through the looking glass. Being tiny and resilient, if not intelligent about suddenly life-defining monster tropes, Reggie had apparently spent the past few days farting around in the sewer system, something he apparently also did before his town grew some teeth. I offered him an old banana from my briefcase and my deepest condolences. How do you know I'm not a zombie witch? I asked. Simple. He replied, you haven't tried to eat me yet, and that's how you know I ain't one either. I asked Reggie if he knew Turner Dunn, and he said he did, but everyone in school called him Turdler, because he was always cleaning toilets. He said the kids hated him because he was always in a foul mood pushing his mop around, tripping children with gleeful hate in his eyes, and so on. I asked Reggie if there were any other humans left, and he said maybe there was, and maybe there wasn't. But he wasn't much inclined to find out. He asked me if I had a plan, and I said we should hide in the sewer system and wait things out. This didn't impress Reggie much. 
that my plans were apparently no better than his own despite our decided age difference. Reggie said we would have to hoof it to a nearby stream if we were going to have anything to drink, and it was better to do it by light of day. Having no better options, I started to follow the fleet-footed little guy, struggling to keep up. I never much liked children, not even when I was a child myself, but I was out of ideas and, like the vampires, increasingly thirsty. As we walked, I noticed the child left no reflection in the water. I seemed to recall something about reflections in vampires, but then settled on that being in photographs. By then I was feeling a bit groggy from the head trauma, and the boy was too fast to get a good look so I kept following. We eventually came upon a stream, though it wasn't apparent that its source was any different from the sewer. I didn't want to explain the contours of my germophobia to the child, who was already on his hands and knees scooping the water to his mouth, so I just hung back. Come on, he said. It tastes good. I told him that so did chocolate to dogs, but that didn't mean it wasn't poisonous, but he kept gulping away. The banana I had given him was still in his pocket. I would have assumed he'd have scarfed it down straight away. I felt a twinge of fear shivering up my spine, and then I felt like a giant dork for fearing a 90 pound child. If I had a significant other, I thought they would really be embarrassed at how callow I was feeling. I walked toward the boy to see if I could make out a reflection, then he wheeled around on me and started slurping up the blood from my nose. I pushed him off me, and stared in disbelief as Reggie, or what used to be Reggie, licked my blood from his fingers. I hadn't noticed before how green he looked in the light. I can't bite, Reggie said. My big teeth haven't grown in yet. I can only drink the blood of lamb. So I suppose that makes you a zombie witch, I asked. No, Reggie said. You were right all along. I'm a vampire. He started screaming. He's here, he's here. My heart racing with fear, I flung little Reggie into the stream and cut my way up and away from the water, darting through old growth forest and wishing I'd kept up with my law school cardio routine. He's getting away! Reggie screamed behind me. By then I was inexplicably back in Stephanie Daniels' backyard. Unless there happened to be another Victorian with blood-stained clotheslines. And in this town, I couldn't exactly rule that out. I climbed in through a basement window and slinked my way into a crawl space. There, I tried my phone again but it still had no reception. And was also running distressingly low on battery. I used the flashlight app and saw that the basement looked like a kid's playroom had just exploded. Stuffies and dollhouses and even a tiny porcelain white crib. There was also a coffin-shaped pine box that I dared not open. One too large for a child of normal proportions. Everything else seemed right out of a nursery. That's right, I suddenly remembered. Stephanie Daniels had wanted to join the vampy cult so she could be with her dead daughter. Turner had said the vampy crew had been meeting at her daughter's gravesite. The police report indicated the child had died a couple years earlier from severe pneumonia. I tell you, there's evil in this world to the microscopic level. These thoughts were interrupted by a creaking sound upstairs, that of a chair rocking. I tiptoed my way to the top of the stairs and found the basement door cracked ajar. Just an inch. Outside in the living room, I could make out Stephanie Daniels. I recognized her from the case file photos. Rocking a pale toddler, in her hand was a clear baby bottle from which she was feeding to the child. The baby bottle was filled not with milk or formula, but with a black red blood. The child sucked on the nub of the bottle greedily, hissing and writhing in delight. She was all but a skeleton, 
I'm not sure what type of curse gave her human form at all. By any normal biology, the child should have been nothing more than a skeleton sporting a creepy tuft of hair. Stephanie was humming some mesmeric sounding nursery song. I didn't recognize the tune. Perhaps the vampires have their own music catalog. Stephanie cooed, a cursed chant to my ears. Across her neck was a long, blistering, fresh scar. Turner was right. She had been stabbed. How had the county sheriff missed that? The report indicated Stephanie had no signs of lesions or trauma of any kind. It must have been my weariness. I'm not sure what else could have done it, as I'm really not one for a death wish, but at that moment, I swayed ever so gently and bumped my still bleeding nose against the basement door. Immediately, Stephanie's eyes darted to the door jam, and my stupid face. I didn't know we had a visitor, she said to the child. She spoke with the soothing yet creepy voice of a dental hygienist, about to dig into an inflamed gum. May I please ask what you're doing in our house? She said. I pushed open the basement door, more out of curiosity than any latent bravery. For Christ's sake, I said, pointing to the bottle. You've made an abomination of your daughter. For Satan's sake, she said. You've made an abomination of yourself, Stephanie Daniels, or what had become of her strapped on one of those icky baby carriers that go around one's shoulder to keep the hands free. She took her time in doing so. Meanwhile, Skella Baby slurped at that bottle, which she now held tightly in her own desecrated little claws. I don't believe we met, Stephanie said. And even if we did, I doubt you'd recognize me now. It's been a busy few days, hasn't it, little Aurora? She said to her daughter. She stared up at me and winked, a soulless facial twitch from her gaunt face. I'm a lawyer. I said as though I owed her an explanation, and I felt in a way that I did, having broken into her house. She giggled. A lawyer? She repeated. Then come join us. Clearly you're meant to play for our side. She moved toward me and I flashed my cell phone at her, flashlight app blazing. She screamed, turning away at my steel attack, but laughing too, as though at the ridiculous of it all. That's when my cell phone died. She lunged at me and this time I tripped over my own shoes and fell down the flight of hard, grey basement steps. She laughed at the top of the stairs as though this was mere theater. A Saturday Night Live cast member throwing themselves over a cardboard sofa. Despite the fall, I wasn't in very much pain. I'd sort of caught myself against the railing a few times on the tumble. And one strength I've always had is I'm quite hard-headed. I laid in a messy heap at the bottom of the stairs. Then I gathered myself together and slipped out the window I had entered back into the purifying light of a now descending sun. Rosy red, glimmering. There's hope in the sun, even if it's capable of burning our eyes out. As I ran away, I could hear Stephanie and little Aurora screaming into the basement and tearing their way through the dead nursery. I didn't wait for them to see I'd escaped. But I write these words while lightly sedated at a local hospital. I'm gathering my strength to tell my story in full considering one last attempt to prove that neither Turner Dunn nor I suffer from any form of hysteria. You'd been in a car accident, the sheriff said. You fell down a flight of stairs. Of course your ability to discern reality is somewhat... impeded. I so want to continue with what happened. But as before, the telling makes me weary as the various meds act and counteract in my system and the nurses come and go, checking my vital signs and working to ensure I don't try another jailbreak. Before, I could go on and on typing. A laptop is any good lawyer's weapon of choice, but I fear this is where my fingers must stop their typing. 
for now. Toward the end of my first meeting with Turner Dunn, he told me that being attacked by vampires wasn't the worst thing that happened to him during his ordeal. It was not being believed by regular old humans that really got to him. The way you're looking at me right now, he had said, as though I'm crazy, when I know that I'm not. And now I can relate. As I sit here in the hospital being watched over with dutiful indifference, as though I'm some lonely senior in a nursing home. But I digress, and I don't have time to digress. I have to get out of here. I need to get back to G with garlic and steaks, like I should have done the first time. I just need to allow the sedation to wear off. And in the meantime, write this out so everyone knows what's going on. As I was saying before I drifted off, I had escaped from Stephanie Daniels' house and was leaving her and her vampy Skella baby behind when I saw the police cruiser turn the corner, gunshots blasted against the cruiser from one of the boarded up houses. But everyone knows guns have no effect on vampires. All it did was help to slow down the cruiser some and give me hope that the town had not yet turned 100%. Across the street, I could see the priest walking about, carrying his own right hand as though it were a mallet. The white band of his Roman collar was now stained a deep shade of scarlet. I was walking about in some sort of stupor, my nose bleeding and my legs failing from my fall down the cellar stairs. Behind me, Stephanie Daniels appeared on her front porch, Skella baby still in its carrier holding its blood bottle close, as a mantis does its decapitated lover. My body writhed in panicked fear. Hopeless. Hopeless. Counselor, the jaundiced cop said, stepping out of his parked cruiser. It would appear you've been breaking some of our rules. He took out his citation book. Whoever was shooting from the boarded up house lit the officer up with a spray of bullets, but no blood was forthcoming from the cop, who merely shook like a wet dog. Old Lady Wilcox, he told Stephanie, as though they were ordering an office lunch. We'll take care of her next. I looked up at the magnificent sun as it descended behind the surrounding hills and cast its final rays of dying light upon the desecrated mountain town. I was surrounded. Surrounded and much too tired and slow to make another run for it. I would have to use the only tool I've ever had. The power of persuasion. Listen, I'm only here because I'm Turner Dunn's court-appointed public defender. I saw him. He was saying some crazy stuff about this place. So I wanted to investigate, but now I know he was lying, I continued, because obviously this place is far more messed up than he let on. The master was a barrister once, the officer said in an even tone, in a former life, so to speak, London. I sat down on the curb, allowed my new companion's hungry eyes to take me in. I saw them lick their chops at the sight of the blood still dripping from my nose. Maybe it was broken after all. I awaited the onslaught, saying a silent prayer to a god I only half believed in. What is it you want? I asked. World domination? To simply be left alone? Clean air, fresh food, so to speak? This was Negotiation 101. Attempt to see the matter from the other's side's point of view. It was really no different from negotiating with a district attorney. As I spoke, I tried my best not to shake in desperate fear. I felt that at any moment, one of the unearthed ones might snap at me like a hungry animal, tear at my soft lawyer skin, and rip out my vocal cords. But they didn't. They explained that all they really wanted was a tiny town they could fully control, one that allowed them to not be hunted, and provide decent food options from local metro areas. They didn't want there to be too many vampires, mind you, because that led to competition, 
but they needed full control of a town so that it could appear to function normally. G just fit the bill. They were tired of living in the shadows, so to speak. We're really close to Pittsburgh here, to Scranton, to Philadelphia, the priest explained. And if someone goes missing from one of those places, then nobody really notices. It's just a statistic, not a big deal. Understood, I said as though I were a worldly realtor, weighing the pros and cons of purchasing a new condo. Never go to the bathroom where you eat, right? Makes perfect sense. Next, I decided to find their negotiating pain points. Listen, I explained. My colleagues know that I'm here. If I go missing, then two people like me are going to show up. And then four, then eight. And that might make for easy meals for a little while, but... Eventually, it's going to draw a giant X on this place. But if you let me go, then I promise I'll never say a word about this town's little secret. I get to live, you get to live in peace in your beautiful little town. It's a win-win deal. And you'll plead your client to insanity, I presume? Asked a new voice, the head honcho himself. Dracula. Or whatever our modern-day equivalent of Dracula is. This dude wasn't wearing a cape or anything. He just looked timelessly awesome. He walked with a crystal vanity cane, and he was wearing one of those 50s-style hats. Though I'm not sure which century's 50s exactly. He was sipping a Manhattan made out of fresh blood from a gold-rimmed martini glass. Somebody's blue eyeball was floating in it as a garnish. Oh, and he had the coolest pair of vintage sunglasses you'd ever hope to see in the world. This was a vampire who understood both style and irony. Master, said the others in unison. Well, except the Skella Baby. Skella Baby was incapable of doing anything more than hissing or cooing, though it apparently far preferred the former. The barrister, I said, mock bowing. He explained that he had heard my proposal and that he found my predicament most interesting. But what assurance do we have that you wouldn't open your flabby mouth? I sat down, shaking in fear, my mind sharp with thoughts. And then it came to me, an idea so stupid, so lawyerly, that it might just work. I'll sign you up as clients, I said. Then I can't repeat what I saw because of the attorney-client privilege. I don't think that's quite how it works, the barrister said. But then he admitted it had been more than a century since he'd last practiced law. Apparently, he mostly dabbled in real estate and mayhem these days. In time, I had drawn up a contract and we all signed in counterpart. As us lawyers say, though they wouldn't let me have my copy. The barrister promised me that if I went back on the offer at all, he would have me and everyone I cared about murdered in the most grim manner possible. I joked that as a lawyer, I only really cared about myself. We'll see. Perhaps. The barrister's son. We'll see if that's so true. Sorry about your truck. The priest's son, after the contract had been executed. By then, the vampires were all drinking the blood of Wilcox, and they had given me some boxed wine. I had insisted on white for obvious reasons. No worries, I told the priest. And, uh, sorry about your hand getting severed. The good news is it doesn't hurt, the priest's son. Not one bit. After that, everyone was in a much better mood. We spent the night playing Pinnacle while the vampires debated global warming. Proper skin care and whether doe or buck blood tasted closer to human. When they were hard up for food, I mostly focused on my card hands. That's not to say either side passed the evening without trepidations. 
there was more side-eyeing and paranoia than a Tarantino film. They loved to discuss heretical topics and seemed ready to fly into a frenzy at any moment, my blood pushed the fresh blood. With all that said, considering the company I generally keep is other lawyers, I've had worse evenings. Before sunrise, the friendly local vampire mechanic had repaired my truck and I was sent on my way home, where I immediately checked into a hospital and ranted and raved about all that I had seen. You really didn't think I was going to honor my attorney-client pact with that village of bloodsuckers, did you? But though I've tried to keep a light tone in this retelling, earlier today I had some sad and discomforting news. Turner Dunn had apparently hung himself with his bedsheets last night in prison, and I can't help but think it was an inside job. If you catch my morphine-dripped drift, Nobody believed Turner until it was too late. What's wrong with our species? We never believe anything or anyone until it's too late. There's a nurse now, knocking at my curtain. Can one knock at a curtain? You know what I mean. She's letting in the county sheriff. He has a wolf-like face and surprisingly large and scissors. He's telling me he wants a minute alone to talk. He says I need to put down my laptop now, to talk. He says to trust him, says this will take but a minute. My ex Lloyd is like a Sean Cody model. I'm more Sean Astin. I was constantly reminded on Instagram every time he posted a couple's selfie. Some of the men that followed him, the eternally shirtless types, posted hurtful comments. Beauty and the Beast, dude out here helping the less fortunate. Slide into my DMs if you come to your senses, bro. I have a realistic opinion of myself. Not just my looks, but the whole package. I was absolutely punching above my weight. Lloyd came to mind one evening to chill. He turned to me as we watched The Bear, uttering that classic line everyone loves to hear. Toby, we need to talk. He'd met someone else. I didn't argue or beg him to reconsider. I sniveled a bit after he left, then shook it off and restarted the episode. It wasn't until the next day that I thought about the few belongings of mine that were at his house. A couple of work shirts, and a pair of shoes I'd left there for the nights I stayed over. More importantly, I'd left a watch that belonged to my late brother. Only a simple Casio. The kind you can pick up for less than a round at Weatherspoons. He loved the retro aesthetic. That watch meant the world to me, and I kicked myself that I'd left it there. I texted him to ask when was a good time to pick up my things. He said he'd let me know, followed by nothing for days. I asked him again, and even said he could leave them in a bag outside the house. Then I suggested he post me the watch and bin the rest. Months of excuses later, it didn't look like I'd be getting my things back anytime soon. Then I saw the Instagram post. Me and this boy, heart emoji, hashtag instagay, hashtag gay follow. It was Lloyd with his brand new and improved muscle boyfriend. They were in the Caribbean, embraced on a beach with matching designer stubble. The comments were vastly different to what I was used to. Wolf, room for one more? Suddenly I had a hard time accepting the audacity to disregard my requests, and I wanted nothing more than to get my brother's watch back. Don't be an idiot, Toby said my best friend Carl when I told him I was considering breaking into Lloyd's house. He's in Aruba, I said. It's the perfect opportunity. They're just things, he said. It's not worth breaking the law over. They're not just things, I snapped. That crappy watch is all I have left of my brother. I'm sorry, Toby, he said. 
Look, please just wait. When he's back, go to his place unannounced. Don't give him a chance to make excuses. If I'd slept on it, the chances are I would have come to my senses. But I was hurt and angry. Irrationality got the better of me. I'm going tonight. I'll face the consequences. Carl shook his head. Fine. I'm going with you. Absolutely not. After arguing about it for some time, we found ourselves googling how to pick locks and other tips for breaking into a house. Incognito, of course. In the early hours, we were outside Lloyd's house, dressed in black jeans and hoodies. Fortunately, it wasn't a big neighborhood, and the house was detached. Let's go around back, I whispered. I can't believe we're doing this, said Carl. I think my heart might explode. Mine too, I said as we got to the back door. I think you should leave. It's not fair that you get dragged down with me if... Sod that, he said. I'm committed to stupidity now. Due to being spontaneous, there was no time to acquire proper lock-picking tools. Instead, we had a couple of jumbo paper clips and the smallest flathead screwdriver we could find. I started with that, carefully inserting it into the lock. Barely seconds had gone by when we heard a click. We looked at each other in shock. Have you done this before? Asked Carl. Beginner's luck, I swear. The back door opened directly into Lloyd's kitchen. I put a finger to my lips and crept inside, signaling for Carl to stay put. I silently made my way through the dark house, then upstairs to the bedroom. There were no signs of anyone being home. I let out a sigh of relief then started looking for the watch using my phone torch. Carl made an appearance after a few minutes, which almost made me scream. I got worried, he said quietly. I can't find the watch, I said. What about your shirts and stuff? To be honest, I was only looking for the watch. I looked through the wardrobe and couldn't see any of my shirts. He must have taken them out already. I'll go look around. I'll keep looking up here, he said. I crept back downstairs, going from room to room. I eventually found a bag in the downstairs bathroom, wedged between the toilet and the wall. It contained my belongings, watch included. Gee, thanks, Lloyd, I thought to myself, but was happy nonetheless. I went back upstairs to get Carl. Okay, we can leave. His son. He stood by Lloyd's bedside table looking at something. It was a notebook with a leather strap around it. I don't like the look of this, he said. Where was it? He pointed to the bottom of the wall where a skirting board panel had come loose. Why would you keep a notebook hidden in there? He said. A shiver ran down my spine. I found my things. Let's put it back and get out of here. Wait. We have to look. We do not. I said in a loud whisper. Whatever's in there, I don't want to know. Before I could stop him, he picked up the book and unraveled the strap. I was about to curse his name when he dropped it open, a hand covering his mouth. There was a printed Instagram selfie of an attractive 20-something man. Below it was another photo of the man, though in that one he was handcuffed to a pipe in a dingy looking room. He was shirtless and had a mechanical looking tattoo sleeve. His eyes were wide with fear. Next to the pictures were handwritten notes, a bio of the man, descriptions of his behaviors, conversations, etc. As it went on, it became more graphic. There were descriptions of tortures inflicted on him. I was disgusted, but couldn't stop reading. What? Carl said under his breath. There's more, I said. A hint of plastic was visible on the edge of the page. I turned it over, recoiling in horror. 
There was a clear plastic bag fixed to the page. Inside was a rough square of tanned, leathery skin, partly covered with the tattooed cogs of a mechanical wheel. I think I'm going to be sick, said Carl, turning away. I went into a daze as I stared at the book, shocked at how Lloyd could be capable of such a thing. There were other pages, too. The book contained three different men, all with similar pictures and descriptions, and a plastic-covered skin sample. I recognize him, I said, going back to the first picture. I took out my phone, hands trembling as I scrolled through Lloyd's Instagram feed. I had to go back a couple of years, but there he was. It was another ex of his. You were dating a psycho, said Carl. Tell me that could have been you. Don't, I shouted. I can't be thinking about that right now. We need to give this to the police. He nodded. We'll be screwed for breaking and entering, though. I know. I'm sorry you had to be here, too. Don't be stupid, he said. I knew what I was potentially getting myself into. Well, I didn't expect this, but you know. I shook my head. These men will have families, people who care about them. Let's do the right thing. I hugged Carl, then put the book in the bag with my belongings. As we were about to leave, there came a noise from somewhere in the house. We both froze until we heard it again. It was coming from the basement. No, Carl said. We've got to go. My stomach was in knots, but I put the bag down and crept to the basement door, pressing my ear against it. There's someone down there, I said. I can hear them struggling. He was shaking his head. This isn't happening. Call the police, I said, trying the door. I was surprised it opened. Toby, don't. Call the police, Carl. Taking out his phone, I could see his hands shaking. What do I say? Tell them we need help. Probably an ambulance, too. I told him Lloyd's exact address, then switched the light on before descending the dimly lit staircase. It was the only room in the house I hadn't been in. My legs felt like they could give way at any moment. I'd never been so scared in my life. When I saw the man sitting on the floor, cuffed to a pipe with a rag tied around his mouth, it didn't seem real for a moment. It was like I was watching a film or something, but as soon as he saw me, his muffled screams for help snapped me out of it. I ran to him, untying the rag. Thank God, he cried. Get me out of here, please. My mate's upstairs, I said, trying to stay calm. He's calling the police. Are you hurt? My foot, he said. I'm pretty sure it's broken. I hadn't noticed, but I grimaced when I saw it. It was so bruised, his whole foot looked like a dark shade blue. Okay, let's try and get these cuffs off. I looked around the basement for something that might be useful. There was a countertop with some drawers and cupboards underneath. There was a selection of knives and other sharp instruments in the drawers, which made me shudder. The closer I looked, the more unsettling it became. There were deep scratches and dark stains on the wooden counter and walls. When I opened the cupboards, I fell back with a fright. What is it? yelled the man. There were three adult human skulls sitting on a shelf. I noticed one had some teeth missing before I kicked it shut. What was it? he asked frantically. I could feel something digging into my upper thigh, and remembered I had the paper clips and screwdriver in my pocket. You don't want to know, I said, taking out the screwdriver. I stuck it into the cuff's lock and started to dig around. I hadn't really gotten a good look at his face until that moment. I realized it was the same man from Lloyd's Instagram picture in Aruba. 
I was a bit confused on account of it only being posted the day before. It hadn't occurred to me that the photo was taken at another time. When were you in Aruba? I asked, still trying the lock. What? He asked. I recognize you from Lloyd's Instagram. You are the man he was in the Caribbean with. What are you talking about? He said. I've never been out of this country, let alone the Caribbean. Toby? Carl screamed from upstairs. I heard a thud. My blood ran cold as loud footsteps came charging down the staircase. It was Lloyd. I held out the ridiculously small screwdriver with a trembling hand, the only thing I had to protect us. The cuffed man began to whimper. Why are you in my basement, Toby? Asked Lloyd with an unnervingly calm tone. What did you do to Carl? I stuttered. Why are you in my basement? I... I thought you were in Aruba. I came to get my things. My brother's watch. So you broke into my house? I was upset. I said. I didn't really think about it. Just... He started laughing. The last thing I expected from you was something as wild and spontaneous as this. I'm actually kind of impressed. He started coming closer. I saw your picture, I said. You were both in Aruba. It's amazing what Photoshop and AI can do, he said. It wasn't even my body, Toby. I'm buff, but not that buff. You should know that. But why? I asked. If we're in Aruba, people don't get suspicious. People don't file missing persons reports. Oh god. The man cried from the floor. Please let me go. Don't be silly. Lloyd mocked. You know how this goes now. Stay back. I shouted, swiping the screwdriver at him. He laughed. I'm embarrassed for you. He turned towards the counter. Without thinking, I charged at him. The screwdriver stabbed into his upper arm, making him scream. With barely a moment's hesitation, he swung his fist around and knocked me to the floor. Look who decided to grow a spine, he sneered. He pulled the screwdriver out of his arm and threw it in my direction. I flinched as it bounced somewhere behind me. He started rummaging through the drawer as I tried to focus, my vision a little blurry. Like music to my ears, the sound of sirens could be heard in the distance. Lloyd snapped his head back to the staircase, frozen. Thank you, Carl, I said, attempting a smile. Lloyd screamed, coming at me with a blade in his hand. I covered my face with my arms and kicked my legs out. Lloyd fell to my side, giving me time to turn over. I crawled towards the cuffed man until I felt a sharp pain in my shoulder. Then Lloyd forced me onto my back. The blade now glistened with blood. We're even, he grinned out of breath. But I'm about to take the lead. He brought the blade down and I caught his arm, groaning as I struggled. Lloyd was strong on account of his regular gym sessions. The newly injured shoulder didn't help matters either. I could feel him overpowering me. His teeth gritted into a frightening expression. His handsome features were replaced by something almost inhuman. There came a scream from nearby, and Lloyd was no longer on top of me. Instead, he was writhing on the floor in agony. The screwdriver was sticking out of his side just above his pelvis. As I caught my breath, I saw the cuffed man. Though he was no longer cuffed, he was leaning against the wall, standing on his good foot. I scrambled over to him. Come on. I said. He put his arm around me and I winced at the pain in my shoulder. It won't be easy getting up those stairs, but we can do it. I don't think so, sneered Lloyd. He was standing at the bottom of the staircase, hand held against his blood-stained shirt. The only thing leaving this basement are your skins. As a chill went through me, there came a crashing sound from upstairs. Police! 
called out a loud voice. Help! We screamed together. Lloyd began to approach us with a roar, but didn't get too far before he fell down, convulsing as a police officer tased him from the staircase. Down here, she yelled. You two stay right where you are. The cuffed man, who I later found out was called Daniel, was treated in hospital. He did indeed have a broken foot, inflicted by Lloyd as part of his torture. He was also malnourished, but made a full recovery. We've stayed in contact, having shared this crazy experience. I guess we owe each other our lives. I was happy to see Carl alive and well, albeit with a sore head. When I left the basement, we had broken into Lloyd's house regardless of the outcome, and he made sure we were charged with it. The judge was lenient. We were given a 2,500 euro fine, plus 40 hours of community service. Justice was served for the men who weren't so lucky. I'd be very surprised if Lloyd ever sees life outside of prison again. I originally had no intention of visiting him, but something kept playing on my mind in the subsequent months after the incident. Annoyingly, he still had his good looks and didn't appear phased at all. If it weren't for the cuffs and all gray outfit, you'd think he'd be living it up. Couldn't stay away, huh? He smirked. Don't flatter yourself, Lloyd. Why are you here? Those men you tortured and... I couldn't bring myself to say it. Skinned? He smiled. I took a deep breath. You had some kind of sexual relationship with all of them. Why not me? He scoffed. We had sex. I remember because it was so bad. I mean, why didn't you do that to me too? Oh, Toby, he said pitifully. Look at yourself. You were never good enough for me. I open my eyes to the darkness of my room, and the pressure behind my eyes is almost unbearable. My sinuses are swollen on my left side, and clear mucus is running down my nostril. The pain is getting worse, and the pressure behind my eyes is building. It feels like a rusty drill bit from an impact driver is burrowing through the back of my head, and I can feel it getting closer and closer to my left eye. The unfortunate thing is that it is just starting. It is a roll of the dice at this point. Is it going to be 15 minutes of agony, or two hours of hell? I fumble through the darkness and the pain of retrieving my phone from the nightstand. The time on my screen says 3.45 a.m. I know what that means. I force myself out of bed, and the pain starts to peak. That is the worst part. It means there is no escape. No amount of energy drinks, pain pills, or anything else will make the beast scratching the back of my eye go away. Not until it chooses to leave on its own. Screw it, I say loudly to myself as I search for my shoes. When I get a cluster headache in the middle of the night, the pain is so intense that I feel like I am going to die. I cannot think straight. I cannot fully breathe and I cannot even stand up without struggling. The only thing that brings me any relief is to walk the streets until the pain subsides. It was a tip a fellow cluster headache sufferer gave me once. Just get your heart rate up and try to distract yourself the best you can. People who have never experienced a cluster headache do not understand why I would do something so dangerous. They ask me if I am not afraid of getting mugged or shot, but to me, the risk of getting hurt is worth it if it means getting the smallest relief from the pain. Sometimes I think just ending it would be more merciful than rocking back and forth in my bed while I bruise my leg from hitting it so hard. But I know that I must keep going. I must find a way to live with this pain. As I bent over to tie my shoes, a clear stream of mucus dripped down my nostril. My sinuses felt like they were being squeezed by a firm hand. 
I hated this feeling more than anything else about having these things. The pain behind my eye was excruciating, and it was made worse by the fact that I could only breathe out of one nostril. This was hell. I stepped out of my apartment and into the cool night air. The breezeway was quiet, save for the sound of my neighbor's voice slurring through the darkness. Hey neighbor, he called. I turned to see him struggling to find the right key to his door. He was a stocky man with a thick head of hair that was now plastered to his forehead with sweat. The smell of gin wafted off him, and I could see the alcohol shining in his eyes. He waved at me again, as if I hadn't heard him the first time. I didn't dislike him, but when I was having one of those nights, I didn't like anyone. I especially didn't want to chat with a lonely drunk at 3 a.m. Well, I felt bad for him, it had been an ongoing theme with him since his partner had left him some months ago. I could hear the faint sound of him crying from our thin walls. What are you up to this late at night? He asked, studying me in my running shoes and the gym shorts I slept in. Going for a walk, I said curtly. Well, you are a trooper, getting your steps in at this time of night. It's not like that. I replied as I locked my door and turned to see him still drunkenly struggling to find the keys to his door. I started to walk past him. The smell of gin became stronger the more I drew near. As he began to unlock his door finally. Well, you have a good night. He said with a one last limp wave as I continued to walk towards the stairwell. I heard his door open with a long, drawn-out moan that was part drunkenness and loneliness. I turned around briefly to see that his door was still open, but there was no sign of him. I could only imagine him standing there, staring into the darkness, drunk and alone. The city's wind whipped my face, a fleeting but welcome relief from the imaginary knife that was slowly being pushed deeper into my brain. I knew it was going to be a long night, there was no point in trying to go back to sleep. I could just lie there, staring at the ceiling, until the sun came up. I was already exhausted, but I knew that I wouldn't be able to rest. I had to keep moving. I had to keep doing something, anything to distract myself from the pain. This included what most people would consider to be beyond stupid, but when you have a cluster headache, you don't always think clearly. I decided that it would be quicker to grab an energy drink from the market by cutting through a dark alley. I had cut through the alley countless times, both in broad daylight and at night when my head was throbbing. But something was different this time. The alley felt darker and more ominous than usual. The wind howled through it as if it was warning me away. Don't come down this way, it seemed to say. I stared into the alleyway, wondering if I was hoping for someone to hit me over the head and knock me out so I wouldn't have to feel the pain anymore. It was darker than usual, the flickering street lamps supplying only brief moments of illumination. The sound of paper and other trash crunching under my feet was amplified by the darkness. And just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, my eyes started to ache and my vision began to blur. I cursed under my breath as I squinted through my one good eye, hoping it would help me focus on the other end of the alley. It was cliché, but it was true. I had heard a glass bottle break behind me. Hello? I called out, my voice hoarse from the cold. There was no answer. The alley was silent for a moment, then I heard rustling in the darkness. Anyone there? I asked again, my heart pounding in my chest. The rustling grew more frantic, as if whoever was out there was trying to get away from me. I stood still, frozen with fear as the sound got louder and more desperate. I could feel the muscles in my neck turning stiff and my head throbbed painfully. My nose was clogged with mucus and I could barely breathe. I knew I should run, but I was too afraid to move. 
I just stood there, listening to the rustling until it finally stopped. The alley was silent again. I stood there for a few more minutes, my heart still racing before I finally worked up the courage to move. I know I talked about a tough game earlier, but truthfully, when I don't have cluster headaches, I like living. I don't have any cash, and honestly, I'm pretty broke until next Friday. The rustling started again, closer this time. It was moving towards me and I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. I tried to lock onto the sound with my one good eye, but my other eye was still watering and blurred. The flickering lamplight briefly illuminated the creature's eyes, which glowed with an intense, unnatural light. My knees locked up as I stared at the thing, unable to move. I could see its sharp teeth glinting in the darkness as it slunk closer to me. I opened my one good eye as wide as it would go, trying to see the creature more clearly. At least I wouldn't have to suffer from cluster headaches anymore. The creature slinked closer, and my one good nostril could smell it. It was awful. It whimpered for a moment, which caught me off guard as I stared down at what appeared to be a stray light-colored hair dog, covered in dirt and hardened mud, a piece of trash hanging out of its mouth. It was thin enough that I could see its hip bones. Its stare locked onto me for a moment, its tail lightly wagging. Hi, boy. I think. I said to it. As we continued to stare at each other, I noticed his ears began to perk up. It turned around and its demeanor changed in an instant. The tail suddenly whipped underneath and its fur began to stand up. It let out a growl as it stared into the darkness behind us. What do you see? I asked if the dog could respond. I figured it was probably another dog, and they were having a turf war over who got to pick over the alley's garbage. I waited a moment before I saw him. Well, best of luck to you. Give them hell. I turned around and continued down the alley. I could see the light at the other end, but I was getting closer to the corner market. I thought about how Red Bull would help me with the groggy feeling of being woken up. As I was about to exit the alley, I heard the dog barking. Its feet were racing down the alleyway, and its tail was still tucked between its legs. It darted past me, barking frantically, and disappeared around the corner. I guess it lost. I darted across the street and into the market. The door chimed as I opened it, and I glanced at the bald man behind the counter. He gave me a gruff look before turning his attention back to the small television. I looked out the window at the alley, but I couldn't see anything unusual in the darkness. I walked to the drinks and grabbed a Red Bull. My head throbbed as I walked to the counter and placed the can down. The man grunted and stood up from the television. Anything else tonight? No, just this. Late night, huh? Yeah, I said. No point in going back to sleep at this point. I heard the beep as he scanned the barcode, and I took one last look at the alley. That'll be 319, he said, still looking at the television. Do you still take tap? He nodded without looking at me. I pulled out my phone to see that it was nearly 4am. I heard the bell jingle as another customer entered, but I didn't pay much attention. The transaction went through, and I shook my head at the clerk's question about a receipt. I took one last look at the store, but it seemed empty except for me and the clerk. I could have sworn someone else had come in, but maybe they just went to the bathroom, or the wind had jostled the door a bit to cause the bell to ring. I exited the market and started walking again. The pain in my head was a constant, dull ache, but it wasn't getting worse. This gave me hope that the pain was starting to subside. I decided to walk another block or two, and then turn around. A few minutes later, I heard a voice from behind me. You haven't noticed it, have you? I turned to see a man leaning against a wall. He had a long, unkept beard and weathered skin. 
His eyes were tired, but they locked onto mine with a piercing intensity. Noticed what? I asked. That you're being followed? He replied, turning his head to the street behind us. The lights on the street began to flicker, just like they had in the alley I had walked through earlier. It's been following you for a while now. What's been following me? I asked, my voice rising in alarm. The man didn't answer right away, he just stared at me with those intense eyes as if he were trying to read my mind. Finally he spoke. Something dark, he said. Something that wants to hurt you. I felt a chill run down my spine. What should I do? I asked. Get as far from it as you can. He replied, his voice thick with urgency. You aren't the first person I've seen it follow. The man stood up and started to dust himself off, but his eyes were fixed on me with a look of fear. The lights began to flicker more erratically, and I could almost feel the darkness closing in around us. I still can't see anything. I said, my voice trembling. That's because it doesn't want you to see it, he said. It likes to toy with people. You'll be dead before they get here, the man replied. You're not the first person I've seen try that. I'm getting the hell out of here. My left eye started to water and get blurry again. I had to get back to my apartment quickly. I could cut down another alley and circle back around. The man gathered up his bedding and rolled it up. Don't be an idiot, he said as he started to walk down the street. Start moving and don't follow me. I've already stuck my neck out enough for you tonight. I looked over to another alley and headed towards it, running as quickly as I could. The lights began to flicker as I passed them and I turned back to see a figure standing in the entrance of the alley. I couldn't make it out much, but I knew it was the thing that had been following me. I picked up my pace, my heart pounding in my chest. I turned and continued to run, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The alley was dark and narrow, and I could barely see where I was going. I tripped and fell, scraping my hands and knees. I scrambled to my feet and kept running. I could hear the figure getting closer. I was running out of breath and my legs were starting to ache. I knew I couldn't keep running much longer. Suddenly I saw a light at the end of the alley. I ran towards it and burst out onto the street. I looked back, but the figure was gone. The sound of sirens and an ambulance rushed past me as I exited the alley, turning into the other streets. I looked left and could see my building. The sound of more sirens was getting closer and I could hear the blue lights of police cars rushing to follow the ambulance. I caught my breath and it seemed that the commotion had gotten whatever it was to back off. I started to take a light jog towards my building. It took a few minutes, but I arrived at my building and noticed that both the ambulance and the cops were on the other side, seemingly at the market I was at earlier. What? I said out loud as I started going up the stairs to my floor. I decided I would call the police when I got safely inside my apartment. I started to walk up the stairs and noticed that my neighbor's door was still open as I got closer to my own apartment. Hello? I called out as I got to his door. I peered into the darkness and noticed nothing at first until I looked down to see a pool of blood and my now lifeless neighbor's body. The sign of deep bloody marks on his torso. I quickly moved towards my apartment, struggling to open the door, but I eventually got in and locked the door behind me. I grabbed my phone from my pocket and began to dial 911, but suddenly the lights began to flicker. I looked towards the window that was once again open and my heart sank. I knew that I wasn't alone. I could see the figure standing on the other end of the room as the lights flickered. Its skin was almost a perfect white, and it seemed faceless, but as if it was looking at me even with the absence of eyes. It was tall and thin, and its limbs were long and spindly. 
the only thing I could see that stood out from its lack of features was that it seemed to have strange symbols branded on its body. The symbols were a deep red, and they seemed to be burned into its skin. They were all different shapes and sizes, and they seemed to have no pattern to them. I could also hear it breathing heavily, but where the air was entering and leaving, I could not tell you. It began to lumber towards me, still toying with me. It almost seemed to feed off the paralysis I was feeling. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest and my breath was coming in short gasps. I closed my eyes, waiting for both my life and the horrible headache that was finally starting to fade to end. But then, I heard a noise. It was faint, but it was enough to make me open my eyes. The figure had stopped moving, and it was now staring at me. Its eyes were empty sockets, but I could feel its gaze boring into me. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. I was frozen with fear. The figure took a step towards me, and I could see that the symbols on its body were moving. They were writhing and twisting like they were alive. I knew that I was in danger, but I couldn't move. I was completely at its mercy. The figure took another step towards me and I closed my eyes waiting for the end. But the end never came. When I opened my eyes, the figure was gone. I looked at the window to see that the sun was starting to rise. And my apartment was completely empty. I'm a comedian, and my most recent set was delivered to an empty room. No, this is not a joke. It's not that I'm not funny, either. My mom thinks I'm hilarious, which is obviously an infallible testament to my abilities. This wasn't one of those situations where I started with a full crowd and by the middle of my rant on airplane food, they all left leaving me on stage covered in tomatoes and with a slightly more deflated ego. No, when I say I delivered my most recent set to an empty room, I mean it. That's literally what I did from start to finish. That's what I was told to do. You want me to do what? I lowered my water bottle, staring up at the man who just delivered the news. Argyle, the event coordinator, the only way to describe Argyle is to say his parents made the right decision when naming him. With his frizzy red ponytail and hippie fit, he looked like he'd been booted off a concert tour in the 70s and survived on nothing but gas station food in that point onward. I said, Argyle repeated, crouching down next to the couch I was sprawled on. The boss wants you to perform at too. What's the problem here? I frowned. What? But you said I can do ten. Right after McKinley finishes his gig. If you wanted me at two, why call me five hours early? It's a last minute change. Our usual guy, Spike Scotts. You know him. He's, uh, let's just say he's unavailable. Argyle's son. Which is why we're moving you to fill his slot. Again, what's the problem? The problem? I sat up straight. Dude, the problem is that the club closes at 1.45. Who exactly am I performing for if you guys kick everyone out by then? That's not for you to worry about. Right. Not having an audience definitely sounds like something I shouldn't be worrying about. Listen, kid. Do you want your money or not? I'd consider $75 for the night to be pretty generous considering you're just starting out. Argyle gave me a pointed look. Screw you, Argyle. I rolled my eyes. Okay, you win. Make it an even 100, and I'll do it. 80. No, 100. 85? 100. 90. 100. We ended up settling on 100. The club must have been really desperate. 
I waited in the break room for four hours after Argyle left, watching as the other comedians and entertainers came and left, bidding me farewell when they did. And when the clock finally hit 1.45, the laughs and chatter slowly started to dissipate until it was completely gone. Dead silence. Hey, you ready? It was Argyle. He stood by the door, a man purse hoisted over his shoulder. I got to my feet, ignoring the white hot needles prickling at my legs as I did. Wait, dude, you're leaving? Argyle raised his eyebrows. Uh, yeah, it's 1.55. You've got to be kidding me, I said. There's no way. So you're just going to leave me here? Alone? Who said you're going to be alone? I don't know why, but that sent a shiver down my spine. I followed Argyle out of the break room, my heart palpitating at supersonic speeds. I'd been nervous before sets before, but nothing compared to this. I thought the club owners were playing some weird prank on me. Maybe there would be a secret audience full of people, but they just told me to be silent. Then, right when the poor, young comedian enters the room, they'd collectively yell, Boo! And we'd soon all go viral on TikTok. But that wasn't the case at all. Seeing as the room really was empty, the tables and the chairs were all neatly put back in place. The staff were all gone too. What was especially strange, however, was that the lights were dimmed down more than normal. Candles were all that graced the otherwise clear tabletops, their soft luminescence barely illuminating anything. Good luck, kid, I heard Argyle say. He slapped me on the back. Just treat it like any other show. Don't be boring, because if you aren't funny, well, never mind, it doesn't matter. You're going to kill it in there. Sure, thanks. My mouth had gone very dry. Wait, but Argyle. But Argyle was gone. I looked around, baffled. Weird. I glanced at my watch, 159. I really wanted the 100 bucks, so I guess I didn't have a choice. With a deep breath, I took a step forward toward the stage. Usually I'd be met with a spattering of totally deserved applause, but I was met with nothing this time. I'd probably die on the spot, though, if I heard something even as benign as a cough. Hello? 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 I said once I reached the mic. Big turnout this evening, huh? Low-hanging fruit, I know, but it's not like I'd be met with jeers or anything. I cleared my throat. You know, some would say an empty room is a comedian's worst nightmare. I wouldn't say that, however. An empty room really should be considered a comedian's wet dream because I'd argue a full crowd is an even bigger nightmare. If we weren't afraid of people, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. And the majority of us wouldn't be virgins, either. Ha ha ha. I filled in the blanks to keep myself sane as the ludicrousy of the situation slowly started to catch up to me. The room was much colder than I remembered it being. It was almost like someone had deliberately cranked down the thermostat. My teeth started to chatter as I continued. Yeah, so... I hesitated. Speaking of sex, women, huh? W women, women, women. Uh, love them. They don't really love me back, however, seeing as that's how my last re relationship ended. I went on like this for a while, joke after joke after joke, burning through my material and being met with nothing but silence. I don't know why I was taking this so seriously. Again, I knew I looked like an idiot, talking out loud to an empty room, but something Argyle had said still stuck near the back of my mind. Just treat it like any other show. Don't be boring, because if you aren't funny, well, never mind, it doesn't matter. I felt like it did matter, which is why I forced myself to keep going. My eyes scanning each tabletop, as if they were trying to find anything remotely human-esque. 
But of course, they found nothing. No one. My heart was still beating like a jackhammer, and my teeth still chattered as I talked. Even though, objectively speaking, the room really was empty, I still felt like I was being watched. It wasn't a good feeling. No wonder Spike Scott suddenly became unavailable, I thought as I moved into my closer. I'd met him a couple times. He was the one who originally suggested I perform at this club after seeing some of my material at an open mic event. Spike was one of the palest people I'd met in my life, with gaunt-like features that screamed malnourished. He was wearing this large, dark green woolen coat over what I could only guess were half a dozen other layers. His teeth were chattering too. It turns out the dude was a 40-year-old comedic veteran. All my friends in comedy told me he was a big deal even though I'd never met him before. Yet he wanted me here. Something told me Spike never intended for me to perform at 10pm to a full house, but to an empty one at 2am instead. I made more jokes and bowed. Ha ha ha. I bowed, pretending the room had burst into applause yet again and I left. My stomach roiling with an odd mixture of both fear and, weirdly, excitement. I packed up my backpack in the break room panting heavily as I did and slung it over my shoulder. I then exited the club, escaping into the biting night. Presumably $100 richer. I was just about to turn the corner when I noticed something. However, something that prompted me to share this story with all of you. Something horrifying. Ping. My heart still beating wildly. I tore my eyes away from the large dumpsters just behind the club, from what I'd just seen, and looked down at my phone. It was a message from Argyle. Hey man, nice work. Everyone loved you. Would you be free to perform tomorrow night as well? I quickly threw my phone back into my pocket and speed walked away from the dumpster. My blood is icy as the arctic and my skin definitely a little paler now. More gaunt. I don't know if my eyes were playing tricks on me, but I swear I saw the dark green sleeve of a coat sticking out from the dumpster. Matted, dry, and caked with just a sliver of dried blood. The branches crawled up to the heavens folding over one another, blocking any sunlight from reaching the ground. It was oddly quiet, save for the commotion of my friends, as the common squawks of birds and the occasional rustling of leaves caused by mammals were nowhere to be found. As Max and I were draping the tarp over the tent, Sarah was setting up the chairs, which now circled the pre-made campfire. Penny, meanwhile, sat on a bench, her face shoved into a generic fantasy novel. The three of us exchanged a glance, watching the blonde's lips subtly open and close as she read along the page. She was so engrossed in the book that she didn't notice Sarah slithering behind her. She grasped Penny's shoulders, causing her to flinch and let out a squeak. She dropped the book, which landed unceremoniously in the dirt, before turning around and glaring at the perpetrator. Don't give me that look. Sarah chuckled, raising her hands defensively. You're in a camp with all of your friends, and the best thing you can think of doing is reading a book? Penny, no offense, but that's lame. Penny, who was already fidgeting under the gaze of the group, began wringing her hands together, biting her lip. She turned away, refusing to make eye contact. I didn't want to come here anyway, she murmured under her breath her attempts to hide her frustrations less than successful. I let out a sigh, leaning on the opposite side of the bench from her. She immediately tilted her head up, teal eyes piercing through my gaze. Alright, listen. How does this sound? You can decide what we do today. She perked up at that, though her expression was still laced with uncertainty. Really? 
Her voice teetered between excitement and skepticism. Yeah, really, Max ushered, trying to give me a look that told me to reconsider my tactic. I simply shook my head, silently telling him I knew what I was doing. He rolled his eyes but yielded, crossing his arms. Well, um, I guess I've always wanted to see you guys hunt. She trailed off, her nails swiping at the bits of dead skin hanging off her fingers. Sarah's face twisted in confusion, tilting her head to the side. Hunt? Like, hunting deer or something? Yeah, um, or rabbits. Anything, I guess. Max laughed at the suggestion. Well, we'd have to leave camp for that. Are you sure that's what you want to do? You can't just give up halfway because you're too scared. Penny's face flushed, her hands collapsing in on themselves. No, I won't back out. I want to see. She muttered, her voice a candle's flame compared to the forest fire that was Max's. It looked like she was regretting her choice but didn't want to prove Max right by getting cold feet all of a sudden. Sarah, eyebrows furrowed, opened her mouth to question Penny's decision, only to be cut off by a thunderous clap. All right, well, you heard the boss. Max scoffed, rummaging in the car and producing two hunting rifles, one of which he passed to me. Even after how many times I've used it, I still couldn't get over how heavy it was. Its weight dragged me down with it, and I just barely caught myself before it could escape my grasp. Just so you're aware, I began, propping the firearm against a nearby tree as I grabbed my backpack. These are pretty loud, so you're going to want to stay back. They might damage your ears if you're not careful. Not to mention, hunting takes a really long time. With how quiet it is... I'm not even sure we're going to see an animal. Oh, and also... Okay, we get it, Johnny boy. Max interjected, his tone oozing with sarcasm. Penny's a frail, fragile flower. We'll make sure no deadly rabbit starts. I don't know, gently gnawing on her. Penny's face lit up in hot red. Sarah's giggling, hiding the girl's mumble of a response. Let the boys have this one. Sarah attempted to whisper, though her words still reached the two of us. It's the only thing they're good at. I rolled my eyes, slinging the pack onto my back before following Max's steps. That so? And I'm sure you can handle yourselves, so I'll be going without. Before I could finish, Penny's shuffling footsteps already reached behind me, her body centimeters away from mine. I could practically hear Sarah's eyes rolling as she awkwardly jogged to catch up with us. It was weird. The woods were usually filled with noise. Birds squawking, branches swaying in the wind, and the occasional scurrying of rodents. So when the only sound consisted of dry leaves crumbling beneath our feet, the grip my fingers had on the gun tightened. Sarah attempted to fill the void with snide remarks, only to be silenced by... Much to our surprise, Max. Each hush left her even more flustered, clearly frustrated with having the resident Joker taking her role of the responsible one. I thought that this was all in my head, that my paranoia was causing inconsequential details to appear unnatural. That was until I took a look at Penny. Her eyes, the same hue as the sky above, constantly darted to every corner of the forest. Her body seemed to slouch more and more every time, wrapping her arms around herself to block off any attacker. It was hard to tell if this was just how she usually acted, or if she too felt the urge to check behind her every now and then. I slowed my pace, allowing her smaller strides to keep up with mine. Hey Penny, I greeted causing her to look up at me with a start. Her wide eyes seemed to have trouble focusing on anything. I know Max's comment probably made you feel a little self-conscious, but he's just like that. 
I promise, if you really want to go back, none of us will judge you. Well, besides Max, but again, she didn't respond, so I pressed on. Do you want to go back? Be honest, alright? She took a moment to mull over the offer before shaking her head. No. Making Max wrong is worth staying. I can handle myself. Despite uncertainty lingering in her words, stubbornness overshadowed it. You know, not in a million years would I have expected your first choice for what you wanted to do to be hunting. I mean, no offense or whatever. But I always thought you were squeamish. She laughed, her hands fidgeting with the straps of her bag. No, I'm, uh, a big fan of biology. I've seen way worse things in documentaries than a dead deer. Though, I am a little afraid. To see one in person, at least. You're the expert. What should I expect? I smiled, rubbing the back of my neck sheepishly. Honestly, not much. Hunting's a lot of waiting around. Like I said, we're probably not going to see any... Max's voice rang out across the barren forest and, on instinct, I readied the firearm. There's a wolf. It's... His voice trailed off. The fear that was once hunting his words, morphing into confusion. What the hell? Is it dead? I motioned for Penny to stay as I approached the carcass, keeping my gun aimed at it just in case. As I neared where Max stood, the reason for his bewilderment became apparent. The corpse, the body of a young wolf, lay just a few meters away. With how its state was almost perfect, I didn't put it past him to assume it was simply sleeping. However, once I walked around it, the chunk of flesh forced out of its throat proved that assumption was false. I winced, not because of the fact I had seen the carcass. I've witnessed animals in much worse states, some caused by my hands. No, it wasn't the sight that unsettled me. It was the fact that it was done to a wolf. If it was a deer or a rabbit, sure, I wouldn't question it. But what would take a bite out of a wolf? The potential answers to that question made me shiver, and I stood up, deciding that this wasn't safe anymore. However, before I could turn to the group and announce it, Penny brushed past me, and kneeled next to the animal, studying its wound. Guys, she murmured, reaching her hand just close enough so that they weren't touching the matted tufts of fur jutting out of the sopping wound. This bite, it... I don't know how to say it. It just looks weird. It's sloppy. The flesh is all stringy like whatever took the bite had to pull just to tear the flesh off. She pulled her hands away, wiping it on the grass next to her despite no physical contact being made. The bite marks look too small. Too... like... a house dog or something. A dog, Penny? Really? Sarah's sudden aggression surprised the rest of us, and even she seemed to be taken aback by it. Her nails dug into her skin, a flash of fear overtaking her, who was always the most sound of mind. Do you realize how dumb that sounds? It's probably a wolf or something. Her explanation fell flat, Penny's analysis poking holes in her logic not but a few seconds ago. What? Why are you freaking out? Do you not think we were gonna see a dead animal? Max's attempt at reassuring her was not as successful as he'd hoped. In fact, it only caused her agitation to spike, her words coming out with uncharacteristic venom. The two's conversation barely lasted before Penny's meek voice cut through the argument. It doesn't have teeth. The statement as if it were a sentence from a different language, was met with silence. Sarah's already light face now grew as pale as snow, lower lips barely trembling as she fought back the urge to let her fear show. Th they're gone. Well? Max scratched the back of his neck, 
dark eyes glaring through the carcass in an attempt to make sense of the situation. Maybe a native did it. We're close to some native villages, and they've got those rituals, right? Jesus Christ, Max. Sarah's form now seemed to be quivering, the lightest of touches enough to set her off. Her eyes avoided the wolf with conspicuous intent, clearly attempting to direct her sudden burst of fear toward a different emotion. You can't say stuff like that. Hey. My voice felt foreign, as it was the three who were carrying the majority of the conversation. Sarah, you're right, but let's not turn this into an argument. I'm sure all of us are on edge, so why don't we call it a day and head back? Like hell, he scoffed, arms crossing over one another. A wolf got into a fight or whatever. It gets some weird injuries and dies. The end. So what? Missing teeth, a massive chunk of its throat gone, and a bite pattern that's apparently similar to a house dog's? I shot back, puffing my chest out in an attempt to at least level the playing field out with Max's tall stature little success. You don't see anything wrong with that? I'm just as disappointed as you, man, but I don't want to risk getting mauled over some hunting. His eyes lit up with a fire that indicated this conversation would go nowhere, but the flame was swiftly put out as he sighed. Fine. His features softened, guilt etching itself onto his face. Hey look, I'm sorry, alright? I didn't mean to be like that. Let's just head back. I felt my shoulders sag, the potential fight draining me more than I'd care to admit. It's all good. I patted his shoulder, a gesture he physically cringed at. This was a bad spot to camp anyway. We should have just gone to a public one, where we didn't have to worry about any predators. Speak for yourselves. Sarah's usual snark finally returned if a little forced. I actually agreed to come camping because I wanted to be mangled by a bear. Max rolled his eyes, though a subtle chuckle still escaped his lips. My attention returned to the crouching girl, her fingers still tracing the edges of the fatal wound. Penny? No response. She seemed to be completely engrossed in the carcass. Teal irises practically piercing through the chunks of muscle and flesh. Only when my fingers made contact with her shoulder did she jolt her head up, narrowly missing my chin. We're gonna head out, so if you want to stop probing that dead animal, now would be great. A shade of pink splashed across her face as she rose, dusting her hands off. Before she could even finish muttering her apology, Max stopped once again, bringing forth a groan of irritation from Sarah's lips. What now? she asked, to which Max simply raised a finger to his lips. My heart lurched, expecting to see another carcass, or worse, the cause of the previous one, but as his lips stretched into that grin I knew so much, I wasn't sure if I should have been relieved or even more worried. There's a deer. Right there. He pointed and sure enough, with its back facing us, stood a young buck. Its coat was a soft brown, the occasional splotch of white speckling its hind legs. Its head was buried in the foliage, munching away at the leaves and shrubbery. As my eyes flicked between the animal and Max, I noticed him already beginning to aim. Like reading my mind, he held a hand up stopping me from going on another tangent. It's not moving. I have a clear shot. The noise is gonna scare whatever animal or monster you guys think is out here, so let me get the shot off before you start complaining. I knew better than to attempt to wrangle the rifle out of his arms, so I instead looked toward Penny. Well, guess you got your wish, I joked, her expression immediately twisting into regret. Uh, but really, you should close your ears. It's going to be really loud. She nodded hesitantly, bringing her palms up and tightening them against her ears. Sarah, rolling her eyes at the display, 
opted to plug them with the tips of her fingers. She leaned in my direction, her voice barely below a shout as she tried to compensate for the soon-to-be ringing. Are you going to cover your ears, or do you want to impress her that bad? Instead of entertaining her jab, I slowly pushed my hand closer to her sides, knowing she wouldn't be able to block it without sacrificing her hearing. Hey, I'm sorry, jeez. She shuffled away, opting to shove her fingers back into her ears. Max's finger curled around the trigger, the firearm readying itself for the impending shot before the percussion of gunfire shook the ground beneath me. A lack of panicked birds fleeing from their homes would have unnerved me if not for the sight of the deer. Though I was sure Max got a clean shot through its skull, the animal remained standing, its only movement consisting of its jaw clamping down harder on the vegetation. Max leaned back, the rifle now aimed at the ground. Once steely eyes were now wide with confusion, dark eyebrows knitted in frustration. He muttered something under his breath, either a curse or a question. Sarah, who had been plugging her ears with a smirk, now let her arms drop to her sides. The fear I saw earlier returned in full force, her previously pale face now a ghostly white. Did you miss? She squeaked before clearing her throat and repeating the question in a more confident volume. I... I thought I landed the shot. He replied, voice trailing uncharacteristically low. It only became apparent just how silent it was when the eventual ringing faded, leaving nothing in its wake. Not even the sound of my breathing could fill the suffocating void. Why... why isn't it running? The question shared by the group only left one mouth, Penny's, as Max and Sarah remained speechless, anxiously waiting for someone to answer. I didn't have enough time to alert the others as I saw Max's shaking finger tighten around the trigger once again. This time, when the shot rang out, a burst of blood burst from the other side. The bullet tore straight through the skull of the animal allowing me to see the greenery on the other side, and yet, it still stood. No. Even worse. It was moving. The deer's head lifted, rusty marionette strings forcing its mouth away from the vegetation. Mechanically and with little motor control, its body turned. One foot stumbled over another, causing it to trip over itself and I could hear Sarah let out the breath she held since Max first pulled the trigger. Her relief was short-lived as the herbivore caught itself, the sudden halt in movement causing a chunk of something to spill from somewhere within its throat. As its face came into view, Penny gagged, hand clasping over her mouth. Its left eye, once full of life, retained not a single trace of color. A gray, lifeless orb bulged out from sunken sockets, tendrils of red snaking from the ends of its pupil. Its right eye, however, was no longer there. Viscera shot out from the hole where its eye once was, brain matter oozing out like honey. Its neck could barely keep its head up. The skull limped despite the deer's attempts to keep its eye on us. All of that would have been enough to make my legs give out and for me to run screaming, but what truly did it was the fact that instead of rows of flat, dull teeth, monstrous fangs lined its rotten gums. Like the blades of a bear trap, they gnashed together, so large and out of place that it forced its mouth to remain open in a permanent, savage gape. Tufts of black fur jutted out from between each overlapping tooth. The strands swaying in the wind ominously, the same color as the wolf's fur. Max immediately unloaded the clip into it, uncaring what the string of percussion might do to us. Each destructive explosion caused my ears further harm, my hands doing little to block out the noise. Sarah had already fled from the scene before the rifle could finish its barrage. It continued stumbling to us 
each bullet taking a chunk of bone and flesh from its face, but doing nothing to slow its advancements. Feet held by nothing but sinew and tendons, dragged across the dirt. The clicking of its hooves reverberating through my ears. Max, realizing the futility of his actions, tossed the firearm at the beast, barely phasing it, before finally turning tail and following Sarah. Penny, seemingly paralyzed, watched the monstrosity approach us even closer, her nails digging so far into her skin that it began to bleed. Teal eyes suddenly flicked to me once my fingers wrapped around her wrist, breaking her out of her trance. I tugged, sending her forward. Her legs attempted to keep up with mine, but failed, resulting in her white tennis shoes scraping across the muddy ground. The disjointed gallop that followed our every step gradually sped up, the beast seemingly gaining stamina the longer it chased us. I spared a glance behind me, Penny's haunted face filling my vision. The deer's teeth snapped shut with an audible click. Its distended neck pushing out in an attempt to reach us. Just before we managed to reach the campsite, Penny's scream rang out, and I watched as the deer slammed its teeth down onto her leg. Blood shot out of the wound like a water balloon popping. The sudden halt of speed caused my body to lurch onto my back. I watched as its mouth opened to slam its jaw shut again, the angle of the bite unable to make a clean break. Before the blades could clamp onto her flesh, I reeled the butt of the rifle back and thrust it forward, smashing it into the animal's skull. Its teeth detached from her skin and Penny, who had already risen to her feet, began limping after Sarah and Max. Before it could recover from the blow, I once again slammed the rifle into its head, this time breaking the skin and sending bits of skull scattering. The deer crumpled to the ground, twitching violently as if attempting to force itself to get up. However, I stuck the barrel of the rifle into the soft entrance I managed to cave way into before firing once, twice, thrice, until all the firearm produced was a pathetic click. Its writhing seized, smoke exiting the wound as various exit shows littered its body. I scrambled back, turning to see the others stopped in their tracks, staring at me with an expression that I couldn't place. Only when I joined them by their side was Max able to break the silence. What was that? He demanded. His voice cracked under the stress. I could barely formulate a sentence, the sentiment ringing true for the others. We have to get her to the hospital. I breathed, dragging the base of the rifle along the dirt, attempting to clean off the bits of brain. That thing could have been rabid. We can't risk anything. It could have already gotten in her bloodstream, or... My words died out, causing silence to fill the air once more. I placed my hands on my knees, letting out a shaky sigh. Can someone drive? Too dangerous. Sarah winced, looking up as the sun's rays, which were already muted as a result of the branches overhead, dissipated to nothingness. There is at least a mile of nothing but trees from here before we get to the main road. We'd crash before anything could happen to Penny. Okay, does anybody know first aid? Sarah gingerly raised her hand, which I nodded at. Okay, get her to the car and patch her up. Penny, if you feel anything change, and I mean anything, tell us, alright? We're gonna stay for the night, but if you so much as feel uncomfortable, we're out of here. She nodded, her eyes refusing to leave the shallow wound left by the deer. Upon arriving at the campsite, Sarah and Penny both immediately sat down, with the former grabbing the medical kit from the tent. I turned to Max, who was kneeling over the campfire and attempting, albeit failing, to light the pile of twigs. What was that? My voice trailed off as Max shook his head, refusing to meet my gaze. Don't ask. 
His head shot up, his glare causing me to stumble back a few steps. The less we have to think about it, the less we're going to have a problem. We just need to get her to a hospital, and then we can forget this ever happened. Max, drop it. His shout rang out any argument I had, his voice reaching the two. Penny's wide eyes were directed at Max, making frequent stops to mine. Her expressions were akin to a patient awaiting bad news, fear interlacing her teal irises. Sarah gave Max a silent warning, to which his shoulders dropped. Just drop it, man, please. I nodded silently, turning my attention to the makeshift first aid Sarah was providing Penny. How are you? Penny's head suddenly jolted up, a movement that never failed to startle me. It didn't help that my paranoia was already at its maximum, causing my muscles to tense. As brown met a familiar shade of teal, I allowed myself to relax. How are you holding up? I continued once I realized Penny wasn't going to respond. She barely nodded her head, her eyes growing distant a few moments later. Her eyelids fluttered, attempting to concentrate on staying open. Sarah seemed to notice this, as the back of her hand lifted to touch Penny's forehead. Not that bad, all things considered. I thought you were burning up, but you just seemed tired, she concluded. Penny barely acknowledging her comment, with a sigh, Sarah gently brought Penny's head down to her lap, fingers interlacing with Penny's blonde locks. We should head to bed now. I think she's had enough excitement for one day. That's probably for the best. I agreed. Noticing that the source of light was now reduced to the dying embers Max attempted to ignite, me and Max will take turns keeping watch. We'll wake you guys up the moment there's any sun so we can get Penny to a hospital. Sarah hummed in approval, gently tapping Penny's cheek whispering something that caused the blonde's form to rise. She was practically dragged to the tent by Sarah, who gave a small wave before disappearing behind the fabric. Max and I stood in silence, neither daring to make the first move. I'll take the first watch, he muttered, fingers digging into his pockets as he fished out a cigarette. Least I can do for losing my rifle back there, right? You can sleep now. I got this. His attempt at humor was not that great even by his standards. Right. Disappointment etched itself onto his face as my lack of reaction caused him to sigh. If anything happens, please wake me up. He nodded, fighting the cancer stick before collapsing onto a chair, his stare fixated on the tree line. I spared him a final glance before entering the tent, which was situated across the girl's tent, though the inferior of the two. I didn't pay the jutting rocks digging into my skin any mind, though the sense of dread I felt in the forest no longer loomed over the air like a thick smog. That still didn't mean I could ignore the fact that there was something wrong. I was so sure that something was lurking in those woods that upon being awoken by Max, I was half expecting to see his pale face, eyes wide with horror, shaking my shoulders and telling me something terrible had happened. But all I awoke to was his dull expression, eyelids drooping with exhaustion. Your turn. By the end of his words, he fell onto the sleeping bag, his loud snoring already sounding off before I exited the tent. The fire, which had already been reduced to a few desperate embers, flickered in the wind as the dying flame miserably fought to keep itself alive. I tossed a few logs into it before beginning my first trek around the campfire, my body desperately screaming at me to return to my sleeping bag. However, the encroaching darkness fought off by only the dying fire and the rare ray of moonlight was all my brain needed to keep my legs moving and my body upright. Or I hoped it would. By the half hour mark, the butt of my rifle, 
which started position firmly in my right hand, now dragged across the dry terrain, the imprint of a circle appearing wherever it trailed. Max's shift seemed to be eventless, but never had I expected boredom to so easily replace any remnants of fear. Eventually my wandering brought me to Sarah's seat, which sat right in front of their tent. I carefully sunk my weight into it, careful not to make too much noise and potentially wake Penny up. It was quiet. Far too quiet. Yes, it may have been the dead of night on a day with little wind, but I still found myself yearning for the chirps and trills of distant insects. Irritation was a preferable emotion to isolation, I figured. Each time my head bopped down, eyes threatening to close, a howl of wind would pierce through the silence and jolt me awake. The sun was beginning to rise, making up for the dwindling flames of the campfire. When I was shaken out of my stupor once more, but this time, it wasn't the sound of leaves swaying in the wind, nor was it the snapping of twigs. It was... wet. Though barely audible, the crude squelches instantly brought me to my feet as I walked to the side of the tent where Sarah slept. I get that you're hungry, Sarah, but you really shouldn't be up right now. I ushered, my voice careful not to rise too high. Get some sleep, alright? However, the sloshing sound didn't cease. In fact, it only got louder. A faint smack of the lips accompanying it. My heart sank and a sudden wave of fear washed over me. Come on, Sarah. Penny's gonna wake up. Nothing. With an agitated groan, I walked in front of the tent, fingers clamping down on the metallic zipper, giving Sarah one final chance to announce herself. I unzipped the entrance, only for a pungent odor to hit me square in the nose. The moment the scene inside was made visible, my heart lurched forward and bile began rising from my stomach. The lack of light did nothing to hide the obscene amount of crimson splattered against every surface of the tent, the source of both the sound and the smell becoming apparent. Sarah's limp body sprawled out across the inside of the tent, chest caved in, one of her arms having been torn completely off. Tendons and ligaments hung out from the shoulder, bits of skin and muscle still clinging on to the bone. My eyes traveled up, catching sight of golden strands sticking to one another, dried blood causing ropey threads to form, frail fingers dug into the gaping hole, bringing pieces of flesh into her gnashing maw. Eyes once mimicking the sky, now glowed a vile yellow, pupils dilating irregularly. My gaze finally descended to where the gauze once sat, where an inflamed yellow wound pulsated. As the realization dawned on me, the form paused, head jolting up like an animal sensing prey. Her neck twisted hard enough to tear her head off, exposing rows of crumbling teeth not at all fit for tearing meat. My heart hammered against my chest at such velocity that I didn't hear the percussion of my rifle, nor the sound of Penny's mangled body landing on the ground, nor Max's heavy footsteps as he approached. By the time the piercing ringing blocking my ears faded, his fist had already connected with my jaw, sending me sprawling to the ground. The impact of the blow didn't hurt as much as the sudden shock which kept me frozen in place. Max immediately got on top of me, his fingers wrapping around my neck as he continuously applied pressure. I could barely point my finger in the direction of the tent and choke out a few unintelligible syllables, but thankfully he understood what I was implying. The grip around my throat loosened, and he looked toward where my finger was pointed. He yelled, scrambling off of me. His eyes hesitated, unsure what part of the situation warranted his attention the most. Sarah, Penny, John, what did you do? 
I simply shook my head, my hand rubbing where his fingers once were. I didn't. My words barely passed through the aching in my throat, voice hoarse from Max's assault. Penny, she, she, the deer, it made her like this, Max. I wanted to say more, but as the reality of our situation dawned on us, a sudden crushing weight forced my words to die out. It was too ridiculous. I had already imagined countless scenarios for how we would explain this to the police, and each one was less plausible than the last. A mix of a laugh and a cough escaped my lips, and absurdity of the situation taking away the realization that I had just witnessed my two closest friends die gruesome deaths. Luckily, Max was too busy checking the state of Sarah to pay attention to my hysteria. Otherwise, I wasn't sure if a punch was all I would have received. Oh god. I wheezed, finally managing the strength to push myself off of the ground. What are we gonna do? Max, who was delicately closing Sarah's eyes, ignored the question, instead directing his attention to Penny's corpse. Its limbs twitched, faint raspy breaths still being drawn despite the hole tearing straight through her skull. We burn it, he concluded, marching over to me and forcing me on my feet. They'll never believe anything we say, so we burn Penny, bury Sarah, and return ignorant. They ended up missing after we left them alone, and we had no idea where they went. Got it? His fingers dug into my skin, shoulder blade shifting painfully. All I could muster was a pathetic nod that could have easily been mistaken for a shiver, the merit of the plan outweighing its morals. I didn't need to look up to realize how out of his element Max was. My shoulders ached not only because of the pressure applied to them, but the constant shifting as a result of his quivering. I'll bring the shovel, I muttered, gently prying Max's fingers off of my shoulders. Once freed, I grabbed the tool from the car, returning to the gruesome scene. Who's dragging Sarah? The words felt heavy on my lips, and, the moment they left, a rush of guilt flooded through my veins. How could I talk about her like she was just some... thing, now? I stared at him expectantly, and he back at me. After a few seconds, he finally sighed, his shoulders slumping. I'll do it. He entered the tent, giving me room to grab Penny's ankle the one that the wound wasn't located on. Though the feeling of the flesh, soft and pliable, sent my heart racing, I refused to acknowledge it. Max finally exited, Sarah's broken figure dragging along the ground, blood pooling beneath her. The walk through the forest was silent, neither of us daring to utter a single word. A mixture of fatigue from the lack of sleep, and the events that transpired caused my vision to blur. The only thing keeping me awake was the feeling of her limb in my hand. I was so caught up in the daze, I didn't notice when Penny's body began to resist. Her fingers clawing at the dirt, desperate to break free. I did notice, however, when five bony digits wrapped around my ankle, forcing me back to reality. My hands fumbled for the shovel and slammed the sharp tip down, uncaring who or what the source of the appendage was. There was a sickening crack, and a guttural groan escaped Penny's lips. The limb, its state of rot increasing exponentially, was cleaved clean off, dark, cold blood dyeing the dirt, and the shovel in inky black. Her other hand came up without skipping a beat, but by the time the decayed fingers wrapped around my calf, Max was already aiming his rifle. The percussion caused my ears to ring, but the sudden release of weight was worth it. While the idea of burning the body may have seemed barbaric before, 
I was now more than willing to throw her limp figure into a blazing inferno if it meant not having to see her reanimated corpse move once again. Max, noticing my hesitant to touch Penny's body, once again grabbed her remaining leg, dragging her alongside Sarah. Once we arrived at a far enough clearing, I dug the shovel into the ground and peeled back a layer of earth. The sound of the metal digging into the earth violated the silence that seemed to so desperately cling to this forest. Each shovel took an eternity, the physical labor only heightened by the emotional toll. By the time I had made a shallow hole barely deep enough to cover Sarah, my limbs were beginning to ache. Max, noticing my exhaustion, grabbed the tool out of my hand. He pointed at the pile of dried leaves, sticks, and shrubbery covering Sarah, silently ordering me to gather more. By the time I returned, arms full of foliage, Max had already finished digging Sarah's grave. A makeshift cross made of two branches dug into the dirt acted as her headstone. I opened my mouth to tell him that marking her grave would only lead police directly to her body but he must have already come to the same conclusion as his boot reeled back. The cross burst into various splinters the moment Max's foot connected, scattering across the makeshift headstone. Without a word, he dragged Sarah's corpse into the hole, the body tumbling down, leaving pieces of red mush stuck to the dirt walls. He kicked the dirt in, her form slowly but surely being obscured. Her face, initially stuck in a ghastly expression of agony, was now calm, almost peaceful. Why? His voice cracked once he dropped the last bit of dirt, the mound barely standing out amongst the rest of the ground. He waited, and once he realized he wouldn't get an answer, his head turned toward me. The moment our eyes met, I instinctively returned my attention to the pile, where I dropped the bundle of shrubbery I held. I'm sorry, was all I could mutter before dousing her still convulsing body in gasoline. You... you didn't deserve this. Neither of you did. I'm so sorry. I threw the empty container aside, taking the box of matches from Max and lighting one. My hands held the small flame over the gas-covered pile, but I couldn't bring myself to drop in. To be the one to take her life was one thing, but this? Burning her corpse until it was nothing but ashes? The fire managed to reach my fingers by the time Max's patience ran thin. He slapped the match out of my hand, the whittled stick falling onto the tower of branches. It took a second for the fire to spread from a twig then to a leaf, then, finally, to the gasoline. A blast of white enveloped my eyes as a burst of fire shot up, tongues of flame lapping at each other until all that remained of Penny was ashes. The walk back was just, if not quieter than the walk to. Now that the sound of dragging corpses was absent, I stole a glance at Max, the usually tall and proud figure now bent over, shoulders sinking and his gaze permanently fixated on the dirt. Sarah. His voice cracked, the mere mention of her name threatening to tear down his walls. Sarah and Penny's families are gonna blame us, but we can't say anything. I know it sounds cruel, but we don't have any other choice. If we tell the truth, Penny's body is going to be investigated. Sarah's grave will be found and will be taken in. We didn't do anything wrong, John. We didn't deserve to have our lives ruined because of that thing, okay? Though it was a question, I knew better than to respond with anything but a nod. We packed our things up as if nothing had happened until my eyes landed on the second tent. Now with faint rays of sun illuminating our surroundings, it became apparent just how much blood Sarah had lost. Crimson speckled every fiber of the tent, bits of muscle still attached to the material, 
Though the vile stench emanating from the tent filled the air like smog, we still had to take it with us to hide any evidence. Once I finally entered the old, beaten down vehicle, I rested my forehead against the steering wheel, attempting to collect myself before starting the engine. Max sat down next to me, slamming the door shut. His gaze was fixated upon the mirror, his face twisted in monotony, his constant blinks undoubtedly to make sure that what happened wasn't some fever dream. John, he mumbled. The glazed look left his eye and returned to mine. Drive. I nodded, twisting the key in the ignition. The engine coughed to life, only for the gas to sputter out and end in a chilling silence. I twisted the keys once again, and more gas was pushed through the pipes, only for the same result. Max's lips curled into a scowl, and he snatched the keys out of my hands, repeating the action. However, the outcome was much the same. Four months ago, my mother died peacefully in her sleep at the age of 68. I wasn't exactly heartbroken at her unexpected passing. We had been estranged for over 20 years. I hadn't even seen her since I had left home for the last time bound for college. No phone calls either. Just an occasional Christmas card with a brief, impersonal message passed back and forth. My mother had never been a very warm or nurturing presence as I was growing up. Looking back, I think it probably had something to do with her own difficult childhood as a second-generation Irish immigrant in a large working-class family. There was also her older brother, who had offed himself when she was only ten. We had never gotten along and had clashed often, especially after I entered adolescence probably because of our vastly different personalities. Whereas I had been a cocky, irreverent, laid-back teen, she had been hard-working, stern, cold, and often harsh. After graduating college in 06, the first in my family to finish high school, let alone earn a degree, I had moved to the city to pursue a career. I had never gone back to visit her. Not once. As I was her only close living relative, my father died when I was still very young, and I had been an only child. I inherited my mother's home after she died. It was the same house I had grown up in, and had also been her childhood home, she and my father having bought it from her parents after they got married. I wasn't thrilled about owning the house. I had too many bad memories of it. Also, it was an ugly old place, and always had been. A dilapidated two-story clapboard. Well over a hundred years old, in a low-income neighborhood of similar, decrepit houses. It had probably been a nice place to live at one time. The area where it stood had originally been one of the more upscale parts of the town where I grew up, but that had been before the Great Depression and the area had gone into an economic decline long before I was born. Hell, even before my parents were born. I had no interest in keeping the property, and intended on selling it. But before I did, I decided to make the long overdue trip back home, and take one last look at the place where I had grown up. Not so much out of a sense of nostalgia or familial obligation, I was just curious to see how my mother had spent the last years of her life, and also, I wanted to check the house and see if there was anything I wanted to take with me before it went on the market. My job keeps me pretty busy, so it wasn't until last month, three months after her funeral, that I finally found the time to break away and take a few days off. It was a grey, dreary day, about a week before Thanksgiving, 
When I finally made the hour-long drive out of the city and back to the town where I had spent my childhood, the old neighborhood hadn't changed much. It was still as depressing and impoverished as I remembered. The same shabby houses, same tiny, unkempt lawns, same weedy, cracked sidewalks and bumpy, poorly maintained streets. I parked alongside the curb and got out of my car, taking a moment to stand and regard the house I hadn't laid eyes on in over two decades. It looked even more bleak and squalid than I recalled as a kid, peeling paint, sagging gutters, crumbling foundation, cracked window panes. Even when compared to its nearly identical rundown neighbors, it somehow stood out in an even sharper contrast. Like a testament to all the poverty and hopelessness I had experienced living there, everything I had fled to college to escape from, vowing I would never be as poor as my parents had been. Already I regretted having come back. With a sigh, I reluctantly stepped up the walkway to the front door and unlocked it with the key the executor of my mother's will had given me after her funeral. I entered and began to inspect the house. It was remarkably unchanged. At some point my mother had replaced the old analog TV in the living room with a modern flat screen, but apart from that, everything seemed to be exactly the same. Same threadbare furniture, same tacky knickknacks, same faded wallpaper. I went upstairs and walked down the narrow hallway pausing at my mother's doorway. Dull sunlight filtered in through the shabby curtains, illuminating the gloomy bedroom. I stared at the bare, sagging mattress on the bed where she had died. Her medication still clustered the bedside table. I stood there for a couple minutes, lost in thought, then moved on. I went to my old bedroom next. At some point after I'd moved out, my mother had turned it into a storage room. My bed and dresser were gone, so were the posters that had once decorated my walls, the shelves that had held my high school sports trophies. I wondered briefly if she'd thrown them out or had put them in the attic, now contained spare towels and extra toiletries. The air was musty. I went to the undressed, dusty window and peered out at the drab late autumn afternoon. The house was silent apart from my own breathing. My mother had died alone in this dismal house. The house she, unlike me, had never been able to escape from. The very air felt freighted with bad memories. Nothing good had ever happened here. I finally came home, Mom, I whispered, my voice choking on the final word. I felt the sting of tears in my eyes. Even though I still didn't mourn her as I probably should have, I did feel an overwhelming sense of sorrow and regret that we had never reconciled while there had still been time or had been closer during her last few years. There was nothing here I wanted to keep. I left my former bedroom and went downstairs. I don't know what motivated me to go down into the basement. There was nothing down there that would have interested me. I could just as easily have left the house right then and gone home. Maybe it was just a desire to be thorough. I had already checked out the rest of the house, and once I left, I knew I would never come back. The basement door was in the kitchen, between the refrigerator and the pantry. I opened it, flipped on the light, and descended the creaking wooden steps to the bottom. The basement was located directly beneath the kitchen. It was a small, dank, low-ceilinged room, hardly bigger than a walk-in closet. Rough stone walls and a concrete floor dimly illuminated by a single bare light bulb. It was mostly barren except for the washer and dryer, a shelf full of cleaning supplies, and some old tools cluttering one corner. I looked around with passing curiosity. When I turned to the rear wall, I couldn't help but crack a small smile. Still there. For as long as I could remember, 
the back wall of the basement had been dominated by a huge canvas mural depicting the black silhouettes of jitterbugging 1950s teenagers dancing against a white background. I had no idea why my grandparents, presumably since they had owned the house before my parents, had put it there. Maybe as a lame attempt to add a little cheer to such a dingy place. Whatever the reason, it was still there after all these years, although now it was badly faded, the canvas dirty and mildewed and tattered with age. Still smiling, I started to turn away from the basement and the house. But at the last second, something caught my eye. I approached and crouched down for a closer look, puzzled. The bottom of the old mural had been pulled away from the wall and curled up a few inches over the years, probably due to the dampness of the basement. And what was revealed wasn't bare stone, but wood. Intrigued, I grasped the frayed edge of the mural and pulled it up more. The rotted canvas ripping a little, exposing more wood. For a second, I didn't understand what I was seeing. Then it hit me, and I was stunned. It was a door, a secret hidden door behind the old, tasteless mural for God only knew how many years. A dozen questions rushed through my mind upon this discovery, chiefly among them. Who had hidden this door? Why was it hidden? And most importantly, what was on the other side of it? In a sudden burst of excitement, I unthinkingly seized the mural and pulled it up with all my strength, tearing it completely away from the rear wall of the basement, fully exposing the concealed door. I stood there, transfixed in shock, staring. The door looked ancient. Somehow it appeared even older than the house itself. It was rounded at the top, constructed of thick, heavy slabs of wood bound together with iron bands. There was no knob. Just a large iron pull ring. It looked like a door you'd seen in a medieval castle. An old but still relatively modern looking padlock was fastened to a hasp that secured it to the wall. But what surprised me most of all wasn't so much the door itself but the large manila envelope that had been stapled to it. And carefully printed in faded letters on the envelope was my own name. And a message in big block letters. For the love of God, never open this door. I pulled the manila envelope loose and examined it closely. It didn't look like it had been there any time recently. It seemed to have been there for a long time. Years. Maybe even decades. Maybe since I had been a very young child. I recognized the handwriting as my mother's. There was something inside the envelope. It felt like some kind of document. I looked at the envelope and its ominous warning. For the love of God, never open this door. Then at the mysterious door, the ancient looking, out of place door that had been kept hidden in my childhood home for all this time. Then back at the envelope in my hands, I was utterly baffled. So of course, like the idiot I was, before even opening the envelope to examine its contents, I made opening the door, I was explicitly instructed to never open my first priority, notwithstanding the love of the Supreme Being. But really, who could blame me? Who in my position would have been able to withstand the temptation to act in direct opposition to such a grave edict, regardless of the potential consequences? Curiosity killed the cat, right? There was a locked door in my old house that had remained a secret from me my entire life. Obviously it had been kept a secret for a reason. Said reason was almost certainly detailed in whatever my mother had left for me in the envelope. I could have taken the time to look at the contents of the envelope for explanation, but quite frankly, I didn't feel like taking the time to do that. I needed immediate satisfaction. I wanted to solve this enigma in the most direct and prompt manner possible. I needed to open that door. I looked at the padlock. 
It didn't seem like I would find the key after all this time. And besides, upon closer inspection, I realized the keyhole had been filled with solder, making a search of the house a moot point. I looked over at the old, rusty tools cluttering the corner of the basement. I rummaged through them, thinking I might find a crowbar or something I could use to pry off the hasp. Instead, I found something even better. A large bolt cutter. Perfect. I opened the bolt cutters and fastened the blades to the padlock's shackle. With a bit of effort, I was able to snap the padlock. I tossed it aside and grasped the iron pull ring. I had no idea what I was expecting to find on the other side of the door. A wild menagerie of different possibilities flashed through my imagination. Everything from hidden valuables to dead bodies. I had to quell my excitement by reminding myself that this was probably how Geraldo Rivera had felt in the moments before opening Al Capone's hidden vault. I hesitated for a moment, bracing myself for whatever discovery I was about to make, then pulled hard. The door opened with surprising ease given that it had been shut for, well, God only knew how long. The hinges moved smoothly and soundlessly. I pulled it all the way open and stared through the doorway at... Nothing. Nothing but blackness utter blackness. I took out my phone, turned on its flashlight, and aimed it into the darkness, but it illuminated nothing. Thinking the phone's light simply wasn't powerful enough, I rushed back upstairs and frantically searched through the kitchen cabinets and drawers until I found the big four-cell mag lights I remembered from my childhood. A long, heavy flashlight with a powerful beam. I turned it on to test the batteries, saw it worked, then scrambled back into the basement. I shined the light into the doorway, and was perplexed. The flashlight's beam didn't reveal anything in the dark space beyond the threshold. It didn't cast a spotlight circle of brightness upon the rear wall of the secret room, or disclose anything the room might have contained. The beam of light seemed strangely diffused. The beam didn't seem to penetrate the illimitable blackness so much as be absorbed by it. It was like aiming a flashlight at the night sky, as if there was nothing solid for the shaft of light to fix upon. I couldn't make sense of it. What I was seeing was impossible. Standing there, contemplating that Stygian abyss, I had the impression that I was looking upon some vast, lightless space of unknown, enormous proportion. A space that seemed to illogically defy the physical dimensions of my mother's house. I felt a sudden flood of overwhelming, existential dread and horror. Something close to madness. I felt as if I was peering through a doorway into the godless black void of non-existence that must stand beyond the furthest reaches of the universe, a place where nothing was, or ever had been or would be. It was like looking into the mouth of hell. Robert. For a few seconds, I didn't register the voice, thinking perhaps I'd only imagined it, but then it spoke my name again. Robert. It was my mother's voice. I recognized it clearly, even though I hadn't heard it in more than twenty years. My dead mother's voice, whispering my name from the black gulf beyond the doorway. I was galvanized with sudden primal terror, so intense that coherent thought became almost impossible. I began to tremble. I couldn't even breathe. The voice spoke again, faintly as if speaking from a great distance, but unmistakably my late mother's, and the urgent pleading in it was almost unmistakable. Please, Robert, help me. This isn't real. Some part of my mind spoke up, trying to maintain its sanity and make logical sense of what was happening. It cannot be real. You're dreaming. Please, Robert, 
help me. The disembodied voice beseeched, imploring desperately. Help me, it's so cold and dark in here. The voice was trying to coax me through the doorway into the unknown blackness, and with sudden chilling certainty, I understand it was not my mother speaking to me, attempting to lure me to it. Please, Robert. My paralysis snapped. I reached suddenly, compulsively for the door and slammed it shut, blocking out that awful, unnatural darkness. Immediately the voice fell silent. Gasping with a sudden rush of panicked adrenaline, I closed the hasp. My eyes darted around the basement. The padlock was ruined, but I found a screwdriver amidst the old tools and inserted it into the hasp, securing the door. Then I ran upstairs, pausing only long enough to grab the still unopened envelope my mother had addressed to me. I fled the house, leaped into my car and drove away, and I haven't returned since. When I got home about an hour later, I was almost back to normal. I spent most of the return journey in a state of shock, driving my car on autopilot barely aware of my surroundings, until I was only a few miles away from my apartment. Then I had to pull into a gas station as I was struck by a crippling panic attack. I opened the door and thrust my head out just in time to avoid vomiting into my car. Then I just leaned back with my hands over my face, weeping and gasping for 10 minutes, until I had myself more or less back under control. I entered my apartment, shut the door, then sat down on my couch and examined the manila envelope I had found on the hidden basement door. Robert, for the love of God, never open this door. I opened it. It contained a sheaf of musty smelling handwritten pages. I began to read, and, as I read, I began to understand why my mother had kept that door a secret from me all these years, and why she had left me a warning for when I would inevitably discover it. The first page was dated the year I was born. My mother had written this, and left it for me nearly 40 years before, when I had still been an infant. She must have been terrified something might happen to her, or that she wouldn't be present to warn me in the event that I stumbled upon the door while I was still a child. I read, and as I began to feel that familiar cold dread creeping into my body, just as it had when I first opened the door. My mother had been born the year after her parents had immigrated to the U.S. from Ireland. They had bought the old house when she was five having saved up for it several years working their grueling, menial jobs as factory workers. Even then the house had been run down, but it had been cheap, and it was all they could afford, and they had still been grateful to own an actual home of their own, a place they could raise their family instead of the cramped slum apartment they had all been sharing. Three years passed uneventfully in the house, the terror began when my mother was eight. She and her ten-year-old brother had been the youngest of five children, the older three already being adults who had joined their parents in the workforce. As a result, when they weren't in school, they were often alone in the house until the rest of the family got home in the evening. This probably sounds like neglect to you, but bear in mind this was the early 1960s and times were different then. It was her brother who found the door in the basement. At the time, it had been concealed behind a set of shelves that contained old jars of preserves left behind by the previous owner. It was a chilly, windy day in late fall. During their autumn break from school, they had been playing hide-and-seek and he had squeezed into the narrow space between the shelves and the wall, and that was how he had discovered it. When their parents and older siblings got home, he had told them what he had found. Intrigued, their father and her two older brothers had removed the shelves, exposing the door. It had been locked with an ancient brass padlock, one of those round railroad locks 
like you see in old western films. It didn't look like it had been opened in at least a century. The padlock was so old and corroded that it crumbled to dust when her father gave it a single tug. Their father had opened the door, shining a flashlight, taken a single look inside, then immediately slammed the door. My mother wrote that she had never seen her father look so frightened as he had right then. Never before, and never after. He had sternly told his five children to never open the door or ever go near it again. He had refused to answer any questions and had sent them all to Ben. That night my mother had heard her parents talking urgently in their bedroom. She had pressed her ear to the wall and listened. She couldn't make out everything they were saying, but she did hear her father say something to her mother about her sister laughing in the dark and buying a new lock at the hardware store tomorrow. She said their voices were low and heated, but it didn't sound like they were fighting. It sounded like they were just scared. My mother was troubled by what her father had said about hearing his sister laughing. Her father had only one sister, who would have been my mother's aunt, but she had died when he was still a child living in Ireland. My mother had been frightened, but her brother had been intrigued. He had wanted to know what his father could have seen or heard on the other side of that door that would have upset him so much. His curiosity overrode the trepidation he may have had. Later that night, after the rest of the family was asleep, he had disobeyed his father's orders. He had gotten up, gone down to the basement, and opened the door. The next morning, my mother had awakened to the sound of my grandmother screaming her husband's name in a panic. Her voice had been coming from the basement. The family had hurried down to the basement. My mother had observed her mother standing over my uncle who was huddled in the corner, shuddering spasmodically. My mother wrote that she never forgot what she saw. She said it haunted her for the rest of her life. Her brother's face was contorted into a grimace of pure, incomprehensible terror, his eyes bulging from their sockets, his teeth bared like a snarling dog's. His hair had turned completely white. His bulging, unblinking eyes were fixed in a direct line of sight with the secret basement door, which was standing wide open on a rectangular of total blackness. He was alive but in a state of full catatonia, unable to speak or move or react to any stimuli. My grandparents had called an ambulance, and my uncle was rushed to the hospital. My father immediately bought a new padlock and sealed the basement door. My uncle was put in a mental institution. The doctors thought he would never recover, but miraculously, Against all expectations, he eventually did, although it was over a year before he was functional enough to return home. He was never fully the same after that. He was withdrawn and quiet and morose, prone to emotional outbursts and panic attacks. He had trouble sleeping and often experienced nightmares and night terrors when he did sleep. He refused to answer any questions about what had happened to him that night, and would scream in fits of hysteria if prodded. He absolutely refused to set foot in the basement, or even go near the door in the kitchen that led down there. He would become violent if anyone tried to make him. His condition gradually deteriorated over the next year. He lost weight and developed dark rings around his eyes from lack of sleep. He became paranoid and jumped at every sound. My grandparents would have sent him to a psychiatrist if they could have, but they simply couldn't afford it. One night, after bedtime, he broke down crying and finally told my mother what had happened that night almost two years before. When he opened the door, he had heard a voice speaking to him from the darkness. Not a scary or a threatening voice. It was a friendly voice. A voice he even recognized. Whose voice? My mother asked him. Captain Kangaroo. My uncle had stammered to her. 
referencing a popular children's television show from the time that he had been fond of. It was Captain Kangaroo. He spoke to me by name. He told me I could come inside and play with him in the treasure house. He had stepped through the dark doorway into the gulf of the unknown. What did you see in there? My mother had anxiously asked him. My uncle had been quiet for several long moments. Tears rolled down his cheeks. My mother could see fear rising in his eyes as he forced the words out. It wasn't the treasure house. It wasn't Captain Kangaroo in there. It... He paused to gulp, then choked out. There are things in there. In the darkness. Things you can see, but can't see. My mother had been confused by that statement. Things you can see, but can't see. But my uncle hadn't. Or perhaps couldn't explain it any better than that. Reading those words, I felt a chill envelop my whole body, as if hundreds of ice cubes were being pressed against my skin. Things you can see, but can't see. My uncle told her he had been lost in the darkness with those things, hunted by them, running from them, hiding from them, unable to find the doorway that led back to the basement. It's bigger in there than you think, he said. So much bigger. It's endless in there. Until just by blind chance he had stumbled through it. Away from that awful, godless blackness. He told her that he probably hadn't been in there for more than an hour at most, but time is different inside. It felt like he had been trapped in there for many years. Perhaps even centuries. My uncle told my mother that he couldn't stand to live with what he had experienced any longer. He said it felt like some part of him had never left that secret basement room, and was still trapped in there for eternity. He had hugged her and kissed her and told her he was sorry, then had left her room. My mother was bewildered and frightened and confused by what he had meant with his final words, I'm sorry. That was the last time she ever saw her brother alive. He had taken his father's straight razor from the bathroom and slit his wrists in his bed that same night. My uncle had been 12 years old. She had never told her parents what her brother had told her the night before he did it. They were already so overwhelmed with grief and horror, she didn't think they could bear it. But. They must have suspected his death had something to do with whatever he had experienced in the basement. They had barricaded the door and strictly forbid the rest of their children from ever going down there again. My grandmother had been the only one to enter the basement to do the laundry, and even then she tried to keep her visits as brief as possible. My grandparents wouldn't allow them to talk about my uncle or his death, and even mentioning his name caused them to get slapped, as my mother painfully learned early on. They wanted to forget about him and put the whole terrible ordeal behind them. My mother often wondered why her parents hadn't sold the house and moved them somewhere else for a fresh start, why they had continued to live there after what had happened. She assumed it was probably because of their lack of money. But then, years later, when she was a young woman and married my father, her parents, aging and in failing health, asked her if she and her husband would take the house from them when they died. My mother said that my grandmother didn't so much offer as beg them to live there. My mother couldn't believe her parents would want the house to remain in the family after the loss they had suffered there. But my grandmother had told my mother she couldn't stand the thought of the house falling into someone else's possession. Someone who didn't know about the door in the basement. Someone who might also have children. Reading that, I suddenly understood. Understood everything. I understood why my mother had been so strict and overbearing when I was a child. So overprotective of me. Why she had always been so moody and serious. Why she had continued to live in that gloomy house with its burden of tragedy and painful memories. All of those years, right up until the day she died. 
I understood why she had hidden the door behind that old mural with a warning in the event that I would someday uncover it after she was gone. She had been guarding that door, guarding the door to prevent some other unfortunate, unknowing soul from opening it, and being lured into the darkness by a familiar, trusted voice, as her brother had been. I understood something else. I could never sell that house. I had to keep it in my possession, take up my mother's mantle as its guardian for the rest of my life. There is something in the darkness beyond that old wooden door, something terrible that doesn't belong in our world, something unnatural and unholy, something you can see, but can't see. I wanted to post this earlier, but I've been trying to collect my thoughts and prepare for the inevitable. I just need someone, anyone, to know what is going to happen and whether they have any suggestions on how to stop it. Since before I was born, my town has never celebrated New Year's Eve. It's now a tradition that on December 31st, around 8pm, everyone bolts their doors and windows draws their curtains and holds on to their loved ones in anticipation for who will be next. Before you ask? No, I won't tell you what town it is because I would be hung, drawn, and quartered. Despite the atrocity that occurs here every year, for some reason the people most affected don't want any outside help, opting to keep this sordid secret between the townspeople. I will tell you, however. It's somewhere in Europe, along a coastline. Despite asking why, my family never told me anything until the day of my 14th birthday, when my classmates began to talk about the rumors circulating our high school. Apparently, every New Year's Eve, someone, seemingly chosen at random, begins to descend into pure madness. Convinced they have seen someone who looks identical to them walking along the coastline shortly before diving into the rock-infested waters below. At midnight, on December 31st, black humanoid-like creatures walk through the town, ignoring all houses except the abode of the chosen townsperson. Screams of the victim echoes throughout the desolate streets unanswered and ignored by any soul unfortunate enough to hear it. What's strange is that a victim turns up exactly 72 hours later, as if nothing happened. Except they come back... wrong. When the missing are asked where they have been for three days, they shut down the conversation in severe, hostile fashion, adamant nothing is wrong. My friend's mother went missing when we were nine. He said when she returned, she wasn't the loving mother he used to have, but a sour and bitter woman who was more interested in gossiping and spreading hateful words to anyone who would listen. Come to think of it, for the past five years or so, almost every missing person has been female. Anyway, according to my dad, it began around 100 years ago when my great-grandfather was a child. He said that it happened approximately every five years, and it was only sick children who were being abducted. Each time a search party was formed, and every inch of the coastal town was scoured looking for the sickly victims. It was believed at first to be a case of the children wandering off and getting lost or falling off the coastline cliff's edge into the murky waters below. But when the children returned three days later, the town rejoiced, not wondering where they got to, just happy that they returned, and returned healthy. Some sightings have been noted over the years of children diving off the cliffs before being reported as missing, hence the people initially thinking they had not gone missing at all, but in fact perished when they fell off the cliff's edge. However, when they turned up three days later, the encounter was dismissed. Even with the witnesses testified to the fact they saw the children dive off the cliff, 
not fall. People believe what they want to believe, I guess. Over time, more and more people went missing, including some adults, too. Back to what urged me to write this story. Last year, my mother was chosen. The events of that fateful night are hazy at best. Almost as if I'd been drugged, but I do remember the primal bone-shaking fear that I felt. Around two days before New Year's Eve, my mother became a recluse, similar to the way dogs isolating themselves from their owners when they know they're dying. When my father pressed her for information, she broke and told us that she had indeed witnessed a woman with her exact likeness, down to the mole on her chin, jump off the cliff overlooking the sea. In one fell sweep, our whole world had shattered. We tried to prepare as best we could, boarding every entrance point to our house, gathering anything we could fashion into weapons and awaiting the worst. My father sent my younger brother and I upstairs so we wouldn't witness the cruel ordeal. But you know kids, they never listen. So we sat on the top of the stairs in anticipation, as if in an instant all the sound around us ceased. That's when the wailing began. The air was so still you could hear a pin drop. My heart was in my throat as I looked over to my mother and father cradled in each other's arms. Tears free-flowing as they kissed and bid their farewells to one another. I heard my dad say that she would be back in three days and everything would be okay. What a sweet lie that was. The events that followed felt like they happened in slow motion. The wailing increased in volume as vicious thuds surrounding every square inch of the house. And just as the sounds became too ear-shattering, the front door succumbed to the immense pressure of the force pushing it open. I think I began to pass out from fear as my memories from this point come in flashes. Dozens of humanoid, mist-like creatures entered our home. Darkness. My father tries to fight them off, to which he is violently thrown headfirst into the fireplace mantle. Darkness. My mother's ear-piercing screams as she is forcefully dragged out of the living room window. Darkness. As the legend foretells, my mother emerged exactly three days later from the forest surrounding our desolate town. At first I was overcome with joy and relief that she had returned, until I saw her face. Have you heard of the phenomena called Uncanny Valley? It's where something looks and acts human, but instinctively we can tell they're not. Innately you are aware that this thing is not human, but is merely imitating a human. Well, that was my mother. Her skin was ever so slightly gray, and her once fiery red curls slightly less red and thinner. Small changes that are not easily noticeable to anyone who doesn't see her every day. But I noticed. Over the past year, the mother I had adored was gone. She was now a wicked woman, with no interest in her children and a cruel disposition. This led to me becoming depressed and withdrawn. She was my best friend, who I would tell everything to, but now? Now she's not even a mother anymore. Our household now felt hostile and unfamiliar to me. That imposter living with us and slowly spreading her venomous hate. My father couldn't make sense of who his wife now was or what had happened to them and began drinking heavily. My younger brother? Well... He no longer talks to anyone. Not a single word muttered to a single soul. I, on the other hand, began avoiding crowds, my friends, and pretty much anything that required being social, leading to late night walks around the town. I hated with every fiber of my being for taking my mother away from me. With Christmas now over, and the new year looming, I've seldom been out the past couple of weeks. 
petrified of what was awaiting our town once again. But Dad had drunk himself into a stupor, and my mother, or whoever she was, has begun her usual verbal berating, and I was not in the mood to sit there and take it. Lost in my own thoughts as usual, the air bit my skin leaving goosebumps trailing down my arms. Suddenly aware of how cold I actually was, I decided to head home, which would take me near the dreaded cliff's edge if I were to take the shortcut. But if I was quick, no. I'd rather freeze and take the long way. With my mind set, I took off, breaking into a slight sprint to hopefully warm myself up a bit. After around 10 minutes, I found myself near the cliff's edge. Panicked and confused, I spun on my heel and began to head in the other direction away from the lifeless sea. How did this happen? I headed away from the water, didn't I? Scolding myself, I tried to rationalize what just happened. I must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. My own fault for being lost in thought to not paying attention. Suddenly I stopped in my tracks. No. Face your fears, I thought. If I see myself on that cliff's edge, I'll tell her she has a good butt and accept my fate. I chuckled internally, smiling for the first time in what felt like months until I spotted a red-headed woman a few yards away from me. Freezing with fear, I lifted my eyes to study her face. Staring back at me were eyes I recognized the ones I loathed the most that looked back at me each morning as I absent-mindedly brushed my teeth. Before my brain had time to catch up with what I was witnessing, the exact double of myself winked at me before she dived off the cliff straight into the rock-infested waters below. I never thought I would have to leave my country to save my wife, but here I am, on a plane to Switzerland, with a suitcase full of cash and a desperate hope. She has been pregnant for two years, and no one knows why. The doctors have tried everything, from ultrasounds to MRIs, but they can't see what's inside her. They can't even tell if it's a baby or something else. Something I hope is just a complication from such a long term. My wife and I have different views on having children. She had a hereditary condition that made pregnancy very difficult and dangerous for her, but she also had a strong desire to be a mother. She grew up as an only child and felt lonely. She wanted to have a big family and give her children the love and attention she craved. I loved my wife and wanted to support her, but I also worried about her health and well-being. I thought about adopting children who needed a home and a family. I thought that would be a safer and more compassionate option. We talked about it and agreed to try for a baby, even though it was risky and painful for her. But when she made it into her second trimester, it was a blessing. I thought I was ready for fatherhood. I had a stable job, a loving wife, and a cozy home. I was overjoyed. But the pregnancy didn't progress normally. Discomfort and pain became her constant companions. Morning sickness, fatigue, backaches, swelling, changes in sleep patterns, and other bodily changes made her miserable and exhausted. But that was nothing compared to the fear and anxiety that gripped me every day. She didn't show any signs of growth. She didn't feel any movement except for pain. She didn't hear any heartbeat except for silence. And the doctors didn't know what was wrong. We hoped for a miracle, but we got a nightmare. Work-life balance was a joke. I could barely manage to get through the day, let alone support her and our baby. 
I felt guilty for working too much, but I also felt guilty for not earning enough. I tried to prepare for parenthood, but I had no idea what to expect or how to cope. I felt alone and overwhelmed. Financial strain added to the stress. Medical bills piled up, and we had to dip into our savings. We worried about how we would afford maternity leave, child care, and all the other expenses that come with having to perform so many tests. We had to cut back on everything, and we still barely made ends meet, and make sure they were... no way miscarriages could happen. Relationship stresses tested our bond. Pregnancy can put strain on any relationship, but ours was pushed to the limit. We argued more than ever, and we struggled to communicate and understand each other. We tried to be supportive and loving, but we also felt frustrated and resentful. It's been 730 days. Not days of morning sickness and cute baby bumps, but 730 days of a swollen belly, endless doctor's appointments, and a growing chasm between me and my wife. It started normally enough. Positive test, excitement, planning for the tiny human on the way. But then, at month nine, something went wrong. The bump kept growing, but no heartbeat, no kicks, just an unsettling emptiness. Doctors were baffled, scans showed nothing but shadows. Freaky shadows that sent chills down my spine. New laws came in, shutting down any hope of invasive procedures. No termination, no poking around to see what was going on. We were stuck with this... thing growing inside my wife, stealing her life and slowly poisoning ours. We tried everything. Every specialist, every clinic, even lawmakers. All brick walls of apathy and legalese. No one cared that this wasn't normal, that her stomach was pushing against its limits, her legs and feet swollen like balloons, and every scan every prod, every cold touch on her belly, it felt like scraping ice against my soul. We used to be close, whispering dreams of the future. Now the silence between us is deafening, punctuated only by her strained breaths and the creaking of the house settling in the dead of night. Sometimes I stare at that monstrous bulge and wonder what it is. But I do worry more about my wife, and how this all feels for her. I just wanted it to stop, and so did she. Whatever this was, it was stealing our lives. Even if it means silence, even if it means emptiness. And so I found myself on a plane to Switzerland, with a suitcase full of cash and a desperate hope. She sat beside me asleep but I soon noticed something along her stretched out shirt. A seemingly glossy steel shell had pierced through a skin. We met a doctor at the airport who took us to a secluded facility. He said he had a solution, but it came with a price. She might not make it, the doctor said. I can't survive any longer, my wife said. So the procedure began. Dr. Petrov, a grizzled man, prepped our makeshift operating room. My wife, pale and fragile, on the makeshift table, held my hand tighter than she ever had, her knuckles white against mine. Ready? Petrov's voice rasped, a surgeon's mask obscuring his face. My throat squeezed shut. For what? To pull back the curtain, he said. The glint of the ankle grinder, blade catching the sunlight. For answers, even if they're not the ones you want. I nodded. 
The lump in my throat, immovable. Answers. Any answers were better than the gnawing void of the past two years. The whirring of the grinder sliced through the silence. A mechanical shriek that sent shivers down my spine. It bit into my wife's flesh. The smell of burning iron filling the air. I squeezed her hand. A silent mantra of, it's okay, it's okay, bouncing against the walls of my skull. Time morphed into a sickening blend of blood, bone, and metallic tang. Petrov worked with a grim efficiency, a sculptor chipping away at a grotesque statue. Every groan from my wife, every tremor of her body was a fresh jolt of agony. Then, a gasp. Dr. Petrov held up a piece of warped metal, its edges catching the light like a twisted halo. It pulsed faintly, an alien heartbeat in the sterile room. My god, Petrov breathed, his voice raw. A shell, wrapped around her spine. My world shattered. A metal shell? Inside her? The phantom pregnancy. The cold void under her skin. It all made a horrifying sense. We weren't carrying a child. We were carrying... this. My wife whimpered. Eyes wide with a primal fear that mirrored my own. Her hand, slick with sweat, slipped from mine. I reached for her, but Petrov pushed me back, his face grim. We need to remove it, he said, his voice tight. Now. But as the grinder whined back to life, a new terror bloomed in the air, a metallic hum emanating from the shell itself. It pulsed, it resonated, before it slowly retracted its tentacles from my wife's spine, pushing itself out her to roll over to the floor as Petrov remained shocked. My wife lay still, her eyes empty, a vessel emptied of such a heavy thing. As I looked down and touched the shell, Petrov begged I stop but I had to know what we had been dealing with. The shell gently opened and I wondered what to expect until I met a beautiful baby girl. But her eyes weren't right. They still aren't. She's growing up quickly since that last week. She can talk now and she really does love us even helping her mom through her recovery. But I don't know if she's really mine. But what else can she be? Part 1 well, it's my first time doing this, so I think an introduction is in order. My name is Jake. I'm a young American, and less than a month ago, I started working the night shift at a convenience store in Denton, Texas. The job is to save money for college, since I wasn't fortunate enough to come from a wealthy family or succeed in school, either in sports or academics. The routine, though monotonous, has its calm and tranquility. I organize shelves, attend to sporadic customers, and, of course, take the opportunity to study between customers. The first point is that, yes, it messes with your biological clock. I'm only just starting to get used to it in these last few days. My shift is from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. But, on the other hand, the sleeping city creates a unique atmosphere during the wee hours. The yellow lights of the gas station cast soft shadows on the asphalt, 
and the constant hum of the refrigerator is my soundtrack. As mundane as it may be at times, the comforting solitude of this hour is something I appreciate. While the world sleeps, I'm here, earning a few bucks to build my future. If that were the only thing, I wouldn't be writing here. But I need to report to someone who understands the events of last night. As always, I arrived for another night shift and was greeted by Ryan, my co-worker. A nice guy, but always seemed a bit tense. They say he got involved with drugs in high school and owed some people money. His shift ends before mine, so sometimes our schedules overlap when he does overtime. During one of the breaks, Ryan told me about a strange guy he had seen lurking around earlier. He said the guy seemed out of place, watching everything with a disturbing look, wearing sunglasses and a cap, like a movie disguise. He said the guy seemed to be keeping an eye on the gas station's activity. I thought it might be someone after Ryan, given his history, or in the worst case, I should be alert for a possible robbery. Just to be safe, we decided to inform Mr. Gonzalez, our boss. He's an elderly Mexican man who is well respected in the town, said to be one of the oldest residents. He usually keeps a gun under the counter, in addition to the one he carries with him. The sheriff, apparently a close friend of Mr. Gonzalez, even came here with him to warn us that if necessary, we should use that gun for safety, along with a hidden button that sends an alert to the boss's phone. After reporting the situation, he simply shrugged and said there was nothing to worry about. Everyone knew who he was in the area, and if things got tough, just press the button and he would come. He even swore to be on standby during that night. Hours later, Ryan left for home, leaving me alone and wishing me good luck. The store fell silent, only the distant sounds of the city echoing. Slowly, the fear left my body. I grabbed an energy drink and started reading a book. About an hour passed, around midnight, when I noticed a suspicious customer entering a black van. He refueled quickly while staring into the store, then decided to come in. He wore a cap that covered half of his face and his eyes seemed to examine every corner of the store. He looked like the guy Ryan described, so my tension increased. I kept my finger on the button under the table. The suspicious customer just wandered through the aisles, examining the products, nothing abnormal. Then he picked up a pack of cigarettes, condoms, and left. I chuckled internally, understanding what had happened and how I had worried for nothing. It was just a country guy afraid of Puritan neighbors and becoming local gossip. That relieved my tension. But only for a moment. As he left, a strange feeling enveloped me, as if the air were electrically charged. For a brief moment, the light flickered, coming back quickly but not completely. I became tense when I saw that a specific corner of the store was dark. Almost impossible to distinguish with the naked eye. That caught my attention, and every few seconds, my vision was drawn and coerced to look there. With each glance, the hairs on my neck raised more. It was as if there was something there, as if my subconscious knew. Suddenly a sound of something metallic falling echoed through the dark aisle. I jumped back, freezing in place. Ah, you're a clown. I thought, it's just a poorly placed can on the shelf. Don't let Ryan's paranoia get to you. I took the first step to move to the aisle when suddenly, another noise began. This time more constant. It was the can that had fallen, but this time it rolled toward me, hitting my foot. I looked at it as it stopped and it was open. There was someone inside the damn store. I looked into the darkness and could swear I saw something taking shape. A slender, feminine figure walking towards me. Was I crazy? I hoped so. But that thing started to approach. Methodically and rhythmically. 
I didn't want to reach for the gun. I knew there was a chance I was in danger, so what I did was discreetly press the button under the table and run to the warehouse at the back of the store. As I started running, I could hear footsteps behind me running too. Very fast. She seemed to almost not touch the ground and still got so close. I reached the door and slammed it behind me. Milliseconds before feeling the impact of her weight being thrown against the metal structure. I turned the clock. This door was extremely heavy and resistant. I was sure I could spend the rest of the night peacefully inside until I saw her blows making the door shake. I calmed down as the power of the attacks gradually subsided. A good amount of time had passed. How much? I don't know. I made the mistake of leaving my phone on the counter when I ran. I didn't want to risk going out before making sure it was safe, and the lack of windows in the warehouse left me unsure if it was already dawn. As I calmed down and the adrenaline dissolved in my blood, I began to think more rationally. What if that woman was just a homeless person, mentally unstable, and became reactive to my unexpected action? Besides, what could an old lady do against me? I felt like an idiot, decided, with great caution, to open the door and try to talk or at least approach in a more peaceful way and understand the situation of that person. When I unlocked and peeked my eye out, I saw Mr. Gonzalez speaking like the sheriff, scribbling on a notepad while the old man spoke. I approached them, and then both seemed confused. Jake, how did you get into the warehouse? He asked. Well, I had some problems last night and had to hide there. Did you just arrive now? Jake? Well, never mind. I'm glad you brought the sheriff because I think there's a woman who... Kid, he raised his voice. You've been missing for three days. No. What? Did I really spend all that time in there? But I didn't feel anything. Thirst? Sleep? What's going on here? Jake, you didn't spend the whole time in there. Because the warehouse was the first place we checked when we arrived. I was stunned and disoriented. After a glass of water and sitting for a while, I finished telling them what had happened. Look, young man, I heard the alarm when you pressed it and I ran here. Maybe 15 minutes at most. The store was deserted. I searched the warehouse, the bathrooms, everywhere, and nothing. Neither you nor Ryan, actually. Do you have any information about him? No, he left before all of this happened. Long before. He was all paranoid. You know how he is. Usually, the season is not that time of year, the sheriff murmured. What? I asked. I think we need to talk, Mr. Gonzalez said. I have a proposal to make, and you must decide what you want for yourself, right? If you want... I can fire you now and pay your rights and a hefty compensation. Or if you prefer to continue working here, you need to be aware of the risks you are taking. Not just the obvious ones like criminals or raccoons in the trash. Now go home. Take the day off for yourself and think about it. If you want to leave and put this behind you, which I completely understand, just send me a message and the money will soon be in your account. If you prefer the second option, meet me at the cafe today at 8 p.m., as I'll need to give you some information. He patted my shoulder, and I said goodbye. I ended up spending a good time responding to friends and family, modifying the story a bit, talking about a nighttime intruder, a physical confrontation, and how I ended up disoriented in the middle of the fight. Most didn't ask more questions and wished me well. Now what occupies my mind most of the time is the proposal I received. I really don't know if by continuing to work there, I'll be sinking deeper into this quagmire or saving myself. Saving myself from what? You might be wondering. Well, after a restless sleep on the couch, 
I woke up to a single knock on the door. I peeked through the peephole without seeing any trace of anyone, but when I opened the door and saw what was there, my stomach churned. A can like the one from last night, open and almost empty, with some sticky remnants at the bottom. The disturbing part, however, was the strange label, from a brand I've never heard of. On a vibrant yellow background, red letters announced, Canned Ryan. I felt nauseous instantly, locked myself in the house and refused to even look out the window. I've been in front of the computer ever since, writing this and would like some advice. Should I accept the proposal to continue working the night shift? Part 2 as some of you suggested in the comments, I decided to face the unknown and talk to Mr. Gonzalez about the unexplainable events at the convenience store. Since if he has been alive in the store for so long, he must know at least how to protect himself. I quickly packed my things, locked the door of my house with a mix of apprehension and distrust, put the Ryan can in a black bag, and took it with me as I headed to the cafe where we arranged to meet. Upon arrival, I found Mr. Gonzalez in a corner, fiddling with a cup of what looked like coffee, and upon closer inspection, turned out to be brandy. I sat down, greeting him, and he placed the cup on the table, giving me a consoling look. Jake, I'm glad you decided to come. Your courage is remarkable and we need someone willing to face the unknown, Mr. Gonzalez said. And of course, I also bet 20 bucks with the sheriff that you would come, so thanks for the money too, he chuckled. I thanked him for the opportunity. The joke had eased the tension a bit, but every time I remembered what was in the bag in my hands, I trembled. I wanted answers. I wanted to understand what was happening in that store. Gonzalez seemed to sense my unease and began to explain. Here, Jake. We've been dealing with something ancient. Something rooted in the depths of the store. For years, even before I took over, strange things happened here at night. Shadows, whispers, things that defy logic. But we've learned a basic rule. Ignore the thing, and it ignores us. Strange things? I asked. And why didn't you warn us? Did Ryan know about this? Well, Jake, the thing only really shows up after a certain time, when a new employee comes. They are left in peace for a while. Usually it's two or three months before things start getting weird. That's why we hired someone around this time of year. The thing manifests itself in the dead of winter, and you can probably figure out why. Less movement, more tranquility, especially at night. And no, Ryan didn't know about this. This only increased my perplexity. Mr. Gonzalez was playing with lives here. I couldn't hold back and pulled the can out of the bag, placing it on the table. You knew? All along? Knew that negligence caused this? I pointed to the can. He seemed taken aback. His eyes widened and he made the sign of the cross. Jake, I... I didn't know that this could happen. Sweat started to bead on his forehead. But if I can at least defend myself, I decided not to tell you because things only start when you're aware of them, at least within the time frame I set. Three months is the maximum it takes for it to manifest, and two months is the minimum. Usually it's during this period that I call new employees to explain more. Maybe Ryan found out on his own. Did he tell you anything? He seemed haunted lately. I remembered his paranoia. Yeah, he seemed frantic, but nothing much different from his usual conspiracy rants. I believe this time it was worse. He might really have found out, and I genuinely feel sorry for it, kid. He put his hand on my shoulder. And to prevent this from happening again, Gonzalez continued, now passing a folded paper to me. 
These are the new rules of the job. Consider it a contract. Follow them to the letter, and you can continue working here. Don't think it's a normal job. It's a pact we make to keep things under control. Accept this, and you'll be safe. I stared at the folded paper. Take as much time as you need to read it, and if you agree, just sign it and come to the store tomorrow. With a lump in my throat, I accepted the paper and unfolded it. The rules were written in an old typewriter font. They seemed like a mix of superstitions and strange instructions. The content of the paper was as follows. Contract to the Gonzales Convenience Store Rules Welcome officially to the Knight family. Firstly, we congratulate you on your courage in accepting this peculiar job. Here, you are not just serving customers, but dealing with forces beyond human understanding. Please read the rules below carefully as they are essential for your safety, and maintaining harmony in this establishment. 1. Greetings. By accepting this contract, you agree to keep sensitive store data confidential, namely, address, inventory reports, cash in slash out, names and social media of the establishment or employees without express authorization. Disclosing information will compromise not only your safety, but the safety of everyone around you. As for strange events, nothing will prevent you from sharing, but be aware that it may attract unwanted attention. 2. Nature of the store. Understand that the store is linked to a supernatural presence. It has existed for decades and the exact nature of this entity is unknown. We ignore its existence, and in turn, it leaves us in peace. Don't try to understand it. Just accept it. 3. Lighting Always keep the lights on. Avoid dark areas as much as possible, as the creature seems to be drawn to darkness. Light is your ally. 4. Closed compartments when entering any rooms, such as bathrooms or storage rooms, do not close the door. The creature seems to have a control that we don't understand when you are in a closed room. Keeping doors open reduces risks. 5. Never-ending night. Remember the night in this store does not follow the common pattern. Time may seem stretched or reduced, and the line between reality and the supernatural may become blurred. Stay calm and continue with your tasks. 6. The Offering Upon arriving at the store, start your work as usual, but remember that at exactly 11.59pm, place a plate of raw meat in the office and lock it from the outside. Usually we ask the afternoon employee to prepare the meat and leave it aside, but if they are off or forgot, you can use one of the available meats in the store. It won't be deducted from your salary. 7. The Meat Corridor Pay special attention to the lights in the refrigerated corridor where we store meats and cold cuts. If the lights there go out, try to quickly illuminate the corridor for the next two minutes. This usually happens when you don't follow the previous rule. If you can't illuminate it, see Rule 9. 8. Night Customers Serve night customers as usual but avoid prolonged contact or excessive questions. Some of them may feel uncomfortable or not be what they seem. 9. The weapon and emergency button. Have the weapon under the counter and the emergency button always at hand. Use them wisely. They are your last resorts. 10. Special coffee. Always keep a fresh coffee available on the checkout counter. Some night customers have a preference for drinking something fresh at night, and if it's not coffee, they gladly accept to drink your blood. 11. Ignorance of customers. If any customers report a strange event, an appearance, or any of the elements mentioned here, just tell them it's nothing. Deny seeing anything, even if you did see something. Their ignorance protects them from the entity. 12. Your ignorance. Likewise, if you hear whispers, something tapping on your shoulder, 
footsteps behind you, or any of these lures, ignore them. If the creature knows that you know it's there, it won't have a reason to hide anymore and will become stronger. 13. Breaking the contract. Any attempt to break or disrespect this contract will result in unknown consequences. The responsibility falls on the signatory. By signing this document, you agree to strictly follow these rules. Remember you are now bound to something beyond human understanding. Good luck, and may your stay at the convenience store be long and safe. Employee signature. I stared at the paper for a while, trying to understand. I think it must have been about half an hour or so until I decided to sign it. The extra pay for this would cover my college expenses and, well, if others have been in the store for so long, I believe the rules are themselves effective. Very well, kid. You can start tomorrow. All good for you? Uh, sure. No problem. Either way, I couldn't sleep that night. Reversed circadian rhythm, coupled with anxiety and fear. I didn't have problems, at least not at home. At dawn, I went out to buy coffee and found a circle of small dead animals in the garden. That thing knew I was aware of it, and it wouldn't make things easy. I called Mr. Gonzalez, and he said that it's normal for such things to happen in the first week. The creature is testing you, seeing if you have the guts to stay in the store. I just wanted to finish telling you about some strange things. I'm now on the work shift, and indeed, the boss wasn't joking when he said they test you. First, I went to check a f toilet flush. A customer who had just left complained that it was stuck. I barely remembered to leave the door ajar, securing it with a nearby bucket. The flush was just too tight, and I loosened it a bit. Nothing major. However, as I was washing my hands, I saw the door sliding slightly. Starting to pick up speed, I ran over and held it. It wasn't as if the wind had pushed it. There was indeed some intentional force applied. I held it tighter and finally exited the bathroom, looking behind the door. Nothing. Nothing until I felt a poke on my shoulder. There was no one behind me before, and I should just ignore it. I struggled to contain myself as I felt the breath of whatever it was making a condensed sweat on my neck. I walked slowly to the counter and continued to act normally. That's when a shadow began to enter my peripheral vision. A dark mass moving slowly in front of me. The creature from the other night, with its oily hair in front of its face, came up to me, staring a few inches away. I grabbed one of the magazines and pretended to read Frozen with Fear. This thing doesn't stop haunting me, whether in front of me or whispering in my ear how delicious Ryan was, disappearing when a customer appears and returning as soon as they leave. I'm taking advantage of the moments when it's out of sight to continue writing here. The problem is that it's becoming more brazen, and it started licking my face about five minutes ago. A customer is deciding which flavor of energy drink to take, so I'm taking the opportunity to finish writing and post this. I don't think I'm in trouble, but I'll be making updates between customers until next time. Updates. Crap. I forgot to put the meat dish in the office. I'm going to call Mr. Gonzalez right away. Update 2. Okay, I think everything is fine now. I got yelled at, but I'm still in one piece. I'll bring more updates later. Part 3. Hello again. Jake here. First of all, thank you to everyone who has followed my story so far and expressed concern. Last night was tense and I need to share the latest events. After the incident with the meat dish, I quickly pressed the button under the counter, summoning Mr. Gonzalez, expecting the worst. It felt like an eternity until he finally called me, making me jump back in fear at the ringing of the phone. His voice on the other end sounded calm, but I could sense the tension. You forgot the dish, didn't you, boy? He said straight to the point. 
Yeah, Mr. Gonzalez. I... I don't know how it happened. I only noticed when things became more... insistent. My voice betrayed my anxiety. Hmm. Happens to the best of us, Jake. The creatures like to test, see how far you can follow the rules. However, you need to be more careful. A breach in the contract can have unexpected consequences, and failures like this will not be tolerated. And I don't mean tolerated by me, if you catch my drift. Put the dish there, maybe it'll be in a huff and won't accept it, so keep an eye on the meat aisle. He hung up before I could thank him or ask more questions. I returned to work, still tense, keeping a close watch on every move, making sure not to make any more mistakes. The night continued, customers came and went, and I kept the lights on, following the rules precisely. It seemed like the air around me was calmer, less aggressive. Even the creature that had licked my face had disappeared. Maybe it was satisfied with my discomfort and decided to retreat. I just hoped everything would go back to normal. Until around 3 a.m. The lights started flickering frantically, and a whispering voice echoed throughout the store. Indistinct words that I didn't even know in what language they were. Shelves shook. The objects were thrown off their shelves. A sinister presence hung in the air, making me cower on the floor. Terrified, I looked around, searching for something, and I realized a darkness spreading in the meat aisle. It was as if something prevented the light itself from entering there. I swallowed hard and quickly grabbed my flashlight. My hands started shaking as, shining the light into the darkness, I saw those dreadful eyes staring at me along with the mouth where a piece of chicken lay. I kept the light strong on the aisle, barely holding on to the flashlight, and slowly, the presence dissipated. I couldn't see the creature anymore when the front door opened, and I jumped, pointing the flashlight right at the face of the entering customer. Oh, sorry sir, I said, turning off the light. He seemed unfazed. That's when I noticed him. A distinctly peculiar man. He wore a pulled down hat and sunglasses, even at night. Had long, graying hair, and a stubbled beard. His furtive manner raised my suspicions, and I felt a shiver down my spine. He approached the counter, but something about him made me uneasy. His movements were calculated, and his eyes seemed to penetrate my soul. What do you want? I asked, keeping my voice steady. He smiled, a smile that didn't reach his eyes, remaining cold and expressionless. I'm looking for something special, he murmured, looking around the store. As he examined the aisles, I noticed his shadow moving. It didn't seem to belong to him, but rather followed him silently, with slightly different, slightly delayed movements. A wave of discomfort ran through my body. The customer finally approached the counter with a vacant look. Do you believe in secrets, Jake? He whispered, looking both ways. How do you know my... I began, now more uncomfortable than ever. Secrets hidden from you? Things that happen when you're looking the other way? I still don't quite understand what you're getting at. He put his hand in his coat and pulled out a black and white photo. To give you context, during the slavery period, there were a series of revolts known as the Texas Troubles where slaves and abolitionists were pursued and later hanged. The photo in question depicted one of these situations. Two bodies were tied to a tree hanging by their necks, and below next to them, a man with a thick mustache posed with his rifle, as if boasting about a successful hunt. The thing is, a few seconds later I realized something. The man in question with the rifle was our sheriff, Butch Cornwell. But how? These events are from 1860. 
Think about it, kid. It seems like someone wants to hide something from you. Those words shook me. I always trusted the sheriff, believing he was keeping things under control, but now, in front of this stranger, I began to question if I really knew the man with the golden star. The mysterious customer left the store, leaving me perplexed and full of unanswered questions. The shadow continued to dance around him as if responding to his call. I decided that I needed to uncover the truth about the sheriff and what is really happening not only in the store, but in the whole town. There are more secrets hidden in the shadows than I could ever imagine. Well, the weekend is approaching, and some regional holiday festivities are coming up. I hope to keep an eye on Butch, and at least understand what's going on around here. It has crossed my mind that maybe it's a trick from the entity to break the trust between us. But I'm still not sure. That customer was eerie, but in a different way from the store. I'll keep you updated and welcome any tips on espionage you can give me. Part 4. Let me clarify a few things to start the conversation. Yes, I've been living here since I was born, and as far back as I can remember, so has Sheriff Butch. Asking my mom, she mentioned that Butch comes from a long line of law enforcement officers, starting with his great-grandfather. The Cornwell Patriarch, who already wore the badge back in his time, and apparently, they're stubborn about it. As both Butch's great-grandfather and grandfather died tragically in service, in a barn fire during an operation and in a car accident respectively. His father had dementia and was declared missing, although given the time that has passed, he's been dead for years. That said, our little town is getting ready for a party that promises to shake things up around here. The main street is adorned with colorful lights, and local merchants are setting up stalls for the celebration. It's a typical festival called Robustelio, in anticipation of year-end and Thanksgiving festivities. We usually gather on the street and share food, drinks, and games. Mr. Gonzalez is an enthusiast for the celebration, and, of course, being a good employee, I was tasked with getting some items from the store for the party. I was off that day, and I have to confess it's pretty weird to go out there without being on duty. Upon entering, I found the other employee, Dave, behind the counter. Dave is a middle-aged guy with graying hair and an expression that oscillates between exhaustion and cynicism. Hey Dave, preparations for the party? Uh, yeah, for Habistelio. Tell me, what do you need? Some drinks, some snacks. The town is going to be lively tonight. I'm sorry I can't cover this night. It must be tough to be here alone. I'll bring you a drink after your shift, I promise. Uh, it's okay. I enjoy being here when there's no one. It's therapeutic. Dave started sorting the goods and the conversation inevitably turned to the store and its... idiosyncrasies. Dave was the new employee who replaced Ryan. Hey Dave. I commented, simulating a casual and ordinary conversation. Have you noticed anything strange in the convenience store? Dave. Ah, uh, the old Gonzales convenience store. Sure, I've heard of some bizarre things happening, but every place has its secrets, right? Legends circulate through the streets, but so far, nothing has happened. Except for the animals rummaging through the trash bins. Me. Well, can you check one more thing for me, please? I think I need that beer brand Gonzales likes. It's in the back of the store. Dave. Uh, sure, man. Be right back. I took advantage of Dave's departure to grab a thick slice of meat and put it on the office plate. I know, I didn't receive instructions for that, but I didn't want to risk encountering a canned Dave in the morning. 
A few hours later, the party was in full swing. The street was filled with laughter, lively music, and the tempting smell of street food. Kids ran around and stalls offered prizes. The smell of cotton candy filled my nostrils as I salivated. I decided to take a walk to see if I could find someone I knew. In the midst of the crowd, I spotted Sheriff Butch Cornwell and Mr. Gonzalez, both standing near a beer stand. I approached unconsciously remembering what the stranger had told me a few nights before. Hey, Sheriff. Mr. Gonzalez? Gonzalez. Jake, my boy. How's it going at the store? I'm surviving, Mr. Gonzalez. The night seems to be lively. Are you sure it's a good idea to leave Dave alone at the store? Gonzalez. I trust him. And especially in ignorance. He laughed. The guy has no idea what's going on there. And for now, let's keep it that way. You've kept the store entertained, though. Let it get used to the smell of the guy. I didn't know what it was, but there was something strange in the way Gonzalez spoke. Something intimidating. A grotesque mockery. I don't know, maybe it was the beer. Speaking of which, the sheriff turned his can upside down, letting a single drop fall. Butch. Damn. Just when I was starting to have fun. He scratched his head for a moment. Jake, come with me. I need someone strong and more sober than me to help me get the beer stock. Can you give me a hand? I have more at home. The idea of going to the sheriff's house made me a little nervous, but I didn't want to refuse. We crossed some streets while the sound of music and laughter faded, muffled as if the world had its volume muted. We arrived at the sheriff's old colonial house, a property with a classic style but in perfect condition. Large pointed spears rose at the gates while the moon reflected its light through crystal clear windows. He stopped and searched for the keys, struggling for a few seconds until he found and unlocked the door. The house had a strong smell. It wasn't a stench, but something more... chemical. It resembled the smell of a hospital or maybe a solvent factory. Butch. There's a freezer in the basement. Can you grab a few packs in there? I have to deal with something upstairs. He started climbing the stairs. Well, I know you might be thinking it was foolish to go down to his basement despite my suspicions, but he was still the sheriff I'd always known. And besides, numerous people had seen me leave with him. And if he really wanted to do something to me, he would have already. I descended the creaky and worn stairs. The basement was totally dark, but the chemical smell seemed weaker. I felt the wall until I touched the switch and turned on the light with a small click. It was as he said, a mini fridge full of beers. I had taken two packs and was preparing to go up when, turning, I saw something that caught my attention, under the stairs, a large covered pile. I approached trying to understand what those outlines were. Sharp angles, straight, they even looked like cans. I looked up the stairs to see if there was any sign of Butch, apparently not yet. Slowly I pulled the part of the tarp and looked at what was there, a heap of cans of leaching powder. I think that's where the chemical smell comes from. I swear I almost overlooked it, almost covered it back up and went up, but it seems my subconscious already knew what was going on. Behind the cans I saw a small part of the peeled and open wall, like a secret door. I pulled it carefully and what I saw completely killed my appetite and the mood for the party. There were separate piles of clothes everywhere. Tufts of hair and gnawed bones. It looked like some kind of clandestine cemetery. In the middle of all this, there was a wooden post. Seemed to support the upper part of the house, but in the middle of it, two handcuffs with iron chains hung. And leaning against the trunk, a sepia photograph of a slave. A gray-haired black man looking directly at me. 
His gaze seemed to pierce my flesh and pierce my soul, feeding on it. It was agonizing. Uncomfortable seeing the mix of fear, hatred, and suffering on his face left me breathless. My back started to burn and throb. I almost passed out with the sensation. I just wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. I closed the door and covered the pile, grabbed the packs, and started running towards the stairs when, turning the corner to go up, I came face to face with Sheriff Butch, two steps away from me, standing. Butch, I almost thought you were dead, he laughed. I couldn't open the fridge. I think the seal got pressurized. Butch. Ah, yeah. That kind of thing is always happening. Well, let's go back before they miss us. He ran his hand through his graying hair, fixing his hairstyle. I followed him, still thinking about what I had seen. We arrived at the party, and I really tried to forget, but I couldn't. At least I hope I disguised it enough. I went home to sleep while Gonzales and the sheriff were still drinking on the sidewalk. When I went for my pajamas, I felt the fabric brushing against my back, causing a pain that wasn't there earlier. I ran to the bathroom and contorted to observe them in the mirror. My back was marked with rods, deep cuts that bled, as if I had been beaten and whipped all night. I slept in pain and turned on my stomach pleading with any supernatural entity that it would pass soon. The next day I woke up with my boss at the door, ringing my bell insistently. Good morning, Gonzales. Any problem? I said between blinks and a yawn. Good morning, Jake. Can I come in? Feel free, I said, making way. He walked to the living room and sat on the couch, gesturing for me to sit too. I need to talk to you about the store. His expression became more solemn. Sure, I'm going for the night shift today, right? Relax, you know I don't mind going despite the night out. I'm not even hungover. Jake? It's Dave. He's dead. I trembled a bit. But how? I had talked to him yesterday. I'd even left the plate in the office and locked it. Something wasn't right. Gonzales promised me explanations today before my shift. I'm finishing updating you so I can go to work. I don't know what's going on, but I intend to put an end to it soon. Update. The bruises on my back are gone. Like they were never there. No scars or anything. Part 5 Hi everyone, Jake here. I know I've been gone for a while, but I'll try to catch you up on the past week. Things around here are totally crazy. Not just the workload, but also some weird stuff. Before I dive in, I want to thank everyone who has been following this story and providing tips and messages of support. It means a lot to me. As I mentioned before, Gonzales came to my house to tell me about Dave's death. I was shocked and incredulous because I had seen him just a short time before at the store. Gonzales explained that when he arrived to open the store, he found the door ajar, lights flickering and an unusual silence. Upon entering, he encountered the shocking scene. Dave was on the floor. Pale, eyes open in a vacant stare, with strange marks around him. At least this time it wasn't a can. The police found no clues and declared it as sudden death. Seeing Dave's mother crying at the funeral broke my heart. I offered my condolences and hugged her tightly. She's an elderly lady who didn't deserve to go through this. I wonder what would have happened if I had swapped places with Dave that shift. Or maybe, upon reflection, if I hadn't put the meat there. Yeah, it made sense. Maybe my offering at the office had invited the creature, and Dave, unaware of the special rules, violated something. This thought started to gnaw at me bit by bit. The guilt was unbearable, and I had to talk to Gonzales about it. 
I decided to go to work early to have time to discuss it. I put on my uniform and started my walk to clear my head. As I approached, I could see Sheriff talking to the chief inside the store. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a busybody. But after everything, I decided to sneak up, crouching and approaching the window slowly. I caught the conversation halfway through. Gonzalez. It wasn't supposed to be Dave, Butch. The store is acting on its own. Butch. Look, the store got what it wanted, right? Just because it changed the order of things doesn't mean we need to panic. Gonzalez. It's the first time this has happened. It must really like Jake. Butch. We'll see about that. I accidentally stumbled on an empty beer bottle on the ground, making noise. They both stopped. The sheriff turned and began walking slowly towards me. I started moving towards the back of the store, but he was almost at a point where he could see me. I was just a few inches away and I could already see the brim of his hat and his eyebrows when one of the lights inside the store burst, making him turn, and Gonzalez jumped. Butch. <laughs> this thing is playing with us. It knows we're talking about it. You know, Beth, I always admired that stubbornness in you. That indomitable spirit made everything more fun. He tapped the wall twice. I backed away and arrived ten minutes later, casual. I greeted both of them and said I needed to talk to Gonzalez alone. Gonzalez. You can speak up, young man. I have nothing to hide from old Butch. Me. Well, it's about Dave. I put meat in the office that night. Thought I was protecting him. Butch approached me, chewing tobacco, and got so close I could smell the smoky scent coming from his mouth. Butch. Look, Jake, it's not your fault. The store is sometimes mysterious. Don't worry about it. He put his hand on my shoulder. Butch, you've got potential. Maybe when old Gonzalez retires, you could even take his place. Me. No, no, you're exaggerating, sir. Gonzalez. Can't deny it, kid. The store likes you. And I've been thinking about retiring for a while now. Butch's radio beeped. Butch. Gentlemen, duty calls. He left, and after a few minutes of conversation, Gonzalez did the same. The night went on without many problems, and truth be told, no special rules needed to be followed. No lights, no strangers, nothing. It was around midnight when I heard a low, sinister laugh echoing through the store. I turned around, and there, in the dark aisle, was a familiar figure. The strange one with the hat. My legs hesitated before taking a step back. The figure advanced slowly, revealing glowing eyes. His hair looked even more unkempt, and he ran his hand over his stubble. His shadow danced with joy, moving from one shelf to another, now completely independent of his body. Stranger. Beth knows you heard about her. Me. Uh, who? Stranger. Don't play dumb. It's ugly to do that after the mess she saved you from earlier. Butch doesn't like snoops. He reached into his coat and pulled out a USB drive violently, making me think he was armed, and I recoiled in fear. Before I could react, he disappeared as if he had never been there. The light stopped flickering, and the store returned to its usual silence. Nothing else happened that night. I was counting the minutes to go home and see what was on the device. I almost flew out the door when Gonzalez arrived. He was covering the morning shift while the issue with Dave was still being resolved. Back home, I inserted the device and found some strange, minimal things. I couldn't copy or extract them. They seemed to have some encoding, so I'll just describe them. Some old photos of someone I now assume is Butch, him with slaves, next to hanged people in the Civil War, with hooded figures wearing pointed hats. And the most disturbing of all, 
He was standing, smiling sadistically while holding the chain that restrained a young girl. She had a gag and deep marks all over her body. She looked at the camera with profound hatred, conveying her disgust with the situation. This was just one of the folders. In another, there was a compilation of newspaper articles since around the 1950s about young people dying in the store, even before Gonzales. The last names of the sheriffs involved in the investigation were obviously the same. Cornwell. It also included headlines of accidents that killed Butch's predecessors. Levi Cornwell, the grandfather, and Josiah Cornwell, the great-grandfather. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I started writing this post for about ten minutes until my heart almost had an attack. Through the window behind me, allowing sunlight in, there was a shadow. A human, male shadow, with a hat standing. I didn't know how long that person had been there, and by the hat, I could guess who it was. The shadow started moving. I saw it slowly going to the door, his silhouette passing. While walking, I saw him taking a rifle from his back, loading ammunition and putting it in. He stopped when he reached the door. Two knocks, hard and dry. Silence. Two more knocks. Suddenly my phone vibrates, a message from Butch. Hey Jake, you home? I need to talk to you. I found another batch of beers at home close to expiration, and I need to get rid of them, if you know what I mean. Update. He sent a new message. Well, unfortunately, I can't wait long. I'm going to go into your kitchen to leave some cans on your counter. Just letting you know so you don't get scared if you're at home. Part 6 Hi. I'm writing this in a hurry, so please forgive any mistakes. Anyway, I think you remember how things were in the last part. Butch remained at the door, a menacing figure under the brim of his hat, holding a rifle. The sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows across the room. A tense silence hung in the air as I, with a racing heart, tried to make sense of everything that was happening. Did it have any connection to today's conversation? Butch. Jake, are you going to open the door, or should I come in? I choked at the moment. The words were laden with intent, and a sense of desperation seized me. Quickly, I grabbed my notebook and headed upstairs, seeking refuge in the bedroom. With every step, the creaking sound of the floor echoed, alerting Butch to my escape. Butch. Jake, don't make this harder than it needs to be. Open the door. I ignored the plea and reached the room. Irregular breathing was the only sound in the room as I hid in the corner, contemplating what to do with the data. Perhaps I should release it in case something happens to me. The door creaked open slowly, interrupting my thoughts. I began to hear the sound of boots ascending the stairs as I locked the bedroom door. Butch. Jake, it doesn't have to be like this. Open the door and we'll talk. He called my name with apparent calmness, but beneath it, the tone of his voice carried a grim determination. Ignoring his words, I climbed onto the bed, trying not to be in the direct line of the door. He kicked once. Butch. You want to do this the hard way. Another kick, and the door gave way, almost falling against the wall. Desperation grew within me, and my gaze fixed on the window, the only escape route. Without thinking twice, I opened it and prepared to jump. Butch noticed my intention and took a few hurried steps in my direction. Butch, you're not getting away. The moment he raised the rifle, I jumped through the window, landing on the lawn below. The impact was harsh, but adrenaline blurred the pain, and my notebook cushioned the fall, I think, unfortunately. It broke in the process. As I got up, I heard shots echoing in the night, but the shadows helped me escape as I ran towards the forest, seeking refuge. 
The shots failed to find their target, and the pursuit was just beginning. I disappeared into the shadows of the forest, determined to uncover the truth behind Butch's threats and find a way to stop it all. The forest was too silent, its twisted branches and dancing shadows amplifying the atmosphere. I ran, breathing heavily, trying to get as far away as possible from the threat following my every step. In the distance, I began to hear the hoarse and steady rumble of a jeep approaching. It was Butch. I left the main road and threw myself into the midst of the trees, lying face down in the middle of the dense bushes. Shortly after, the car parked a few meters away from me. Butch got out. I couldn't see him, but I heard his steps getting closer. And... was he sniffling? Look, kid, I can see you, and you're in serious trouble. Come with me to the station to sort things out, and I promise to go easy on you. Otherwise, I won't have any choice but to... I heard the rifle being prepared for a shot. Come on, I'll count to three. I didn't know what to do. Run or surrender. One. Was he bluffing? Two. Well, if he wanted to... Three. He fired upwards. Some birds flew and small animals scurried away. He kicked the car's body and got in, accelerating. I made the right bet. If he had seen me, he would have shot without saying anything. I waited a few minutes before continuing. At this hour of the night, Moonlight fractured through the dense tree leaves, creating ethereal patterns on the ground covered with dry leaves. With every step, fear grew, fueled by the uncertainty of what awaited in the depths of the forest. My body felt a tension of strong emotions. My joints ached and my body was feverish, but an urgency propelled me forward. The night sounds of the forest became sharper as I approached the town's perimeter. Broken branches under my feet echoed like gunshots, a sinister soundtrack for my escape. On the horizon, the familiar silhouette of the store rose like a shadow, a beacon of salvation or, perhaps, my final destination. The moon cast its light on the store's parking lot, creating a surreal view of the place that, not long ago, seemed like just an ordinary market. The facade was quiet and dark, but the echo of my footsteps seemed to fill the void with palpable tension. The fear of being followed persisted. I looked in every possible direction as many times as I could. I approached the entrance hesitantly, as if the sheriff would jump from the heavens and kill me with his own hands. The door creaked as I pushed it, making the bell ring, revealing the silent and unexplored interior. You might think it was reckless to come to my workplace, but you see, since Dave's incident, we hadn't found a replacement. I knew the other employee who worked in the morning, a college student who couldn't wait to leave the store, whose boyfriend promptly picked her up. The store would either be empty or occupied by someone with no desire to work, and unaware of what was happening, I entered slowly and surveyed the empty interior. Most lights were off, creating dancing shadows, and the characteristic smell of dusty products filled the air. A shiver ran down my spine when I realized I wasn't alone. The figure I saw on my first night, the woman with hair over her face, emerged from the shadows, a slender and threatening figure. But this time, it was different. I felt no fear. She floated calmly, not projecting herself towards me. In fact, it was as if she waited for my arrival. That mysterious visitor came from one of the shelves talking. He had no shadow. Jake, you're finally here. I'm sorry for how things unfolded. Me. What's happening? Who are you? Why is Butch trying to kill me? Butch is just fulfilling an ancient agreement, settling the debt with the store. Do you have time to hear a story? His deeply wrinkled eyes carried a seriousness that conveyed a long and dark tale. Well, the well-known sheriff, Butch Cornwell, 
is actually older than any of you. He was an overseer on one of the slave farms in this region about two centuries ago. I suppose you suspected, right? He showed the photo he had given me when we first met. He wasn't just another overseer. He truly reveled in it, like hunting animals, he said. There were tumults during the abolition period, revolutionaries, reformists, rebellions, and repression. There was a young woman named Beth. She was a slave. She fell in love with a man who was born a slave, but bought his freedom. He raised his hands, bringing them together in front of his body, causing the sleeves of his coat to retreat and reveal shackle marks on his wrists. I was the young man. Kenway, at your service. He bowed with his hat. Kenway, but you see, I fell in love with Beth. I wanted to marry her. We spoke with Reverend Bates. He was an abolitionist who had agreed to perform our marriage, which, by right, would make her no longer belong to her former owner. She would be married to a free man, and therefore free. But that's when conflicts erupted. Butch was never sympathetic to it, and when he found out, he incriminated us, claimed we were planning to release all the slaves and take over the town. With that, taken to a mob trial, we were condemned. The Reverend was hanged shortly after. We weren't as fortunate. He did, well, horrible things to Beth. I think I don't need to mention what they were. He tied me up and made me watch while he was there. Again and again. He gagged her after she bit him. But that didn't stop him. He used everything to hurt her. Whips. Hot iron. Even some shots. The store lights began to flicker. Kenway. Sorry. Beth. But he needs to know. He looked at the woman with long hair. Her gaze was teary. Kenway. Finally, when he got tired, he tied her to a log, cut out her tongue, and left her there to die. As for me, I was a citizen with rights. I couldn't be treated that way, so he put me at her feet and shot me, forbidding my body to be buried until Beth died too. He wanted her to see me rot. Uh, I don't even know what to say. Don't say anything. Hatred, pain, all together, made Beth's spirit wander. As you can see, she can't speak, so I ended up being her spokesperson. We went after Cornwell. At the time, he wasn't called Butch. He was Josiah. He evaded us for a while, until we thought he had died in an accident. But no, it turns out the curse caught up with him too. He doesn't die until Beth kills him, but after so many escapes, he found a way to continue his life. The store. The store? What do you mean? Well, the store was built on the site of our death. We need to stay nearby, or we could lose strength and even fade away. So he proposed the following deal. He would bring people here, like store workers, and Beth could feed on them to quench her thirst. He would cover up the deaths. I'm sorry for this, but when Beth goes into her frenzy for blood, she becomes much more aggressive. I can't even manifest myself here because of how strong her presence is. That night, it should have been you, but for some reason, Beth liked you. She saw potential in you to help us end Cornwell. She doesn't want to do this anymore. He looked at her and held her hands. We don't want this anymore. But why didn't you just end Butch? Just feed on him? We would have done that a long time ago, but he's cautious. He avoids the store at night, where we are stronger, and anyway, he walks around with a protection amulet. Amulet? Yeah, it's bizarre, but he always carries a bone from each of us tied to his body. He found out about it, and managed it over a century ago. Since then, we can't even get close to him anymore. That's why we guided you. 
so that he could follow you here. Follow me. Tire sounds echoed from the parking lot as the jeep parked carelessly. Cornwell got out with red eyes and his rifle in hand. Walking with strong steps, I could hear him shout. Get out of there, you coward. Don't make me drag you out. At least act like a man in your death. I looked at Kenway. Kenway. Continue here. Remove the bones hanging from him. One is on the leg, the other on the neck. Two small and worn flanges. We can help you survive, but if he comes in here, our presences won't be visible anymore. Can you do that? I honestly don't know. Part 7. The final part. I know I left you all hanging, but I finally had time to wrap up my story. As you read through it, you'll understand why. Thanks for sticking around. Have a great end of the year and a happy holidays to all of you. May God help us. Well, the room was tense, filled with silence only broken by the distant rumble of Butch's jeep. I looked at Kenway, a mix of confusion and determination in his eyes. He nodded, conveying a confidence I wasn't sure he possessed. Kenway. You can do this, Jake. Remember, he's vulnerable now without the amulet. You can use some weapon or whatever to stun him. He may not die, but he can still feel pain very well. Butch, outside, continued yelling as he approached the door, anger overflowing in his words. I decided to act quickly, rushing to lock the entrance and buy some time. After doing that, I went to the counter and fumbled blindly underneath to grab the weapon as quickly as possible. I couldn't find it, and Butch kept advancing, now more slowly. I crouched to look, and the old smoke-stained barrel wasn't there. I heard a mechanical click behind me. It seems I had found the weapon, and it was cocked and aimed at me. Mr. Gonzalez. Jake, my boy. You've got yourself into trouble, huh? He smiled, but it was an empty smile, betrayed by hidden malice. Butch approached, eyes fixed on me, and Gonzalez blocked my escape route. Me. What's going on here? Mr. Gonzalez, are you betraying me too? Mr. Gonzalez. Betrayal? Not exactly. I'm just doing what's best for me. Still with the gun pointed at me, he walked backward to the door and unlocked it, letting the sheriff in. Butch. Looks like your boss here made the right choice. Now, Jake. It's time to pay for your misdeeds. He aimed his rifle. Butch. Come on, bring it. I hate shooting people like you. Need a good excuse that you attacked first. I stood still, looking at him. There was nothing that could be done. Butch. Okay, you've exhausted me. Say goodnight, Jake. Goodnight, Jake. A ghostly voice echoed. And with that, all the lights in the store went out. Except, I think, for the soda machine. Butch. What the hell, Gonzalez? Quickly, find the circuit breaker. I felt like a guiding hand, an intuitive force showing me where and how Butch was. I lunged at him, turning his gun away, just seconds before Gonzalez lit the light. We were then in this body-to-body -body game to try to take the gun from each other, when a sharp crack whizzed by my ear, making me deaf for a while. Gonzalez almost shot me. Mr. Gonzalez. Don't make things harder. Be a good collaborator, Jake, as you always were. Butch tried to push me into the line of fire. I was lost. That's when, over his shoulder, I saw the office open. Under his desk, an empty meat plate. Would I die? Maybe, but it was a necessary risk. I grabbed the gun more tightly and pushed Butch with my shoulder. He grabbed my shirt and pulled me along the gun flying from my hands and landing at the feet of my now ex-boss. 
I quickly locked the door when we entered. It was time for the nightly snack. And if I had to send this damn racist to the devil, God, I would be part of the feast with pleasure. The sheriff clung to the bones like talismans, and now that I could see them clearly, it was a few seconds of silence and tension, but nothing. Suddenly outside, a noise started. It was Gonzales. It started with shouts that seemed like fear, then panic, and finally, pain and suffering. He begged to die two or three times before falling silent again. Wet noises of things breaking and swallowing filled the air. Butch and I didn't even react for that moment until, suddenly, I jumped on one of the bones on tying its knot skillfully. Butch, you damn traitor, what's happening here? He said, regaining his senses and advancing towards me. I put my full weight on the ground and pushed him up, giving a kick with all I had. He flew backward, hitting his back on a filing cabinet and falling. I ran to the door and opened it, ready to see a sea of blood. However, nothing. Just one of the guns, a standard deputy's rifle. I quickly ran to the gun while already hearing Butch approaching. I threw myself on the ground to grab it, and when I turned, he was almost on top of me. I saw his expression change when he saw the gun, and realized I was about to shoot. I pulled the trigger, and I watched as the quick fragments opened spots leaking red all over his shirt. He fell, and without wasting time, I stood up and gave two more shots, one of them in his face. I checked for a moment his vital signs. He was dead, but I knew not for long. I looked at the amulet in his hand. It was loose, almost hanging. I ran my fingers over it. Instantly, like a contraction, his fingers closed and his hand became a fist hitting my face. I fell backward, seeing stars as he took the rifle from my hand. I walked back helplessly as he pointed the barrel at me, about to shoot. The empty click echoed one, two, three times. There were no more bullets. Butch. No problem. He took the gun as if it were a bat and hit my stomach. I fell, unable to breathe. Butch, it's going to be more fun. I grabbed a can from the bottom shelf and hit his face. Now decayed, but quickly taking its original form again. He howled as I struck the rough-edged metal on his nose, still without skin. I gave another blow, breaking the thin aluminum can. He, however held my hands. He squeezed my fist into a closed shape, causing one of the fragments of the can to pierce my palm with more and more force. I lost strength doing that, and he handcuffed me. Butch. We always got along, didn't we? He spoke while rubbing his nose, now almost complete. Butch. You just had to play your part. But you had to meddle where you weren't called, huh? He hung his macabre pendant around his neck while I tried to deal with the pain and move away as much as possible. He noticed and calmly, with the same sadistic smile from his past photographs, he took a hunting knife from his belt. Butch, you're going to bleed, kid, like a pig. I had walked to the wall. He was a few steps away. There was no way out. I was helpless, hands tied, but then it came to me, the idea that could end it all. I projected myself toward him, raising my arms. I think he didn't expect that because he didn't defend himself. I drove the fragment that was in my hand into his neck, passing through the cord of the amulet. At the same time, I felt a sharp pain on the side of my body. We both hit each other. Butch. You got me. For real. He spun the knife. But if I go down, you're coming with me. Blood started to trickle from his mouth and he recoiled. Kenway appeared along with Beth. She stepped on the small bone, crushing it. Kenway. Judgment time has come. Time to reap what your actions have sown. 
Not just for what you've done to us, but for all those who died in your place. For this entire town. Butch, get on with it already. You're going to give a little speech now? Beth lunged at him, tearing a chunk from his shoulder with a bite. He screamed piece by piece. Inch of flesh by inch of flesh, she devoured him. He remained conscious the whole time, even though biologically it shouldn't be possible. I turned away not to look when there was only half of his body. I felt a hand on my shoulder. Kenway. You can look now, Jake. Again, we apologize for everything. I guess we caused trouble too, but at least it's over. Don't worry about anything. We'll figure out a way to clear your name. I felt a pulsation in my abdomen. The cut was bleeding thick blood. I fell to my knees. Kenway. We called the police and an ambulance. Thanks again. My vision blurred a bit as I fell face first onto the cold floor. I saw the couple walking out. They walked hand in hand. After a few steps they stopped, turned to me. Kenway tipped his hat in a greeting and Beth, in the same manner, lifted the corners of her dress in a brief curtsy. And with that, I blacked out. I woke up hours later in a hospital. The staff asked some questions and days later the police came. Apparently someone had made an anonymous tip by phone, saying they saw the sheriff trying to shoot me and stabbing me. He is now a fugitive and Gonzales is considered his accomplice. Legally, there were no heirs, so until further notice, I'm in charge of the store now. I started walking freely two days ago, made some changes to the store, cleaned the place, rearranged the stock, and now you could say there are no more special rules for the night shift. There haven't been any more strange incidents, or rather, just one. Yesterday I was in the store during the night shift when I decided to close. It was around 1am. I walked through the cold parking lot when something hit my foot. It was a can. I looked up and I saw a figure in a hoodie looking at me. He started approaching and by the moonlight I saw his face. Me. Didn't expect to see you here. Everything okay? Ryan. I've been talking to Dave and, well, it seems like you need some employees. What do you think? I smiled. Mind working the night shift? If you ask a scientist such as myself to define instinct, I will simply tell you that your body is made up of various neurons, most of which are crumpled around three main parts of the human system. In first place is the brain, having an outstanding number of approximately 86 billion neurons working together in relentless harmony that I wish I could see in all of mankind, while the second, the spinal cord stays in millions, way down to the tail and equally as corresponding. These cells, of course, carry on multiple purposes, but the gist of it is that the more they are grouped like tangled web after tangled web, the greater they are at processing information. But the third one, the stomach, otherwise known as the second brain for its half a billion tally, is something more complex, more primitive in nature. While both the brain and the spine's reactions develop from situations your physical body can attest to and can prevent to any given obstacle like how you immediately balance yourself after a misstep at the bottom of the stairs, gut instincts don't need your eyes or really any of your six senses to alert you of what danger is creeping from an unknown distance. It's simply knows. 
That, in turn, sends you into a state of panic, a result of your mind trying to find and fix the problem it cannot comprehend. And the longer you try to pry for a solution, the more adrenaline is produced. But it's only a matter of minutes until your brain is released from the paranoid grasps of the guts and gets you back to Earth. Logic comes back into action, and after turning multiple times in a circle, you'll see that nothing's there and laugh it off. Undoubtedly, it's not enough, so you look around for one last time just to be sure, and the mind finally relaxes, pushing down the still uncomfortable gnawing in the pits of your stomach which remains for as long as it likes, because of whatever reason I couldn't figure out until last night. Still, I was convinced that everything that's been happening in the last few weeks was a result of my formal leave from the lab. It had to be. I'd been getting these weird sensations in my stomach after day four of my leave and I was impassively chalking it up to a stomach bug due to its severity. One that I acquired because my body was used to working and thinking to the brink of exhaustion for most of the time that I'm awake. It was only later in the day while buying medicine that I realized how my symptoms weren't lining up with the predicament that I had that heart-stopping coldness run up my spine. I hadn't felt it in so long it caught me off guard, and so strong that I clumsily dropped the tightly capped Pepto-Bismol I was checking out on the floor. The clacking sound of plastic against alabaster-colored tiles didn't help with the feeling of dread making its way through the concaves of my brain. In fact, the sound seemed to slowly reverberate off of every surface of the pharmacy. Relenting to the fear, I turned around and saw a bald-headed, tattooed mountain of a man in a spiked leather jacket glaring at me on the other side of the aisle he was towering over. But as soon as he saw me turn to face him, his expression changed to that of concern as he asked me if I was okay. He didn't seem to want to cause me any trouble after all, and I nodded shakily, feeling myself calm down enough to breathe, although looking back at the bottle I had picked up, I noticed my hands were cold, clammy, and trembling. The sensation was weird, almost different. I know I'd been privy to the ins and outs of this kind of instinct, but I remembered what they felt like, and they weren't supposed to be that strong, were they? That was the first day. The next time I felt it, I was sitting at the local coffee shop discussing next month's project with my coworkers when all of a sudden I felt something tight constricting my lower body similar to the unyielding grasp of a determined python. I flinched, coughing up my drink, causing my lab partner Higgins to ask the same question as the man I saw two days prior. And then came the tickle up my spine as I vehemently moved my head around, looking for any suspicious behavior on everyone I could land my gaze on, but there was, once again, no sign of misconduct. Not one person inside or outside of the building was even bothering to spare me a moment's glance, too busy in their own little bubble to notice the almost frantic girl in the corner. I sighed and shook my head. Third time it appeared. I started to get uneasy. It was during a short trip to the grocery store and without warning, the freezing hands of my gut went up to pluck my heart down as soon as I got the feeling of eyes drilling ever so extremely in the back of my head. Three tries. Three tries was all it took for my mind to succumb and flee. I wasted no time and jumped into my car and drove off to home, to safety. I paused, stopping the car abruptly. Safety from what, exactly? I am a woman of science, dammit. Seeing is believing. I gritted my teeth as a mixture of emotions flooded through me. I let my gut instincts drive instead of my head. It wasn't good. It felt like I was betraying myself. 
all of the control and mental challenges only to be erased by feelings prompted by something I couldn't see nor prove to even exist beyond my anxiousness. Enough was enough. It was at that time, five days ago, that I ran through different probabilities as quickly as I could and came to the conclusion that I was being stalked, being toyed with. And I was right. But not in the way I would have listed. Not in a way I even thought possible. I was being stalked, yes. Not by someone, but by something. I am not one to believe in the supernatural, as you might have already guessed. But last night, I felt it again along with something else. Two days ago, I had equipped myself with a gun because it wasn't just eyes that I felt on me anymore and no longer when I was in public spaces. Instead, I knew it was there with me, always beside me in the car, in the store, in my room. I could feel it standing at the foot of my bed every time I reached for the lamp, but by all that is mighty, I couldn't bring myself to turn it off. I still told myself that whoever was stalking me had successfully broken into my house and was waiting for me somewhere in the room in the closet, or under the bed just waiting for a chance to pounce. The fear was unbearable by then, stronger than any kind of emotion I'd ever felt before or since. So when morning came yesterday, I had called the cops. Typically they weren't convinced that the threat was real and told me to call them when I had real evidence or even a name. By night, I had sobbed to Higgins about my misfortune, although only because my gut was driving me crazy with the need for company, and the relief of having someone believe me. Or maybe he didn't and just wanted to be a pillar in my time of need. It was my first breath of fresh air since this nightmare had all started. He stayed the night, offering me words of comfort and agreed to stay up with me to watch whatever movie I wanted. It took some time to get my mind off of everything and focus on the film, but as fast as the terror went, it came back when I felt three slow, hard, deliberate pokes on the ball of my right shoulder, followed by the call of my name from between me and Higgins. Hello. Hello. A sharp, raspy whisper seemed to silence everything around me. And by the looks of it, Higgins wasn't far behind. My blood ran cold, and he turned pale as we quickly turned in unison. Me having raised my revolver towards who or what it was that had startled us enough to warrant a piss in the pants. Nothing. My arms sagged and my knees buckled. Higgins took the liberty to drag me out of the house in a panicked haste, all well feeding me questions I wasn't really answering because for once in almost three weeks, my body felt light without the burden of my stomach telling me something was wrong. I was able to think again. And that's why I'm writing this now. I know a lot of people dedicate their lives to finding a bridge between our world and the hidden, but we already have it in ourselves. A way for mortals to sense trouble from the other side, from true evil, to a truly macabre yet fascinating connection to a world most want to reach. Science says these instincts are often wrong when used to judge our fellow men, and often not, yes but maybe because it only applies to something it cannot see. That is, auras invisible to the naked eye or creatures of the veil watching our every move, waiting to strike. I'm probably wrong on some of that, but for now, it's a hypothesis, and I still need to wrap my head around this discovery. I don't know if I'm now a target of some demonic or otherwise supernatural entity, I don't know if it'll keep haunting me until I'm dead. Hell, I don't know if I would even be writing this if I didn't call Higgins. But I do know now that my gut instincts guided me through it. It always will. As for you all, if you ever feel like something is with you in an empty room, maybe as you even read this now, 
Trust what your gut says, but don't forget to think. Stay safe, people. I need to share something that happened with me recently, and I'm completely lost. Well, I recently moved to the house where I am, a spacious place with a large backyard. I live in South America, and around here vegetation grows a lot and very fast, so I need to weed the yard weekly if I want to be able to step on the ground. The thing is, this new house had been unoccupied for quite some time. So, you can imagine the scene. I called a friend to help me clear the land, and after five exhausting hours, we managed to make the place more welcoming. We were heading inside for a well-deserved lemonade when he tripped and fell. I approached to see how he was, and he turned, looking at what had caused his fall. It was a small rounded piece of metal, I suppose aluminum, sticking out of the ground, with most of it buried. I began to dig to see what might be there. I've seen countless news stories of people finding relics, gold coins, and all sorts of things in their yards, making a decent amount of money. What I found, though, was a chromed tube. It had engraved writing in relief on the metal saying, Photograph Time Capsule. Only open if adding a photo. It may not be a valuable item, but it seemed interesting enough to make me keep it. We went inside, and while refreshing ourselves with juice, we started talking about the capsule. My friend, whom I'll call Franco, is a photography enthusiast and has a Polaroid. You know, those more aesthetic things. He suggested taking a photo to add to the capsule and bury it again somewhere else. It would be an unusual and different artistic project that he would like to participate in. I agreed and while he went to his house to get the camera, I decided to take a peek. The photographs were really old, probably from the 19th century. The first one showed a gentleman with a thick mustache, top hat, and cane posing in profile. In the background, mountains and the sun. It was quite worn, and a layer of blackened mold covered the side of the figure. The other one was of a group of academics, young men in their overcoats posing next to a train with spontaneous smiles, carrying bags hanging at their sides. It was also very old, perhaps from the transition from the 1800s to the 1900s, and still had that layer of mold. I hope Franco knows how to clean photos. It seems like we have an infestation here. However, something bothered me this time. The stains seemed more defined, not like mold spreading. It occupied a space in the photo between the young men. If they were more distant, I might consider it to be one of them. I moved on to the next guy. A guy in a white tank top, military style haircut, a dog tag around his neck. It was at this point that I was sure something was wrong. The mold stain this time was bending over the guy, stopping at his face and falling over his shoulder on the other side, as if passing its arm over him. It just couldn't be natural. The lines that marked it were too defined, too specific. I started feeling uncomfortable with this, like I was being watched. A knock on the door made me jump in fright. Franco's voice came from outside. I rushed to open it, and as I saw him with the camera in hand, I was momentarily blinded by the flash. This one will be great, very spontaneous, he exclaimed. I quickly called him inside and began to explain the situation. At first glance, he seemed skeptical. He said they were just stains and went on a monologue explaining what... Peridolia is and how to seek patterns and shapes where there are none, but when we moved on to the next one, a more recent one from the 1970s, everything changed. The girl posed with her arms up joyful. The lighting came from a bulb on the ceiling, primarily illuminating her. 
Well, in the background, something lurked. The mold stain now definitely was something. It seemed almost human, but in a way I can't explain. It made our heads ache at the time, and now, when I try to think about it, it starts to hurt again. Yeah, I think you believe me now, huh? I asked. Okay, there's something weird with this. Look, let's stick to the initial plan and bury this thing. He looked again at the photo. Preferably far away from here. I agreed. So, do we have a shovel? He questioned. I did have one, but it broke last month, and I didn't have time to buy a new one. Well, Franco continued, I still have my gardening tools. They're not exactly professional, but they'll do the trick. If you want, I can go get them, and... I interrupted him. No way I'm staying here alone. He pondered for a moment. Okay, but we can't leave this thing here alone. Who knows what might happen? Well, then let's take it with us, I suggested. Honestly, I don't know. It's better to leave it here for now, and after we get everything, we take it back and never bring it back again. So give me the keys to your house and you stay here. I won't. The house is mine. Aha, <laughs> I knew you were scared too. Okay, okay, let's do this. Rock, paper, scissors. He said this already getting into position. I expertly prepared myself, trying to predict his movements and intentions. Filled my hand and confidently threw scissors. To my misfortune and surprise, Franco lowered his fist unchanged and closed. See, it's the same. I'll be right back, okay? Just start packing the photos so we can get rid of this as quickly as possible. Oh, we'll get rid of this as quickly as possible. I mimicked his voice in a clumsy way as he closed the door. I began to pack the photos into the capsule again, trying not to look too much when suddenly I noticed a photo I hadn't seen before. And then my heart froze. The image showed my face. A withdrawn expression with a sudden flash that illuminated my face. Hands slightly raised towards my face. It was the photo Franco had taken of me. The problem, however, was what was behind me. The stairs are in front of the door and right at the top, facing in the same direction, is the door to my room. And in this image, unlike how I remembered leaving it in the morning, it was open. But that wasn't the worst part. No. In the gap formed between the wood and the wall, I could clearly see something. A face. Twisted and poorly formed, but still a face. It was like the mold stain. Seemed to be made of the same substance. Bug-eyed and reddened eyes just above a crooked and pus-filled mouth. I had been staring at the photo when I heard strange noises upstairs. Footsteps? Suddenly the creaking of the bedroom door. I really don't know what this is. I ran and locked myself in the bathroom. I've heard some strange noises echoing through the house. They come, disappear, come back with no apparent time pattern. It's been more than two hours and Franco hasn't returned. And he doesn't answer my calls or messages. I don't know what these photos are. But there's definitely something very wrong with them. I played outside alone. That was the unwritten rule. When I was a kid, both of my parents worked from home. They preferred silence and strongly encouraged me to go outside after school. Between the ages of six and ten, I spent a few hours each day in the backyard, which kind of sucked. The space was large and had half a dozen mature trees, but there wasn't much to do. Plus, the furthest end of the yard was all mud and roots from dead trees on the other side of the chain link fence. The property on the other side looked abandoned. A portion of the small house in the opposing backyard had crumbled. It may have been a heritage ruin. 
There are a number of such rotting locations in Bridal Vale Lake. It's like the town makes them historical landmarks to avoid having to deal with them. I never found the front of the property on the other side of the block, where all the houses are somewhat modern looking and clearly not wreckages of stone. The heritage site must be enclosed by a newer neighborhood or sitting on somebody's property, and they didn't want to deal with it any more than the town did. Whatever the case, I usually avoided going to the back of my yard because it was creepy and easy to trip on the roots and fall into the sucking mud. My stressed out parents weren't happy if I came in filthy, which, of course, limited play options further. I generally sat on the limestone rocks I'd gathered from the back of the yard and waited to be allowed in, often watching the abandoned property for lack of a better option. Staring at my own house had also irked my parents for some reason. On a grey day in January, when more rain than snow had fallen, I sat thinking about my Christmas toys inside my bedroom. It was foggy, and I couldn't see the back half of the yard. Eric? A woman's voice said quietly but clearly. Hello? I thought somebody was calling from the other side of the fence. I'd never seen anyone back there, but it was possible. How she would know my name, I didn't know, but it's not a huge town. Be pretty funny if the property I believed abandoned belonged to a friend's parents. Hello? I asked again. I got off my rock and took a few steps to try and see better. No one responded. I got a shiver and nearly fell over when my dad was suddenly standing behind me. Come inside, Eric, he said. It's supper time. He sounded irritated. I found out why when I got to the table and my mom was there wearing the same expression. What are you doing outside? My father asked. He unfurled his napkin with a wrist snap. Outside? Nothing. I wanted to add as usual, but knew I'd get in trouble for it. Punishments were always chores, and I didn't want to waste more time not playing with my new toys. What was all the noise, then? What noise? Somebody screaming bloody murder? My mom said. I shrugged. I didn't hear any screams. Also, they heard screaming and didn't come outside to see if I was okay. I was too young at the time to understand the full... immature people my parents were. Enough, my dad said. You're clearly lying. Eat. We will discuss the consequences afterward. There was no point in arguing. I ate and only had to do the dishes after. Light punishment for lying, unless they didn't really believe I had. I finished up, played with my toys, and got ready for bed. I had trouble falling asleep. I had to go to bed too early so my parents could pull some more hours of work in peace. The quiet play in my room was too distracting, obviously. Wide awake, I crept to the window. It was dark outside and still foggy. Hours of my days were spent looking at nothing. I lamented. School was pretty boring. Recesses were too brief. Having friends over was forbidden. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere. I started to cry. Shh. A woman soothed. I saw no one and yet my eyes were drawn to the yard below, where a shadowy figure now stood in the fog. Don't cry, Eric, she said, but like directly into my ear. I swear I felt a gentle breath against my skin. I didn't respond. I backed away from the window slowly and crawled into bed, pulling the blankets over my head. Pressure from a hand fell against my leg and stroked it gently. I was scared, but not enough to dare violate the silence my parents required. I'd rather die, I realized. The ghostly hand continued until I, at last, gave in to imagining a caring adult was comforting me. I slept, but not through the night. Only a few hours passed when a prolonged cry of abject horror filled our home. My parents, not yet finished for the night, burst into my room together. 
The covers were ripped from my hands and they both began with many false accusations. There were too many to recall, but they all amounted to something like, You don't care about this family. I wasn't screaming, I said. Please listen. It wasn't me. Not another peep, my father shouted before they left and slammed the door. I felt hopeless. Their disbelief put us all at risk. Somebody had screamed inside our house. Were are we really just going to ignore it? Why wouldn't they believe me? I got dressed. Let them die, I thought. I was done. This would be my first attempt at running away. Naturally, I would need money to begin a new life. I had none, but understood people might pay me for my service rendered. I would be a painter. I put a single plastic tube of paint and a small brush into my coat pocket and was ready to go. It was easier to escape out the back door. The backyard looked darker and filled with even thicker fog. I only had to walk down the side steps and around the deck to get to the driveway gate. Eric, the woman said. Eric, don't leave me. I'm cold. Her voice was a loud whisper between my ears. Eric, come, please. Come and get me out. Eric, I'm stuck in the roots. The mud. Eric, Eric, please. She sounded so desperate. I went into the fog and to the muddy portion of the yard, tripping immediately on the first root to catch my foot. I landed in a pile of leaves, not realizing I'd reached the chain-link fence faster than expected. My fingers felt smooth in the dark. I recoiled and stood up. There was a face in the leaves. Her mouth opened and closed like a fish. She was gasping for air. Are you alright? It was a dumb question. I'll call the police. Help me. She shrieked. It wasn't some telepathy this time. It was her mouth. Her lungs. I lurched further into the leaf pile, cold mud mouths sucking my shoes off. I was up to my knees and I could see her face more clearly. She was young and pretty and utterly afraid. How was she stuck? How was I going to get her out? As I stood there trying to figure out what to do, she continued screaming and my parents appeared from the fog. She's stuck, I told them urgently. They were confused and appeared at a loss for words. My hands found her arms beneath the pile. That's when her expression changed from fear to childish glee. Something, not hands, grabbed my back and started to pull. It was so much easier to pull someone down than up. I fell into the leaves, my face against hers. She smelled of vegetation and soil and coppery blood. I was older when I found out, she whispered in my ear. I fought hard against the roots, pulling me down with her. I'm not sure if it was me that was able to spin around or if she, whatever she was, simply allowed it. My parents were there, just watching with a mixture of excitement and fear. Little smiles curved their lips. I reached for them. Help me. My mother moved closer to my dad. He wrapped an arm around her shoulders and said something I couldn't hear into her ear. The roots, her hands, continued pulling down until the dull light of night faded. I held my breath, buried under the mud. A little longer, you must know, she said. The urge to draw air began fast. You use more oxygen when you're afraid. One breath of dirt would be the end, wouldn't it? You want to know what they said? The woman said, the Lady of Leaves. I can tell you, but I think you already know. Does that make your choice easier? What choice? I only thought about the question. She answered similarly. The choice to stay with me, someone who loves you, or to go back with someone who doesn't. She didn't confirm or deny the idea. I want to live. So be it, she said. 
Suddenly I was breathing cold air rapidly and struggling to stay conscious. I was vaguely aware of my parents but couldn't be sure of what they were doing. There was a car ride or an ambulance, and then I was in a hospital where I recovered. The doctor explained I'd fallen and bumped my head. I nearly drowned in the mud until my dad pulled me up. With my parents in the room, there was no point in denying this version of events. I waited until we were in the car to challenge them. You didn't help me, I said as my mom pulled out of the parking lot. What's that? My dad said, looking at his phone. When she pulled into the mud, I said, you just watched. You didn't help. My dad finally looked at me. Huh? What are you saying? She was in the leaves, I said. My father looked alarmed. Who was in the leaves, Eric? I don't know. A woman? A young woman. She pulled me under the mud with the tree roots and... I think we should go back to the hospital, he said to my mom. He's just confused, my mom said. We've been working too much. Our stress is becoming his. She faced the road. We need to do better. Why was he outside in the first place? There's a question, he said. Why did you go out last night, Eric? I... after the screaming, I heard... Why were you screaming, Eric? Let him answer. My mom chided my dad. Sorry, sorry, Eric. I wasn't screaming, I said. My parents exchanged a quick glance, and I knew it was over. I was outnumbered by superior foes. They had their narrative, and to be fair, made more sense than mine. Therapy was on the horizon. My parents took some time off from work. I didn't have to go to school, and I got to stay in and play with my toys. We watched movies and ordered a lot of takeout. I was starting to feel better and accept that I had just been stressed out and confused to the point of hallucinating. The following week, however, my dad wanted to show me something in the backyard. I hadn't been out there since that horrible night. Come on, he said. I found something you'll want to see. He walked in front of me as we went to the back of the yard, obscuring the view until we were on top of the spot. A filthy mannequin head sat on top of the pile beside a one-armed plastic torso and a pair of legs. I haven't found the rest yet, my dad's son. I was wondering about what you'd said in the car and found the face right away. Why would somebody bury this here? And when? It must have been a long time ago. It was all tangled in roots. I know what I saw. I remember the feel of her smooth cheek against mine, the house beyond the chain-link fence, with its rotted trees, held a single shadow in a tiny window before it moved out of sight. It's for the best. I saw him. What? That's what you whispered to Mom. It's for the best. The lady in the leaves pulled me under. I begged you for help and you said, it's for the best. My dad looked guilty. He looked at the mannequin pile, evidence he must have planted and gestured weakly in his defense. I... Eric, you were confused. I'm sorry you think we'd... do something like that. Who was she? I pressured. Who's buried here? I don't know what you're talking about. He said and walked away, leaving me again. I crouched by the mannequin for a moment before movement in the yard caught my eye. She stood, unobscured between the dead trunks, and naked except for some leaves and dirt in her hair, on her body. Her smile was mischievous and sad, if that makes any sense. I think that's maybe just the way her face is and why someone killed her. They didn't like the way she smiled. When my mom called from the back of the house, the lady waved and walked behind a tree. I did not see her again, but never forgot her lesson. My parents were not trustworthy. The years that followed were difficult. 
I ignored the clumsy attempts my parents made to repair our relationship and stayed out of the house and around Bridal Veil Lake as much as possible. Therapy and medication only brought more clarity to confirm my suspicions of their motives. I went to the library often to try and learn about the property behind our home, but couldn't find anything. I started searching through my parents' stuff when they were at work and I was supposed to be in school. That's when I found the photo. That's when I found my lady in the leaves again. I waited until my 18th birthday to place the photo on the dinner table. They'd just finished putting down the cake, singing happy birthday. Who is she? I asked, but they didn't answer. I'm leaving, I told them. It's for the best. I haven't been back since, and I'm no closer to figuring out the identity of the lady and what happened to her. It all started when I was 16. It was Halloween and my friends and I all had a bit too much fun pushing each other to do something dumber and dumber. We'd snatched a bottle of red from my parents' stash and passed it around when one of us came up with the idea to check out the old mall by the freeway. The place had been closed a few years prior, and none of us had been there more than a couple of times as kids. But we figured it could make for a good story. The five of us crammed into a car and made our way out there, blasting music as we went along. Godsmack, P.O.D., P.M.5.K., Head P.E. It was a different time. Rod was up in the front seat trying to smoke something, but the rest of us kept interrupting him. He had this stupid hang up on a joke where, if you even reminded him of it, he wouldn't stop laughing. It could boil down to a single word and he'd burst. As we got there and poured out on the concrete, a chill passed through me, more so than the autumn air. The pillars outside reminded me of a rib cage, making the whole place look like a giant concrete corpse. In the dark of a Halloween night, pretty much anything can look terrifying. That's just where your mind wanders. We made our way in through a loosely boarded glass door. Stepping inside, all the light we had were our flip phones and the moon slipping in through the skylight. I'd been in that mall a handful of times over the years, but what I was seeing there and then was something different. Without the people, and the ads, and the billboards, and the stalls, it was just a husk. Something left behind. Still, we found a bunch of stuff. There were still metal racks in the middle of the old clothing stores which we could climb. There was a counter at the old sandwich place where we could pretend to take orders. There were windows to break and these huge empty spaces where our voices would carry all throughout the building. The only place that held some sort of reverence to us was the toy store on the second floor that had once been the center of our attention. We were still just 16. And most of us remembered a time where we would beg our parents for a trip there. It had been the biggest toy store in our world, and there was always something new to look at. But seeing it then and there, it was just as dead as the rest of the place. Not even the sign remained. As the others made their way inside, I split off to take a walk, lighting up the hall with my phone. They mocked me on my way, saying whoever splits off the group is always the first to die in horror movies. Hilarious. I went past what remained of the old stores. The gift shop, the flower boutique, the bookstore. I could almost see them, but only in my mind. Now it was all concrete and cheap sandstone tiling. The place wasn't even old enough to be dusty yet, remaining in this sort of space between living and dead. Like a man on life support, it'd only take the flip of a switch and this whole place would come alive, ready to welcome people back, but of course, that wouldn't happen. Then at the end of the mall, I came to a full stop. It turns out we weren't the first people with the idea to come here. There was a resting area in the far back, a sort of alcove, 
benches set around an empty space where stalls were supposed to be, all centered around this massive red marble column. I called the others over. They had to see this. My voice easily carried all the way across the mall, and the others came running. Someone had been here. They'd flipped all the benches onto their backs and placed several pots and planters in a circle around the column. Hell, they even planted something. I could see little blue sprouts poking up. But the freakiest thing was the column itself. They'd taken the old mall posters and plastered the thing with them. These posters were just the pictures of a smiling middle-aged woman, dressed in a sort of 50s attire. A generic yellow sundress with little white flowers on it. She also had the most generic stock photo smile you could imagine. To her right, on every poster, was a cartoonish speech bubble. There were just old sayings, bordering on cliches. Like mama used to make them, the more the merrier, happily ever after. But the freaky thing was not the posters themselves but what had been done to them. Someone had burned out the eyes, leaving them covered in scorch marks. With the red marble in the back, my brain sort of short-circuited, making me think I was looking into her empty eye sockets. Seeing the gore behind the eyes, it was unsettling and probably intentional. They'd also modified some of the sayings, crossing out certain words. Mama used to, more, ever after. It was unsettling. Some of us caught the Halloween vibe of it, thinking it fit perfectly with what we were up to. Others could sense it, like me, that this wasn't just a fun thing someone did for giggles. This was deranged. It must have taken hours to arrange this sort of scene, and we couldn't imagine a good reason to do it. That's Lady Lockley said Rod, pointing up at the posters. I had a crush on her. Looks like my babysitter. She's like 50, I added. Still got a great rack. The others agreed. It was funny, but I couldn't bring myself to laugh. This felt like rot. In the same way that a corpse decays, this was the way old buildings decayed. It made me feel filthy like I was some kind of bacteria infecting this place and breaking it down, corrupting it, digesting it. I felt sorry for Lady Lockley. She deserved better, a happily ever after. Once we got bored of wandering around, we made our way back to the entrance on the other side of the building. One of the guys squealed in delight. He'd found a ball pit. Looking at it, it was clear that this thing wasn't sanitary. We could hear something moving in it, probably rats. Part of the ceiling had collapsed, leaving a dead wire hanging like an open nerve, and the whole place was covered in a thin layer of concrete dust. Someone's gotta go in, they said. We ain't leaving until someone goes in. Not me, I added. No way. And that settled it. I was the first to decline. I had to be the first to go in no matter if I wanted to or not. The others grabbed me and pushed me into the deep end face first. Plastic balls rattled against my ears. I was fully prepared to be drenched in rat pee and bites, but nothing happened. There was concrete dust covering my scalp and forehead, but apart from that, I was fine. It tickled my nose a bit. The pit was deep enough to reach about halfway up my body, but I'd sunk to the bottom. I could feel the rubber flooring against my cheek. The others were lighting me up with their phones. The lights coming through the balls made a sort of kaleidoscope of pastel colors, stretching the shadows out into long, distorted shapes. As I struggled to regain my balance, I fumbled around with my hands, trying instinctively to grab something. But instead, something grabbed me. It was only a silhouette, a face somewhere in the swirl of colors, the shape of a head with two holes where the eyes were supposed to be. It gasped excitedly. Even from a distance, I could taste the ammonia on its breath. 
Its icy fingers interlocked with mine, wanting to bring me closer. I recoiled, shaking my head. I think I let out a scream, but I don't remember doing it. My pulse shot through the roof as I forced myself back to my feet, scrambling to get back to the others. They were laughing, thinking I was just surprised. As my head breached the surface, they were standing in a half circle, shining their lights at me. Of course, there was nothing in the ball pit. I wiped my dusty hair and prepared myself to drag one or two of them down there with me, but something in the air changed. Their faces went from gleeful joy to careful curiosity, to worry. Turning back towards the pit, I could see why. On the side of every ball in the pit was an eye, lovingly hand-painted with a sharpie. The others helped me up and tried to diffuse the tension with puns and jabs. It didn't take long for the chill to leave our spines, but it took me the longest. Looking down at my hand, I felt cold, like something had really touched me. Something just as real as that mall and the people who'd invaded it. We left shortly after, taking the car back to town, blasting our music again. We filled the rest of the night with more stolen wine, games, dares, and laughs. But something in me had changed. I couldn't let go of that image of Lady Lockley and the red marble in the back of her head. Through every chuckle and every smile, that feeling held me back. Something had changed. Forever. That night, as I slept on Rod's couch, I watched the moonlight cast a shadow on the opposite wall. The cross of the window shaped the light into four perfect squares. As I lay there, half drunk and half sleeping, I imagined them as little television screens, each showing whatever came to mind. Old memories, dreams, hopes. But every made-up show I imagined always ended the same way, with the mental image of a middle-aged 1950s housewife, her dead smile, a southern drawl, and the red, infected cavity in her skull where her eyes ought to be. The next day, it all felt like a bad dream. Some of the guys were hungover, and most of us just made our way back home to sleep it off. I didn't want to go home. My parents were so focused on my older brother at the time that they didn't even care what I did. He was the one with the problems. I could get away with pretty much anything. Being gone for a day was nothing compared to a heroin addiction. Still, I had to get back home. Much like expected, my parents weren't around. They'd left a note to say there was some leftovers in the fridge and I could call them if I needed something, but that was it. I had never once called them on that number. Making my way up to my room, I stopped. We have these two windows at the top of the staircase with two knobs in the middle. For a moment, I imagined those two knobs as little eyes. I could imagine them blinking. All throughout the day, and the next, this would become a repeating pattern. Two coins on the counter could send a shiver up my spine. The rings of a scissor grip would make me think of those gaping eye sockets. Two soda cans with their pull tab standing at attention brought me the same image. Every combination of two circles, spheres, or rings, it all forced that image back into my head. That joyless smile of Lady Lockley and her icy fingers interlocking with mine bringing me closer. It came to a point where people started to notice. For example, when I had dinner with my parents, they had a beer each. The bottles were right next to one another, and the top of the bottles formed these two holes. It took me a while to notice, but when I did, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It physically made me itch, and I had this intense need to separate them. Once I did, the two of them just looked at me, not a word spoken. I tried to ignore it. I reorganized my space to make sure there was nothing around to remind me, but every now and then there'd be something. It could be something as little as two people passing on the street and their heads reminding me of floating eyeballs. But it got worse. Once, as I stepped out of the shower, 
I spotted myself in the mirror. Even seeing my own eyes looking back at me sent into the spiraling anxiety. I could imagine myself eyeless, with that infected red cavity in the back of my skull. I could see it. I could see it to the point where I convinced myself that it was true, that I had no eyes to begin with. My eyes would close and I couldn't bring myself to open them. I would try to pry them open with my fingers, kneeling on the cold bathroom tiles, but it wouldn't work. Nothing would. Come on, I'd cry. Come on. But it just wouldn't work. It was so infuriating that I tickled the back of my brain into a joyless smile. The same kind of smile that Lady Lockley wore on those posters. No one else was suffering from this. I had no one to talk to, and no one would understand why I was feeling that way. It was impossible to describe, and to a group of guys who mostly talked about women and games, there wouldn't be much interest in mental health. So I decided I'd do something about it myself. Much like exposure therapy, I had to go back. I was going to tear down every poster, set fire to the ball pit, and proved to myself that there was nothing to fear. I was going to destroy it. And with it, Lady Lockley. I was going to break those icy fingers and stare into her eyeless face, unflinching. I had this crappy moped that I'd saved up for one summer. Enough time had passed for the first Minnesota snow to fall, so I had to be careful not to slip and slide. I loaded up a backpack with all kinds of destructive tools. I didn't even bother to read the note left on the kitchen counter this time. No one else was going to fix me, so I had to do it myself. I kept the wheel steady, feeling the snow slush stain my cheap jeans. Cold water soaking onto my secondhand shoes. By the time I got there, I was shivering. A cold wind had picked up from the overcast, and there was no moonlight to guide me this time. Still, I'd prepared. I had a great flashlight with plenty of spare batteries packed away. My dad had this battery box in the garage full of whatever kind he might possibly need. I brought the whole thing. I made my way inside through the loosely boarded up doors. The place felt warmer, but maybe it was just me being angry. I had this frustration pent up in me, forcing me forward. I went past all the hollow shops, the broken benches, the empty planters, and the dry fountain. I climbed up the dead escalator and followed the familiar shops towards the resting area. I could see the red marble column from afar, sticking out like a sore nerve. The posters plastered to it like a band-aid to an open wound. My footsteps echoed as I made my way closer, clutching the flashlight harder. There were little sprouts in the pots and planters now, some with a little blue bud, others had barely poked through the dirt. One had grown quite tall. There were more posters now, some had been stuck to the walls, others lay strewn about on the floor. Someone had been there recently, I could tell. A few chairs from one of the downstairs restaurants had been dragged up there and smashed, forming a kind of plastic half-circle across the floor. It didn't matter to me. This was all going to burn either way. I put down my backpack and brought out a bottle of gasoline. My dad always kept a spare can in the garage, but I didn't want to bring the whole thing, so I just filled up three plastic bottles instead. I unscrewed the top and just started chucking it at the column, tainting the posters. They were made with some kind of plastic that didn't react well to gasoline, making part of the ink melt a little, making Lady Lockley smile into a frown and then a garbled mess. I went all around the column, using two of my three bottles. It was messy, and I got a whole lot of it on my clothes. I would have had to wash them when I got back. My parents didn't ask a lot of questions, but if I were to come home drenched in gasoline, they might have something to say. 
As I finished, I put down my bag again and got a hold of a lighter. One of those with a long neck for lighting fancy candles. I tried to wipe the gasoline off my hands, but doubt was getting to me. I didn't want to set myself on fire. Then again, this place had to die. For a brief moment, I got stuck staring at the posters. Even with the ink melting off, the holes remained. Dozens of empty eye sockets staring back at me. Some with a barely human face attached. Some were relatively unscathed, still carrying the various slogans and sayings of Lady Lockley. There was even a fully intact, happily ever after poster smiling back at me. I put away my flashlight, letting the darkness of the place overwhelm me. The overcast was doing me no favors. I held the lighter up, inched closer, and clicked it. A single light in the dark, but something was wrong. A chill worked its way across my right cheek, making me squint. Then, a breath of air. The light disappeared and my nostrils were assaulted by the sudden smell of ammonia. And right behind me, grazing my cheek was something cold. Something that was gently placing its fingers on my left shoulder, inching up towards my neck. I bent down, snatched up my flashlight, and turned around. The cone of light swayed back and forth, finding nothing. As I backed away, my feet were stepping on their own, seemingly out of my control. My lungs felt stiff like I couldn't push any air into them. There were puffs of smoke with every little forced, panting breath. I wasn't alone. I didn't even think about how far I backed up until my back hit the red marble pillar. I just stood there, frozen. I could feel the eyeless holes turning towards me, judging me, waiting for me to turn around. Something was running down my arm. It made its way all the way to my fingers. I looked down only to see fresh I looked down only to see fresh blood. Droplets formed at the edge of my fingertips, pooling up and dropping to the floor. The back of my head felt wet. Same with the back of my pants and jacket. I carefully stepped away and turned to face the pillar. Blood. It wasn't just red marble. It was bleeding. The gasoline had made the poster slip off, falling to the floor one by one, leaving the pillar raw and unprotected. Little pools of blood ran across the floor. It was so quiet. Just little tips and taps of drops hitting the floor, mixing with the echoes of my breathing. I could hear the battery in the flashlight rattling as my hands shook from the cold. And in the distance, a hiss. My ears homed in on the sound, a whisper coming from one of the nearby stores. Put them back. I just stood there, trying to comprehend what I was hearing. What was it demanding? Then from another store across the mall, a louder sound. Put it all back. And from a third store, an old fast food kitchen put me back. Looking down at the pools of gasoline and blood, mixing with the misshaped plastic posters, I shook my head. I didn't want this anymore. All the anger had turned to fear, and all I wanted was to grab my stuff and leave. I'm... I'm going, I said. I... I won't be back. There was no response. Just like back home, there was no one to listen to me. Maybe I was speaking to an empty room, making up stories in my head. I won't come back, I repeated. This is it. Screw your stupid mall and screw whatever game you think you're playing. I won't. I suddenly choked on my breath. I could see them in the distance, human shapes stepping out of the storefronts, all with the same cheerful yellow dress, the same hair, the same smile. Then something grabbed me. It wasn't like the first time, where icy fingers daintily slipped into my hand, but something violent, angry, 
nails digging into my scalp, grabbing a handful of my hair, forcing me forward with a dead man's cramped grip. I went from standing, to kneeling, to having my face pressed into the floor in a heartbeat. There were more than two hands, maybe four, five. Something heavy pushed against my spine. No. It wasn't just one word. It was a choir. A dozen identical voices speaking as one from across the mall. Two cold fingers touched my eyelids, forcing me to blink. I forced my eyes shut, trying to squint them away. I could barely breathe. I tried moving my head away, shaking the fingers off, but I couldn't. No matter how far back I forced myself, they pushed on until the pain started, this mounting pressure, causing bright, painful spots to dance across the inside of my head. It was excruciating. I was panicking, trying to turn, but I couldn't. There was this raw, primal emotion bubbling inside me, forcing me to scream. I begged and pleaded, but it was too late. I'd wronged them, and they were relentless. Had it gone any further, I'd be blind today. Maybe dead. But it didn't. I heard distant footsteps approaching and felt the fingers slowly let up. Pressure released from my spine and the hands holding me down loosened their grip. I slowly opened my eyes, blinking away the spots of pain only to see a man. He had a flashlight of his own, casting deep shadows on his wrinkled face. He must have been in his early sixties and was dressed in some kind of maintenance getup. A janitor, perhaps. He walked up to me as the last hand let go, and offered to help me up. I accepted it and got back on my feet. I didn't dare to turn around. I could hear them, feel them, smell the ammonia. Don't do anything stupid, he whispered. Give them a moment. We just stood there. I looked down, trying my best not to bring any attention to myself. At the edge of my vision, I could see flowery yellow dresses shuffled past me, back into the empty storefronts, back into the mall. He patted me on the shoulder and I looked up. The last silhouette slipped into an old outlet space, leaving the two of us alone. He got some blood on his hands from touching my shoulder and wiped it off on his legs. He stepped back to pick up something he'd brought. A stack of posters and a toolbox. Walking up to me, he had this almost apologetic look on his face. So she picked you too, he sighed. That makes, what, four of us? Using a bucket and a still working hose in the back, we got enough water and soap to clean the pillar a bit. It had stopped bleeding, coagulated in a way. We ended up putting up new posters, still with the eyes burned out. She likes them this way, he said. The kids always did this to the posters, long before the place closed. She thinks they're supposed to be like this. We spent some time collecting scrap and piling it into a circle around the pillar that and drawing eyes on various white surfaces. She doesn't have any eyes of her own, so she needs us to give her some. We spent hours just wandering around, touching up the place, watering the plants, cleaning up the gasoline. The Lady Lockleys seemed calmer. I could see them shuffling about in the back of the stores catching a reflection of their perfect teeth every now and then. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that any threat to this place would have me swarmed. Do you have to do this? I asked. Like, often? Yeah, he nodded. What happens if you don't? I think you know what happens. At the end of the night, as I left the mall behind, I saw a final swaying flowery dress in the cracks of the wooden boards. 
Even now, I was being watched, judged, weighed, but for the moment, I was safe. At first, I went back like once a week. Once I brought ping pong balls and painted eyes on them, they seemed to like that. Another time, I filled up the water fountain. The janitor would return at times, too, bringing freshly printed posters and scrubbing the floor. No wonder it wasn't dusty. I tried to stop going back there, but it would just build this pressure in me. I'd feel her ire. I would start to focus on circles and spheres, and if my body was reminding me that I was being watched, I'd sometimes feel something cold at the edge of my vision, something icy brushing against my ear. It would put me on edge, as if expecting something to grab me at any moment, for that smile to come out of the dark and become the last thing I ever see. Places like this don't get torn down. The land is dirt cheap, and the effort to break and ship off all the concrete just isn't worth it. It remains here to this day. I would go back every now and then to fix the place up, to make sure she was happy enough to leave me alone. Weeks would turn to months, and over time, they trusted me enough to come back only once every six months or so. I'd make a day out of it. The plants would blossom into these six feet tall radiant blue sunflowers, and a creeping vine would slither up the side of the marble pillar. She seemed to like the vines. Sometimes there are new people. I don't really know their names, but we can kind of recognize each other at a glance. Some young, some old. We've tried to board the place up to keep people out, but every now and then, somebody gets through. I don't think they all make it out. Some of the things I've seen over the years tell a gruesome story of their own. I'm in my mid-thirties now. I've done this for half my life as a sort of stewardship, a part of my life that I can't share with anyone. I've gotten to know her wants and needs. There is a personality there, an intelligence. Sometimes they can get these strange whims. I once saw one of them trying to break through the loose boards, only to be dragged away by the others. I've seen them gently caress the leaves of the sunflowers. I've seen them dance on tables, walk hand in hand down the empty walkways, and once, just staring up at the moon. I think she's like an immune system. Like something remaining to stop the decay. The building has been closed for decades, but from looking at it, you couldn't tell. Most buildings that have been empty for that long just looks way down and worn, but not the Dead Eye Mall. It's still spry and waiting, as if expecting people to come back, and every now and then, they do. But it is a service I perform under threat of death, and to this day it terrifies me. While I'm not as bothered by circles or rings, I still have this feeling that I should be, like I shouldn't be normalizing this. I shouldn't have to compromise to something unnatural and otherworldly, but I just don't know what the alternative is. I have this feeling that sooner or later, she'll turn to me, dissatisfied, and that day, she'll interlock her fingers with mine and drag me to a dark place I can't come back from ever after. The evergreen canopy thin out. There's still snow on the ground in spring. Plenty of bird song and chipmunks and the occasional deer or bear encounter. Apple trees in Wenatchee had begun to flower by the time I made it up there for my first hike of the season. Slight dismay at seeing a big white Ford pickup already parked. It dwarfed my Mini Cooper. Made the Ford look intimidating. I gathered my water, snacks, and hiking gear, threw on my pack, tied my boots. Breathing the fresh air, I started the hike. The trail starts in the thick of the woods, and you can still hear cars nearby on Highway 2. 
The sound fades slowly on a straight shot through a dense forest of tall trees. It was a bright, clear day. Sunbeams looked like spotlights piercing through branches, splotching a collage of UV roar shocks among ferns and needles on the ground. Eventually all you hear are the animals, insects, and your own huffing. When the trail starts to climb is when I drink most of my water. I carry a purifier pump because there are a number of streams I siphon from along the way. After about an hour, there is more sky than canopy, and while it's cold at the elevation, the sun feels hot. It was at this change that I heard it. A muffled bang. It was muffled by a ridge in front of me, but I could hear its echo return a few seconds later from a cliff face across the valley to my left. A gunshot? I thought initially. There weren't supposed to be hunters here. But I wouldn't put it past them. I kept walking. A while later, say 15 minutes or so, I heard another bang. Only this time I had crested the ridge and so I heard it crystal. Loud as a firework. Caused my heart to miss a beat. I even stumbled into a stance to preserve my balance. The echo returned immediately. Raw and coursing. Bang. Then I saw it, smoke in the near distance, rising between two red cedars, not too far in front of me, but higher toward the tree line. What had it been? Birds went flying in fear, I ducked impulsively. For a minute my over-functioning imagination suggested maybe it was miners exploding dynamite. This was protected land, but also miners. This isn't the 19th century. I quieted my mind and pushed on in spite of my misgivings. Having followed the smoke like a signal, I had to go off trail for the last hundred feet or so. I came to a short plateau in a clearing and smelled something I didn't like. It was a stink mixed with burning. And then I saw the deer, or what was left of it. Still steaming, its rib cage exposed and dripping rosy blood, entrails splattered in the high grass. I approached. It was missing an eye, and the other was quite dead. Multiple wounds sliced into the carcass seemingly at random. A landmine? Here? No. Then I heard it, a buzzing like a distant power tool. No, like an electric bee. It didn't take long for the noise to grow loud enough to identify what it was. A drone. A second later, it was hovering above the clearing. I waved at it and gestured my disbelief and incredulity, motioning at the dead deer body, torn and broken, pointless, tragic. All the words you can describe something that died when it didn't have to and in a so violent way, as its life was a game. You piece of crap, I yelled. I don't know if drones have audio input. I screamed regardless. Of course it had to be the driver of that white Ford pickup piloting the thing. No one else was around. Was he going to collect the meat at least? I didn't care. This was not only inhumane, it was psychotic. I'm shy and quiet, but I was going to read this person the riot act when I got back down, and then I would call the rangers to report the incident. It took me longer than I cared to admit to realize the danger I was in. I had retrieved my phone and started to take photos of the dead deer. Only when I began snapping zoomed-in shots of the drone did it dawn on me that a little round object was dangling from its belly, 50 feet in the air. It had moved, and now hovered directly above me. My heart seized. It had moved and was above me. It carried a grenade. All this happened within a minute of discovering the drone. Seconds later, a clink sound, pounding ears, bird song rustling dry needles beneath my feet as I pivoted and dove. Bang. I was deaf for a moment, only ringing in my ears. Dirt fell everywhere. 
metal smell, smoke from the explosion behind me. I checked my body, expecting to be missing a limb, all intact. I had dove over the edge of the plateau just in time, and so the fragments were absorbed by ground. I was breathing frantically. I scanned the sky. No drone. Scurrying to my feet, I stumbled. Noticed that part of the sole of my boot heel had been sheared clean off. I ran down 100 feet back to the trail, tripping as I went. I was an hour from the trailhead. I began to brisk walk run back. My mind at this point was coming to terms with the incident, but it was unlike any trauma I'd ever experienced before. Thoughts were stunted, came like slaps in the face. Dead deer, drone, grenade, explosion, attempted murder. Why? Killing animals, pointless, psychotic. I hustled for ten minutes, trying to adapt and balance a missing heel by jogging on toes. My ankles were killing me. Then I stopped in my tracks. A faint buzz. I was still close to the tree line. More sky than canopy. Then I saw the drone zip overhead. An involuntary scream escaped me. No. I remember saying aloud. No, no, no. It drew a great U-shape in the distance, circling back toward me. No place to hide. I didn't need to squint to know its belly cargo was another grenade, dark and menacing, dangling as if thinking itself a gift that I want to receive. My god. It hovered overhead as I sprinted down the trail. I took no effort to keep up. I could see it above, leading me, like a sniper leads its moving target. I stopped. It stopped. I began running back the way I'd come, and again it matched me, leading me fifty feet in the air, ten in front of me. I stopped again, panting, trying to catch my breath. It made no difference. This was my angel of death, here to deliver me to oblivion. At no point in that moment did I think of the pilot. It was me against the drone, the machine. The technology and violent, concussive power that would take my life in this meaningless way. Like a game, a story with no plot, just erased from existence. As I stood, hands on knees panting, I did not let the drone out of my sight. Then it lowered itself down, 40 feet, 30. I looked to my right at a tree, the thickest and closest. And in that instant, the drone careened at high speed on an angle directly at me. The buzz was deafening. And just as it reached me, and as I dashed toward the tree, I heard a click sound. A plop. Then the drone banked hard into an ascent. And I ate the dirt on the opposite side of the chosen trunk. Bang. Falling dirt. Drizzling fern and common yarrow. Like plant rain. It fell onto the back of my head and back, pattering. My hands were dug into earth, grasping loose dirt like a shield. My face as well smashed into the dirt, as if just touching it would put me safely beneath it. I was breathing it even. Tears wet my cheeks, and when the ringing stopped I heard my own voice screaming. But the grenade miraculously missed. I was alive. I got to my knees, no buzzing. The tree trunk was ripped of bark and riddled with shrapnel. I touched it. I might have even thanked it. Was this the day I die? It is difficult to recall what happened after this. I think I achieved runner's high. Already the high altitude makes oxygen scarcer. Add that to the mortal dread. Endless screaming and crying for help as I went. Knees feeling like they would implode. The forest gave me countless gashes as I tripped, fell, got up, and kept running down the trail until I was again obscured by a canopy. I heard the drone buzzing overhead. I couldn't keep track of it and just ran. I heard a loud bang again, and I just kept running. Snot and dirt and tears clogged my senses. I screamed, 
my body burned. The buzzing grew again ten minutes later, and looking back over my shoulder I saw it navigating the thick branches of my evergreen protectors. I saw it clip one, and its gimbal stabilizers saving it from falling. That was the last I saw of it. Unable to continue running, I limped for the last twenty minutes through the forest, merging it in an abandoned trailhead. The white pickup was gone. My Mini Cooper sat shining under a Rorschach sunbeam. Heavenly glints. Glints of success. You made it. I sat against the tire, catched my breath. Ringing ears calmed. Pulse slowed. I listened to the bird song around me and nearby cars on Highway 2. This all happened only two days ago. I'm writing this all down because, well, I've already made a police report. Something else has happened. A girl went missing while hiking. They found her car. Not my trailhead, but another one I know of. It's in local news. Hasn't made national yet. I know her. Went to high school with her. They're looking for a white Ford F-150 in connection. Rescue crews are heading up there now. I can't stop thinking about that drone. About how weak and out of control my life felt. How its buzzing pursuit rang like a deafening demand. Submit. Submit to me now. I can't stop thinking about the deer carcass. My god. What are they going to find? My grandfather passed away about eight months ago. It still feels a little surreal. I'd always been close to him. When I was little, I would visit him every year for summer break. My mom didn't have to find a daycare or sitter while school was out, and I got to go swimming and fishing in the lake behind his house. Win-win. Each summer, he would have new activities planned. Sometimes we would try new fishing techniques, other years, we would go hunting for deer in the rolling fields and wooded sections of his land. It was nearly 80 acres. Which felt like an infinite amount of space to explore as a kid. One year, we spent nearly two whole months building a treehouse overlooking the lake. It was a miracle neither of us fell out of the trees and broke something. Or worse. All of my fondest memories happened out there with my grandpa. The last summer I spent with him, he had already started drafting up plans for the next year. We were going to build a deck stretching out onto the lake that you could go fishing right off the side of. Maybe he had finally gotten tired of repairing our rickety old rowboat we always took out. It would be the biggest project we had undertaken by far. It might have taken a couple summers to get it done. I was so excited. My parents had to practically drag me back home. But the deck never got built. That winter, my grandpa started having some issues. He would call my mom in the middle of the night ranting and raving about things that didn't make any sense. Most of the time, she could get him to calm down. One time it got so bad, she had to drive all the way out to his house. Nearly two hours in the middle of the night and stay with him for a few days. I could see it was tough on her. Unfortunately, he only got worse over time. His neighbors found him wandering around in the woods in his pajamas more than once, unable to find his way back home. By the next spring, it was clear he couldn't live on his own anymore. Against his protests, my mom moved him into an assisted care facility only a few minutes away from us. I went with her to visit a couple of times every week. For a while, he was happy to see us. Then he was just confused. Eventually, he didn't respond much at all. Everything happened so fast. One day, we were hanging out, fishing, and listening to old Hank Williams songs. The next day, he was nothing but a shell. He lived in that care facility for about five years. It was longer than the doctors had initially estimated. Near the end, I wasn't sure if it was a blessing or a curse. 
He passed just a few days before his 70th birthday. We had the funeral reception out at his house. My mom and I had to do some cleaning and repairs beforehand. After sitting mostly untouched for five years, it was still in pretty decent shape all things considered. The ceremony and reception were both small, but nice. After the reception, I went and stood out by the lake by myself for a while. It was only a maybe couple hundred feet across, but it seemed much bigger when I was just a kid. I got quite the surprise a couple days later. At the reading of my grandpa's will, we found out he had left the house and land to me. He had written it only a few months before my last summer with him. I could feel my aunt's barely veiled jealousy, but at least my mom was happy for me. She offered to help me fix up the few remaining things we hadn't gotten to before the reception. She even said she'd help me pay for movers if I decided to move in completely. I wasn't ready for that just yet. I still needed to finish school, and I had a feeling there was probably more to be done around the lot than it seemed on the surface. But every weekend I drove up and did a little bit more to get it ready. Clearing out dead trees, replacing the warped old siding on the house, pouring new gravel for the driveway. It was slow going, but I was getting closer every day. Then one day a few months ago, while I was cleaning piles of junk out of the garage, I found some rough blueprints still spread out on my grandpa's old workbench. It was the plans for the lake dock, our grand project we never got to build. I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a little emotional looking them over. They were basically all done, missing a few measurements, but nothing too crazy. So I decided right then and there, I was going to build the deck. I would finish this one last summer project. I went and bought most of the lumber and hardware the following week. I also bought a water depth gauge so I could get the last measurements I needed. The height of the posts at the end, which would go down into the lake. If it was more than 15 feet or so, I would probably just get some anchors and let it float. But the original plans called for posts, so I figured I would stick to it if I could. The next weekend, I was back out at the house. I borrowed a friend's pickup to haul most everything out in one trip. I also bought some food, water, and other essentials. It would make building a lot easier if I just stayed out at the house for a few days without having to drive back and forth to town. Enough of my grandparents' furniture was still there to make shorter stays comfortable enough. The first thing I did was go out to get the depth measurements I needed. I dragged the old rowboat to the overgrown grassy shore of the lake, praying the whole time that it would stay afloat at least long enough for me to get the reading. The meter I got seemed simple enough. It looked like a flashlight. You're supposed to stick it in at the surface of the water, and it uses a laser to tell how far it is to the bottom. The wonders of modern technology. Lucky for me, the boat still floated, and didn't seem to have any major leaks. I hopped aboard and paddled out about 30 feet to where the end of the dock would be. I uncapped the depth meter, stuck it in, flipped the switch, and nothing. The display on the side just kept flashing, reading, for what seemed like an unusual length of time. After a minute or so, the message changed to error, and it turned back off. I tried a few more times, but the result was the same. The wonders of modern technology. And so I headed back to the hardware store. Luckily, there was a smaller one closer to the house, so I didn't have to go all the way back into town. I bought another water depth meter. This one was more old school. Just a weight on the end of a line that you could spool out. Once it hit the bottom, you could just read the numbers on the line. Basically a tape measure with a hunk of metal at the end. Probably what I should have gotten in the first place. I got back to the house and rode out onto the lake once more. I tossed the weight into the water and let it start to sink, but it didn't stop. The line kept going, unspooling more and more, almost seeming to pick up speed. 
15 feet, 30 feet, 50 feet. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It eventually stopped at 100 feet. Not because it had hit anything, but because that was as far as my meter line went. That couldn't possibly be right. Sure, I had never touched the bottom as a kid, but it couldn't be that deep, could it? I spent a few minutes reeling it back in and tried again, thinking somehow it would be different, but sure enough, it only stopped when there was no line left to give. I just stood there scratching my head for a bit, unsure on where to even go from here. Should I get a longer line? Even if I did hit the bottom, it wasn't like I could use posts for the dock now. As I thought on it, the water depth meter slipped from my hands and fell off the side of the boat. It immediately disappeared from the surface, dragged down by the weight on the other end. Well, what a waste of thirty dollars, I thought to myself. I sat back on the boat for a while doing some quick searches on my phone. After fifteen minutes or so, the boat suddenly lurched. I steadied myself, almost losing my lone paddle over the side as well. It felt like the world's shortest earthquake, and I could see ripples hitting the shores on all sides. Before I could even guess at what it was, a loud splash erupted beside me and showered me in murky lake water. Something flew out of the water, straight up in the air so fast I barely saw it. I shielded my head as it fell back down, landing hard with a resounding thunk between my legs. I cracked one eye open after a few moments. I thought the boat was still moving, but I quickly realized it was just my own trembling. There in the bottom of the boat was the metal weight from the end of my depth meter, still attached to a few feet of line. The line looked like it had been torn off, and what was left was frayed and mangled. I rode back to shore faster than I had ever rode before. As I did, I could have sworn the surface of the lake started to swirl and pull back from the edges. I paddled harder. As I reached the grass, I crawled from the boat and took a few moments to catch my breath. Looking back from the safety of firm ground, all I saw was a once again calm lake. The sun starting to set in the distance and glinting off the glass-like surface. I was bewildered and shaken up in equal measure. What the hell was that? I went inside and dried off the best I could. I changed into my pajamas and sat by the back door staring out at the lake. Part of me just wanted to hop in the truck and leave, but I couldn't. All I could do was watch the surface, waiting for something else to happen. Every time a dragonfly would land on the lake or a toad would hop out, I nearly jumped out of my skin. The reasonable thoughts of doubt started to creep into my mind. Maybe I had just imagined it. Maybe there was a very rational and mundane explanation for all of this. Every time these thoughts came back, I looked at the remains of the depth line on the kitchen counter, and then I looked back out at the lake. After a few hours, I felt my eyelids start to grow heavy. I fought violently, but... I soon lost the battle to my weariness. I had vivid dreams. The kind that you can't remember. Not that you'd want to. The kind that leaves you in a cold sweat in the middle of the night. Sure enough, I woke in a gasp. Nearly falling out of the dining room chair, I had commandeered from my lookout. As I steadied my breathing and regained my senses, I looked back to the lake almost immediately. Nothing. Just the moonlight on a calm little patch of water. Once again, I started to question what had happened earlier. Maybe it had just been some large deep water crocodile or something. Were those a thing? I looked back at the broken depth meter again, as if it held some sort of secrets that would answer everything for me. It didn't, but as I looked it over once more, the light from outside grew brighter. It was subtle at first, like the moon moving out from behind a cloud, but it kept getting brighter still. As I looked back outside, I saw its source. The lake had begun to grow with an ethereal blue-green light. Ripples had appeared on its surface, starting in the center and moving outward. 
At first, they only came every minute or so, but they got faster as the lake grew brighter. In my ears, I started to hear a low hum and an uncomfortable pressure, like descending in an airplane. I tried to run, to grab the car keys and leave, but my legs refused to budge. The lake began to rise unnaturally, like some sort of huge bubble was pushing its way upward, creating a dome of swirling water and pulsing light. It rose up and up until it was taller than the house and all the trees surrounding it. Finally, I felt myself stand up, and my brief sense of relief turned to horror as I felt my legs walking on their own accord towards the back door, towards the lake. Soon I felt grass under my bare feet and a spray of cool mist covered my skin. I couldn't stop myself. I couldn't even blink. The dome of water had stopped growing. The light started flashing irregularly. Like, the lake held inside it a violent thunderstorm. In the flashes, I started to make out some sort of solid shape. It was massive, easily 50 feet across. It seemed to be curled in on itself like a seashell or a hurricane, but the edges were spotted with tendrils here and there that twitched and flicked like a cat's tail. In the center, the light was strongest, and it seemed to shine down on me like a spotlight. I screamed, or at least it felt like I did. I kept walking forward at a steady pace until I was only a few feet from the wall of water. One of the tendrils stretched out and waited just underneath the surface, beckoning me to come forward. A voice in my head spoke louder than my own thoughts. Come in, it said, the words leaking right through the folds of my brain. He's already here. I've seen you in his memories. I kept walking. I held out my hand. I embraced the inevitable. The next thing I knew, I was sitting in a house I didn't recognize. One of the neighbor's places, I soon learned. He told me how he had found me wandering in the woods in my pajamas soaking wet. He said it gave him deja vu. From when he had found my grandpa years ago. My mom showed up to get me an hour or so later. I couldn't read much from her face. And we didn't say anything on the drive back to her house. The next few weeks were filled with scans and tests, doctors and specialists. I usually zone out when they go over the results, but it just is always the same. Nothing wrong. Have to run some more tests. It always makes me laugh, but I know my mom doesn't see any humor in it. I've been getting worse all the while. It's hard for me to think straight, and sometimes I feel like I'm dreaming even when I'm awake. I've been forgetting things, just little things here and there, but they're starting to add up. Even my favorite memories of my grandpa are starting to feel blurry and fade in. I can still feel the remnants of joy when I focus, but the details are getting harder and harder to grasp. So I decided to write this all down before it too starts to fade away. I don't know what was out in that lake. My mom said she's selling the place and she makes sure I don't leave the house without her. At least not until I'm all better. But somehow, some way I just know, in the end, I'll be back at that lake. I feel a bit awkward about this, but here goes. A few weeks ago, I was browsing the internet late at night when some ads appeared. Not the kind of ads you might expect. They were RPG items. Yes, I admit, I'm a bit of a nerd. It caught me off guard because of how specific the algorithms seemed to be. Just a few days earlier, I had been discussing with friends our plans to play a game soon, and I mentioned wanting to get some miniatures. Lo and behold, miniature ads showed up. I checked out the few offers, here and there, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a big fan of 3D prints. The relief finish looks, in my opinion, unsightly, too irregular. Until I stumbled upon a figurine that would be perfect for a boss. Some kind of king, I suppose. 
A strong male torso with tentacles entangling the waist and an octopus head. The finish was perfect too. Nothing too elaborate or machined. I assume it's handcrafted. The price wasn't too high, around $25, so there was no reason to hesitate. I bought it and informed my friends that we now had a boss for the campaign. Days passed and I regularly checked the shipping progress. About a week later, the mail carrier left a rectangular cardboard package with a seal that read Miskatonic Arts and a bright red sticker with tentacles coming out from the sides. Cool, I thought. Maybe they specialize in crafting cephalopods for games. I went in and quickly opened the box. The statue was quite attractive, even before touching it I noticed an emerald glow emanating from it. I couldn't recall buying a deluxe version of one with additional special effects. I picked it up and to the touch it felt slightly warm. About 3 to 5 degrees warmer than room temperature. This will definitely surprise the guys. I opened the app to confirm the delivery when I noticed a message from the sender. We've received a delivery confirmation. Is everything okay with the product? I promptly started typing. Uh, everything's fine. Just to confirm, maybe you guys sent me a slightly better product than what I paid for? It has some extra glow features, is that correct? If so, is it battery powered or battery operated? A few minutes passed with no response. Yes, friend. Thanks for buying from us. They confirmed the delivery, and then the chat ended. I was confused. Yes to what? Well, better let it go. I took a photo to share with the group. For some reason, the photos came out as if they were experiencing interference with a lot of noise. Could it have something to do with the battery? My god, is it radioactive? I started to panic while sending the photos to my friends and sharing my distress. They reassured me, saying there was nothing to worry about. At most, it could have been a layer of radium in the paint finish, but it wouldn't be more dangerous than a smoke detector or a banana, as long as I didn't start eating the statue, which I had no intention of doing. We scheduled to play on the weekend, and I prepared for bed, leaving the statue decorating the living room coffee table. I tried to forget the unease that the strange object caused me, even without reason. I laid my head on the pillow, letting my thoughts flow into the night drain, calming my breathing, but there was no peace, not even in my dreams. In my mind, I woke up in an open field, the sky shining with stars and the Milky Way's own trail, a thin layer of water barely covering my feet. Spread across the ground, seemingly endless, mountains rose from somewhere in the background, and then a faint, subtle sound began. It was a noise, constant and slow, a scraping sound of stone. In the middle of all this, I began to see circular ripples forming at a point, as if something were coming from the depths, slowly approaching the surface. I approached and looked. To my horror, what emerged was a familiar shape, first an octopus, then a torso, and more tentacles. I began to sweat, and upon touching it this time, the statue was boiling. I woke up sweaty and breathless with my alarm in the background. I got up, still stunned by my reverie, and began to get ready for work. However, as I put on my clothes and headed to the front door, I noticed something strange. It may sound silly, maybe it was just confusion on my part, but the statue that was once facing the window, with its back to the door, now stared directly at me. I felt a chill in my stomach as it locked eyes with me, and I rushed to work, wishing time would pass slowly. It didn't take long. In the following days, I started experiencing inexplicable chills as I looked at the miniature. Sometimes I swore I could hear it whispering. I decided to put it back in the box until game day, but the whispers persisted at night, turning into indistinct voices echoing through my dreams. Vivid and disturbing dreams. I found myself wandering through strange lands, sometimes alone, 
sometimes followed by shadowy figures moving in the shadows, but always accompanied by the statue. My health deteriorated into a wreck, probably due to lack of sleep. I had a fever, confusion, body aches, and tremendous discomfort. I went to the doctor and he attributed it to stress, recommending some days off work. But being away from work only brought me closer to that thing. Gradually, my plumbing started deteriorating too, first with a thick black liquid oozing from it, then pieces of I don't know what, something sticky and slimy clogging everything. The smell of the sea made me nauseous. I tried returning it in every way, but I can't contact the company. I'm afraid to leave it on the street and someone might find it, perhaps even a child, and suffer the same fate. Or maybe am I just going insane? No, definitely not after the last incident. It's the eve of the game night, and I started preparing things. Maps, character sheets, quest papers, some dice, snacks, and finally, the miniature. It was time to act like a functional adult and put this nonsense aside. Perhaps it really is stress killing me. It was then as I moved it from the box that I noticed something strange. Peculiar engravings all over its body and base. Inscriptions in some kind of ancient language. Things that weren't there before, but that's not all. Far from it. Shortly after the kitchen sink overflowed with water, completely clogged. I was furious and determined to fix it in one go. No cleaning products or on cloggers. I wanted to express my anger in brute force. I removed the sink trap and started pulling with all my might using the plunger. What came out was the weirdest thing I had ever seen. An octopus. But not like I imagined them after all. What kind of octopus has green eyes? And what kind of octopus speaks? It spoke to me in something I didn't understand, but I knew it was what was written on the statue. Its words entered my mind, penetrating flesh and spirit. I understood. I understood what it wanted. It's wonderful. I've already planned everything for the game night with my friends tomorrow. It will be wonderful. I have everything planned for each one of them. That's why I'm writing here. If you're planning to play with your friends, try checking out Miskatonic Arts. You'll surely find something useful for your enjoyment. Definitely 5 out of 5 stars. And I definitely plan to buy again. I found the journal of Harold Upkiss, wrapped in an old plastic carrier bag. Rested in a drainage tunnel, buried under a bank of sand. He had been missing for 35 years, and I had finally found out why. My crew had been assigned to a copse of trees surrounded by farmers' fields known locally as Sandbank to install new drainage channels to prevent flooding, a common problem in the Fenlands surrounding Wisbeck. Back in the 80s, this became a sudden dumping ground for tons of sand which smothered the small woodland, and the area got fenced off as a local hazard. The government restricted the land for 40 years before giving it up to the local council. Aside from the drainage problems, it was merely a local oddity. An irrelevance. While digging out the sand around the edge of the copse, we discovered a large, corrugated metal pipe. We pulled the tunnel out with a digger, and the top just shattered, brittle with rust. Sat on top of a thick stew of mud which half filled the pipe was a white and blue tattered carrier bag. It pulled apart like tissue paper, and inside was a brown leather bound book. Written on the front in thick black pen was Journal of Harold Upkiss. Do not touch. I ignored his warning and flicked through the pages, scanning through towards the final entry. The journal documented his daily routine. Every meal had been meticulously noted and reviewed, no matter how mundane. He would log the weather, what he wore, who he spoke to, 
and where he went with his friends. Other than the fact he was logging at all, it was a fairly normal routine for a boy of 13. I read the last entry to see what led to the journal being out here. After a normal day, he experienced something unusual. Journal entry, 13th of July, 1988. Approximately 4 p.m., out in the fields with Michael P. and David C. Michael had made a bow and arrow from an old bullwhip he had found. He stripped off the leather binding, exposing a flexible plastic core. He managed to attach a string and whittled some arrows out of sticks. We gathered feathers as flights. It was fun until Michael stopped shooting across the field and aimed the bow straight up in the sky. He let loose and the arrow disappeared into the sky. Michael ran. David and I scrambled randomly. The arrow thumped into the dirt 20 feet away from me. What are you doing? David asked, half angry. Yet the sudden excitement fueled maniacal laughter. Michael shrugged. Chances are it wasn't going to hit any of us. You're mental, David replied. For a moment, I thought David was going to thump him, but he just picked up some of the arrows that were stuck in the ground, snapped them over his knee, and walked off home. Michael was furious and ran up behind David, brandishing the bow like a club. David ran ahead. Michael then stopped and searched his backpack. He pulled out an arrow and got ready to aim it at David until I shouted out. Michael paused, lowered the bow, then calmly asked me, Want to make some more arrows? Not really, my son. Michael replied, I've got some more spares anyway. Evening was closing in, so we started heading back for our street. I stopped and sat at a short wall by the old barn to update my journal, which annoyed Michael. He always thought I was documenting evidence against him. Maybe I am, I'd reply but he would always wait for me. While we were sitting there, I heard a whining, metallic screeching sound overhead, then a flash of blinding bright light. I didn't see anything but a felt a tremor pass through the ground, up the wall, enough to make my butt numb. Then came a rain of dirt. I shielded my head with my backpack for a few seconds until it stopped. Then I finally looked at Michael. What was that? I asked. Michael was as confused as me, but he pointed over towards the cops. One large tree, I think it's an ash tree, was broken and splintered, and it looked like steam was rising from amongst the trees. Michael started walking straight over to it without a word I followed. When we got to the cops, I heard hissing sounds. Then it became a violent buzzing, electrical sound as if a loose cable was zapping erratically like an enraged snake. We went to enter the cops over one of the drainage ditches, but as Michael reached the crest on the far side, he ducked down. Watch it, he said. Something's there. What? I whispered back. Michael turned back and followed the ditch around to an old tunnel all the kids in the area knew as a good hiding spot. It was overgrown with brambles at the entrance, but was a trail was worn away by wildlife. Badgers, I guessed. The tunnel was too small for deer as it was almost half filled with dirt, but there was enough room for us to get through on our knees. Michael crawled up the tunnel and I followed. When we got towards the end of the tunnel, where the land suddenly slopes upwards to join the cops, Michael took out his bow and pulled three arrows from his backpack. I had no idea why. He had one ready to shoot as he emerged from the edge of the tunnel and looked over the earth slope. I pulled myself up alongside him and saw the crannage of trees, snapped and splintered by whatever had crashed here. At the base of the tree was wreckage. A small aircraft of some kind, I assume, but there were no wings I could see. It was a shell of dark metal about the size of a car. Some small pieces of debris were scattered around the ground. 
It appeared to be a completely smooth shell as I couldn't see any sort of joints or gaps in the bodywork. But suddenly a panel that was seamless then moved out and folded downwards like a small door. Though too small for a grown man, inside something moved but I didn't see what. We both ducked out of sight. I looked at Michael and saw he was holding something metal. He held it out proudly. It was a curved, triangular piece of dark grey metal, thicker at one end, and it didn't show any sign of damage. When he handed it to me, it seemed impossibly light, as if I was holding a piece of paper. Yet, even at its thinnest point, it felt incredibly strong. It also felt warm on my skin. Not like it was hot, but as if a chili pepper was rubbed against my skin. It felt like a tingling sensation. Michael snatched it back quickly. I went up for another look but didn't see any movement. The door or hatch was still open. The hiss of steam was getting quieter and the electrical zaps were getting less frequent but still loud. Every so often the electrical sound randomly cracked like a whip making us both duck for cover in the pipe. Then the trucks came. Out of the first truck, a man got out and shouted, It's here. We've got it. Then others followed. It was impossible to tell how many. The sound of their idling diesel engines made the tunnel a cacophony of noise. We both froze in place. We should go out, I said. Are you stupid? Michael said. We've seen something we shouldn't have. Something top secret. Something... Alien. If we come crawling out, they're not taking us home. They'll lock us up. That's if we're lucky. If it's the army, they could shoot us. I didn't know if he was right, but I had seen the news stories from Northern Ireland. If they justified a shoot-to-kill policy there, then maybe they would do that for whatever was happening here. So we waited. I started to feel sick. I didn't know if it was the mix of nerves and excitement, or just sitting for a prolonged period in this damp drainage tunnel, but I was nauseous. My mind was foggy and every movement ached. Michael was looking sick too, though he didn't say anything. He was breathing heavily and looking pale in the fading light of the tunnel. He coughed at one point and blamed the diesel fumes from the vehicles above. Evening was setting in. Michael took a torch from his backpack. He told me he often snuck out alone at night. Occasionally he flicked the torch on to look at the piece of metal he had found. He looked at it in awe. He barely spoke to me other than when he was thinking out loud. I wonder what I've got, he would say. Or, what is it I've found? He seemed convinced it was part of an alien spaceship and that he had something incredibly valuable. At one point Michael needed to take a piss, and he did so with not a thought as to where it would end up. The golden stream crept towards me, and I had to arch my body like a startled cat to avoid it. He found this hilarious, stifling his laughter only to avoid being heard by the men above. Soon his attention went back to the spaceship fragment, as he called it. Then the thunder started, and the rain followed. A gentle stream filled the bottom of the ditch and ran into the drainage tunnel, turning the dusty loose soil into a thick black mud. Water crept in until the mud was unavoidable, covering the floor of the whole tunnel. Above us I could hear a lot of heavy vehicles moving. There was a lot of chatter between what we assumed were soldiers. One thing I heard amidst the noise was that those soldiers were being rotated away from the crash site every 30 minutes or so. After the longest period of heavy machinery, shouting, and metal clinking noises, there was relative quiet. We were waiting for our chance to escape when some other machines then rumbled overhead. We stayed put. A diesel engine rattled and revved occasionally, then we heard some shouting then a loud metal clattering, and what sounded like a sudden downpour of rain. Only it wasn't rain. It was sand. 
We saw some flowing down the slope on the cop side of the tunnel. It started as a trickle, but then whatever was pouring the sand moved towards us, and it was enough to cause us to move away from that end of the tunnel. I said, We've gotta go. And Michael nodded. I made my way down the tunnel first, but the rainfall had made the mud into a quagmire. It was difficult to move anyway while feeling so nauseous, but then my feet got bogged down and my knees got sucked into the mud like a vacuum. I put all my effort into driving forwards until I got exhausted, and I had barely moved an inch. I was stuck, only able to get my hands free with barely enough room to kneel upright. Michael had the idea of throwing sand on the mud to try to make it more firm, but it did nothing but add a crust to its surface. Michael looked down the tunnel and began to panic. I urged him not to try and crawl past me and get stuck too, so he didn't. Instead he pushed me down, forcing me face down in the mud, and used my body as a bridge to get further down the tunnel. When I looked ahead I saw what caused his panic. More sand began to trickle down on the other side of the tunnel. As he climbed over me, I grabbed at him, hoping he would drag me out of the mud, but he didn't. He tried to shrug me off and keep going. When he had his feet on my shoulders, he tried to jump as far forward as he could, but I grabbed his ankle in the hope he would pull me forward with him. He fell short on his jump and kicked out at me to shake me off. I asked what he was doing, but he didn't respond. He just didn't care. I wanted out of the tunnel and I was slowing him down. I was irrelevant to him, just like when he shot that arrow right up in the air. I was there for his amusement, and now that purpose had ended. He was kicking like a donkey at my arm and eventually, with hands coated in mud, I lost my grip. I managed to reach over and grab a strap of his backpack. He squirmed loose, slipping the straps off his shoulders, then started shouting, No, you can't have it. It's mine. I didn't even realize what he was talking about, but when I grabbed the backpack out of instinct, he thought I was trying to steal his piece of metal. It's mine, he screamed. He kicked at me furiously while pulling on the backpack. The bag tore open and all the belongings poured out. He dived into the mud to grab the piece of spaceship, which, when pulled out of the mud, somehow remained clean, and mud just dripped off it. Michael pulled back with a smile on his face. He looked me in the eye and said, Screw you, Harry. Write that in your journal. Further down the tunnel, the mud was more diluted, and Michael was able to trudge his way through. Out of the end of the tunnel, under the increasingly heavy shower of sand, once out of the tunnel, Michael stumbled, then ran out of sight. The darkness grew in the tunnel, a combination of the failing evening sun and the pouring sand making a veil over the only remaining opening. Any hope Michael might get me help faded quickly. I wish David was here. He would have stopped Michael. He would have helped me. My one piece of fortune was that with the clutter from Michael's bag, I got his torch. It is by the light of my torch that I write this journal now. Both ends of the tunnel are covered in sand. I shouted for hours. I screamed for help. It's agony. My throat hurts. My head is swimming. I have vomited a few times. I could still hear movement overhead, but they couldn't hear me. I banged on the tunnel, but the noise was muffled. Nobody can hear me. Everything went quiet. I am still stuck in the mud. So I write this because that is what I do. I hope one day someone finds my journal because I am here. Sick. Waiting to die. I want people to know what happened to me. It was heartbreaking to read the final entry in his journal. The remains of Harold Upkiss were found in the mud where he had become stuck. I called the police and his bones were eventually taken so his family could have a proper burial of the boy, who had been missing for 35 years. And yet maybe the Upkiss family didn't share the most unfortunate fate. Michael Porter returned home and claimed never to have seen where young Harry had ended up. 
leaving him to die under the bank of sand, just so he could keep his piece of spaceship for himself. He hid it in his house, and never told anyone about it. Never may seem like a long time, but for Michael P. and his foster family, it was two days. His foster mom took him to hospital when he was vomiting and diarrhea gave way to bouts of violent seizures. Michael died in hospital at 14 years old. His foster family, including two foster sisters, all became similarly sick, radiation sickness as it turned out, and were suddenly taken from their home by the military who closed off the street. Within the decade they had all died, most of them due to cancer. They had found Michael's prized piece of metal wrapped in a pillowcase and hidden under his mattress, radiating death through the house. I remember standing at the end of the road watching as some big, white lorry marked British Army wheeled down the road after decontaminating Michael's house. The police and army cleared the roadblocks and told everyone it was safe to go home. At the time, I remember feeling sorry for Michael. He was annoying and dangerous, but he was just a boy who had a tough life. Since I found Harry's journal, it made me feel pure hatred for the kid. Whatever weirdness happened at the cops, people speculate it was some Air Force test that went wrong. It hardly matters to me. The three of us were all together on that day. I never should have left Harry alone with Michael. I could have saved him. David Copeland My parents were not super well off and for a long time struggled to get ahead. My dad worked incredibly hard, stress and fights and all the stuff that comes with money troubles, but he'd saved enough to put a deposit on a home. I remember the first time I walked into that house. It was the day of the turnkey and I was super excited to finally have a garden to play in. It was a two bedroom with a study, not very big. The whole house was painted shades of grey and black. From excitement, I felt this sinking feeling as I looked around. I remember feeling this overwhelming sense of wrongness. To put it into words is impossible. That feeling traveled up and down my body in waves, a mix of unease and trepidation with absolutely no explanation. I tried to tell my dad and I remember him saying that it was just a big change and I'd get over it. I was a quiet kid, kept to myself, and swallowed it down. Eleven year old for my birthday, that year my parents decided to get me a cat. They took me to a breeder and they chose one. I don't like cats. I'd been bitten and scratched before, but I said thank you and tried to love it. Not that it ever loved any of us back. That cat hated being touched or even looked at. It didn't hiss or scratch, but... God, it would just hide away all day and night. Hard feet for an indoor cat. She lived in the laundry mostly, which was where our toilet was as well. So to get to the toilet, you'd have to sneak past her. I remember one night I woke up suddenly when I opened my eyes in a panic and it was pitch black. You could look back and say perhaps it was a moonless night, but it didn't feel that way. It felt like the darkness had eyes, like it was watching me, covering me, running all over my skin in its thickness. Black so thick it made the hair on the back of my neck stand up on end. It made my mind race, my heart beat in my throat. Any trace of sleep gone, I realized I probably woke up because of the overwhelming need to pee. With absolute dread I got up and walked the 15 steps to the bathroom. I would have got the belt if I'd woken my parents up by turning on the light, and both were light sleepers. So I walked in the dark. I held on to the walls and put one foot in front of the other. Shivers ran up and down my arms. My breath felt heavy in front of my face even though it was warm inside. I turned, knocked for the cat, and opened the laundry door only to find the cat upright on its bed absolutely fixated and hissing at the window in the laundry door. 
I think I was so stunned that this cat was hissing and angry that I just froze. Dread swept over me like ice over my body. I went hot and cold all over before I could even tell you why. I turned my head, and in that large window was a dark shadow of a huge man with a top hat on. He was looking right at me. I knew he was. Through me. Over me. No features in that thick darkness, but the outline of him was so very clear. The sensation of being bathed in ice down every root of hair, from the top of my head to my toes. The cat was growling and hissing, looking at the same thing as me. I forgot to close the door or to breathe. I just ran into my room and hid under the bed, rocking back and forth for hours until the sun came up, trying to breathe through the terror and fight for control over my thoughts, trying to rationalize with myself. I tried to tell my parents. I really tried to tell them and they didn't believe me. They said I saw the shadow of the trees moving outside, that it was my imagination. That night on, I made sure to pee before bed, double checked the security door was locked, that the wooden door was locked, that the blinds in my room were down, and that I had my lamp on. I slept with the light on from then on, and even then I didn't feel safe. Twelve years old. My grandparents came to stay with us for the year from overseas. The house was small, so they moved me from my room to the study. I had no complaints. I loved my grandparents a lot. The study was small. I slept on the pull-out sofa. It touched the deck, which had a computer on it. The window was narrow and in a corner, but it was floor to ceiling. This room did not have curtains. My parents also didn't let me take my lamp, as my parents needed it to read at night. I tried to ask for it a few times and was told to grow up. It started maybe the night I first slept there, or that first week. I can't be sure. That part is fuzzy, so I won't mess around. I'd wake up for no apparent reason, in the middle of the night. Once, twice a week at first, then it got to every night. My parents started getting angry with me over it. I was tired, and the school was noticing. I'd say it was months that constant night waking happened without cause. Though it could have been weeks, when one night it changed. I woke up to hear tapping on the window. It was so soft at first I thought I was dreaming, but every night it got a little louder. Very distinct. Sometimes there was long drawn out scratching, sometimes breathing, heavy breathing. But no matter what, there was always the tapping. I didn't look. I never looked. It seems my fear response is to freeze and hide like a coward, but that tapping and those sounds were terrifying. I would sit in that bed with my head under covers drenched in sweat waiting for it to finish, waiting for the noises to stop, the sickness of fear to leave my body. I'd lose hours trying to gain control of myself. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. My parents were enraged with what I had going on. They told me it was birds, the flowers outside the window hitting in the wind, that I was making things up in my head. By summer, I was a mess. My grandparents even offered for me to sleep in bed with them, but my parents got angry, saying I wasn't a baby and that was ridiculous. It was a hot night. I'll never forget it. It had been a scorcher of a day, and we didn't have air conditioning. Just a box in the living room. So my parents got the mattresses and put them on the living room floor for my grandparents and for them to sleep. I got to sleep on the couch with them and it was the first time in a very long time I got to sleep in. It was such a heavy healing sleep. When I woke up, I am sure it was afternoon. Maybe the one and only time I was ever allowed to sleep in like that since I was little and my parents were acting so strange. They made me breakfast in silence, and my grandparents didn't say much. I ate in this weird silence too, and the longer it went, the sicker I felt. Like I had done something really bad and I was about to get a beating. But dad sat down at the table and started asking me questions. When did I start hearing the noises? 
what did the man I saw look like, etc. I cannot describe the relief I felt that finally I was being listened to. I went over all of it, again, for the manyth time. The man in the window, the cat hissing, the tapping, the noises, everything. I tried to be as honest as I could. I know when I looked at my dad when I finished that he didn't believe me. He said he heard the tapping at the window last night. They all had. It had woken them all up. My dad had gone outside to look, but no one was there. He said he's thought about it logically, and it must be one of the kids from school pulling a prank, and he'd talk to the school. That night, after a long, hot day, we got this beautiful summer rain. I sat in the garden and got soaked before my parents got home from work. I sat in the garden and enjoyed that water hitting me, washing away all my problems for a minute. That night I was so exhausted that I just fell asleep watching TV. My parents moved me, and groggy as I was, I just fell flat on the sofa bed and passed out. They'd left my window open, my night light off. That night, I woke up to the sound of my name, my full name being whispered to me. The darkness was thicker than I'd ever felt it before. The voice was inside and outside at the same time, calling my name, enunciating each vowel. I was frozen with fear. I held my hands to my ears. I squeezed my eyes closed so tight I felt my eyes would glue themselves shut. The voice got louder and louder, more demanding, telling me to come to the window, calling my name. That voice wasn't man, woman, or child. There was no describing it, but it knew I was awake. It knew because it became insistent that I come to the window, that I get up and come and look. When it growled at me to come to the window, the voice angry and insistent, something snapped inside of me. I felt like my heart would give out if I didn't open my mouth and say something. Do anything, so I screamed. When I tell you I screamed, I mean I screamed so loud that my voice broke. I didn't scream words or help. I just screamed this primal sound like some animal dying. My dad burst into my room and asked me what was going on. I couldn't talk. I couldn't speak. I was just terrified beyond measure. My bed was so wet from sweat that it looked like I'd taken a shower and just lied down without drying. I was allowed to sleep with my grandparents after that, and my parents got security lights and ADT security that they armed every night. They even got the priest to come and bless the house. My parents installed security cameras around every corner outside, all of them capturing the windows and doors to the house. I never heard about it again. All the noises stopped, the darkness gone, the feeling of being watched all the time disappeared too, and I forgot about it. Friends and life and fun taking over those memories. I did ask my dad about it years ago. I think I'd had a bad dream. I must have been in my late teens. He looked startled I'd brought it up. He told me not to worry about it anymore. But the look on his face was haunted. Whatever actually happened, whatever he knew, he's taking it to the grave. The streets of New York were choked with humanity, a flowing river of souls seeking purpose, pleasure, and sometimes, escape. Walking among them, I found a narrow alley that was not on any map. The entry was concealed by the haunting shadows cast by the imposing skyscrapers, but curiosity, that insatiable itch, drew me in. In the middle of the alley stood an unassuming shop with the words, Shop of Illusions, etched in ornate, gold calligraphy above the door. There were no windows to peer into, only a sleek black door that looked as if it were made from shadows themselves. The hairs on my neck rose, but some inexplicable compulsion nudged me inside. The inside was unlike any shop I had ever seen. The walls pulsed with soft, iridescent hues, and the air carried a sweet, intoxicating aroma. 
Elegant glass cases displayed items that seemed to defy reality. A never-ending goblet of wine, a book whose characters leaped off the page, and a mirror showing not your reflection, but your deepest desires. Ah, a new seeker. A silky voice spoke from the back of the shop. A tall, lean man emerged, his features sharp as if chiseled from granite. His eyes, however, were the most captivating. They danced with colors not known to the human spectrum. Welcome to the Shop of Illusions, where dreams are reality, and reality is just a plaything of the mind. He announced, gesturing grandly. I hesitated. Illusions? Yes, he smiled, revealing unnaturally perfect teeth. Here we sell moments of respite from your world. Choose an illusion, indulge in it, and when it fades, return to reality, refreshed and invigorated. Curiosity peaked. What's the catch? His laughter was... mellifluous, though it echoed oddly in the room. Ah, smart one. Every illusion, like a dream, fades, but sometimes, when dreams end, the waking world seems... different. More intense. It sounded innocuous enough. Temptation wrestled with caution. Before I knew it, I found myself handing over a not insubstantial amount of money for an illusion of an unforgettable night of passion and... love. As the man crafted the illusion, the world around me blurred and shifted. I was transported to an idyllic beach at sunset, the sky a canvas of purples, reds, and golds. A beautiful partner whose face seemed both familiar and... unknown appeared beside me. The night was everything I had hoped for. Warmth, affection, laughter. For a brief moment, I felt complete. But as all dreams must, it ended. The sun rose and with it the illusion began to crumble, the colors fading, the touch turning cold. I blinked and suddenly I was back in the shop of illusions. The shopkeeper grinned, satisfaction evident. How was it? I nodded, a touch dazed. Incredible. But now, I feel... Empty? He supplied. Yes, that's often the effect. You see, when the illusion is so perfect, reality seems... lacking. He was right. Exiting the shop, the bustling city felt drabber. More monochrome. The laughter of children sounded distant. Food tasted bland and every touch felt like a shadow of what I had felt in the illusion. A sinking feeling of dissatisfaction nestled within me. Days turned into weeks, and the allure of the shop of illusions grew impossible to resist. I returned, purchasing another illusion, and then another. Each time, the boundaries of reality and illusion blurred, and the world outside the shop became grayer, more muted. Each waking moment was tainted with longing for the next illusion. But one day, things took a sinister turn. Having spent nearly all my savings on the intoxicating illusions, I was desperate for just one more taste. I begged the shopkeeper for an affordable escape. After an eternity, he presented a tarnished silver key. This key opens the door to the most powerful illusion yet. But remember, the greater the dream, the harsher the awakening. Without a second thought, I grabbed the key, and the world spun and twisted around me. I found myself in a magnificent mansion, surrounded by opulent riches. Servants awaited my every command, and every pleasure imaginable was at my fingertips. Days or maybe years passed in this illusionary paradise. But then, a nagging feeling began to creep in. 
a sense of being watched, hunted. One fateful evening, I stumbled upon a hidden chamber in the mansion. Inside, there was a grotesque gallery, walls adorned with paintings that shifted and squirmed. Each painting depicted a distorted, nightmarish version of my own face, contorted with fear and agony. A chilling realization dawned. This wasn't just an illusion. It was a trap. Desperate to escape, I sought out the silver key. The mansion began to transform, corridors elongating, doors disappearing, and shadows coming to life. Whispered voices and malevolent laughter echoed around me. Every corner I turned, I was met with nightmarish scenes. Friends and family, their eyes hollow, mouths twisted into screams reaching out with rotting hands. The world darkened, and an oppressive weight settled on my chest. Panic surged, each heartbeat echoing loudly in my ears. In the distance, I spotted the familiar glint of the silver key on a pedestal, battling the terror and the grotesque apparitions. I lunged for it. The moment my fingers closed around the key, a searing pain shot up my arm. But I managed to turn it. Reality crashed back. The opulence of the mansion was replaced by the iridescent walls of the Shop of Illusions. Gasping for breath, Drenched in sweat, I stumbled out, the silver key still clutched in my hand. But the world outside was no longer the one I remembered. The city streets, once bustling and vibrant, now seemed post-apocalyptic. Buildings crumbled, vehicles lay abandoned, and the few people I encountered had sunken eyes and gaunt faces. They shuffled aimlessly their voices nothing more than hollow whispers. The most disturbing change, however, was the sky. It was a swirling vortex of inky black and blood red, casting the entire city in an eerie, pulsating glow. Horrified, I made my way back to the Shop of Illusions, only to find its door locked. Desperation mounting, I tried the silver key and, to my surprise, it fit. Inside, the shop was in chaos. The once beautiful displays were shattered, and the very walls seemed to weep. The shopkeeper sat hunched in a corner, a shadow of his former self. What have you done? He hissed, his once vibrant eyes now dull. Me? What happened to the world? He laughed, a sound devoid of any mirth. Your insatiable greed for illusions tore a rift between reality and fantasy. Now they're melding, blending, corrupting one another. I felt my knees weaken. How do we fix this? His gaze was filled with pity and regret. The balance must be restored. An illusion as potent as reality needs to counterbalance it. But I don't have any money left. No, not money, he said, something much more valuable. Before I could react, he lunged at me, snatching the silver key from my hand. He whispered an incantation, and the key glowed with an ethereal light. Suddenly, I felt a sharp pain in my chest. Looking down, I saw my heart, not of flesh and blood, but a vibrant, swirling nebula of colors being pulled from my body. He placed it within the silver key and offered it to me. Your heart, your soul, the essence of your being is now an illusion, a perfect counterweight to the corrupted reality. Your sacrifice will restore the balance. Everything went dark. When I awoke, I was back on the familiar streets of New York, bustling with life. The shop of illusions was gone, replaced by an ordinary wall. Yet in my hand, I held the silver key, pulsating softly, my heart encapsulated within. As I walked the streets, I felt an eerie calmness. 
I could hear the rhythm of the city, the whispers of the wind, the heartbeat of the earth. I could taste the sweetness of the air and see colors more vibrant than ever before. Every sensation was amplified, intense, overwhelming. The world was no longer gray and muted, but unbearably real. Now I am a wanderer, roaming the boundary of reality and illusion. In my chest is a void, an emptiness filled only by the faint pulsations of the silver key. And every so often, when the weight of reality becomes unbearable, I return to the illusions locked within my heart. But no matter how beautiful or enticing, they are but pale shadows compared to the terrifying beauty of reality. The price I paid in the shop of illusions was high, yet it has given me a lesson more valuable than any illusion. Reality, in all its raw, brutal, and breathtaking form, is the true magic. For what are illusions but dreams that fade away, leaving us yearning for the harsh yet enchanting embrace of reality.